Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. This is part two of the Red Lion, the Elixir of Eternal Life. Make sure you check out the first part if you have not heard the first part of the book. This is the second part and due to limits on upload times, we are splitting this book into two. Third book. The Phoenix Soars. Blind soul, arm thyself, witch of the mysteries, and thou canst find, even in the night of the earth, that shining other body, thy divine soul. Follow this heavenly guide. Let it be thy genius, for it holds the key of thy past and future embodiments. The Appeal to Initiates from the Egyptian Book of the Dead Turn your attention within and glance into the infinity of time and space. The song of the stars, the speech of numbers, and the harmony of the spheres all have their origins there. Every sun is a thought of God, and every planet the thought's expression. Ascend and descend, O souls. The path of the seven planets and in the seven skies of these seven planets shall ye recognize the divine thoughts. What do the stars sing? What do numbers talk about? What do the spheres reveal? O ye lost or redeemed souls, the stars, numbers, and spheres are revealing your fate. A fragment attributed to Hermes. The Sign of Aquarius The woman whose body could accept my soul with its new goal, was gentle and even-tempered, just like a true alchemist furnace. I was born on the gray dawn of February 27th, 1760, in a place permeated with the mystic radiation of the secret sciences. My father, Cornelius von Grott, was court musician and confidant to the Landgrave Karl, Prince of Hesse Castle, and the two were members of the same mystic order. My father was a very skillful painter and writer, but his glowing artistry was directed to only one end, the accomplishment of the great work that becomes steadily more obscure to the outer world as it nears completion. His works were not for this world. They are guarded in the secret library of the order, and only those who understand the three levels of symbolism can see them. The castle of Grot stood in the middle of the dense, murmuring forest of hawks, and the windows of its square towers overlooked the river Fulda. The north windows overlooked the icy mountains of Karlsruhe Park, and the silhouette of the Orangery Castle and its marble pools. Within the castle was the silence of meditation, which made it seem austere as a monastery. Even our few guests instinctively walked on tiptoe so as not to disturb the gentle euphoric spell. Not even the hushed conversations in the evenings or the massive tones of the great organ disturbed it. They merely seemed to add art to its serenity. My mother was a tall, gothic woman with improbably slender fingers, a transparent face, and a high, noble forehead. She was the most taciturn woman I met in my whole life journey, but hers was the silence of accommodation, peaceful and expressive. People who talked to her never felt she was indifferent or reserved. Her smiling eyes and compassionate silence prompted even the timid 
and introverted to communicate. Hers was a power of silence. She was well-educated and unusually intelligent, and she quietly graduated through the grades of the order with my father. She was always first to read and criticize his writings, and her marginal notes show her intuition. Her intense energy was always channeled into some important work, and my father, who, like most artistic rhapsodic geniuses, was frequently discouraged, received tremendous help from her emotional balance. Words cannot express what she came to mean to me. She was well prepared for my coming. This time my parents knew who was to be born to them. They knew more about me than I knew myself, for my third eye had been reopened only by the elixir I had acquired by murder. The order had kept track of my path for a long time, a few millennia, and expected me to be born among them in the sign of Aquarius. I had neither to hide nor to tell anything. During my infancy, my new body couldn't transmit my spirit completely, and my parents communicated with me accordingly. But by the time I was ten or eleven, they treated me like any other junior in the order, as an uninitiated adult. They knew my goal and knew that it was their task to lead me toward it. Both they and their friends had expected me, and they loved me and awaited my birth with more joy than ordinary parents, for they knew what I had done and the depths of hell from which I had climbed. The prodigal son was returning to them, tattered and wounded, but past his crisis. A person who has been an initiate and falls away loses the ancient memory. He has some obscure presentiment of this great loss. It burns in him as he wanders the labyrinths, a consuming sense of loss that stays unsated for thousands of years. He strives to reach the occult light again, though he is dazed and blinded like a moth. He will burn and fall only to try again in a new body, obeying the mystical tenet. Burn thy body with the fire of thy thoughts. The body will always burn during this futile experiment, but it will burn with astral desires, which are strengthened and awakened by the experience. Yet this flaming seed only produces a mortal body. It was beside Karina's disintegrating body that the transcendent light of thought flared within me. For Karina had encompassed and consumed all of my astral restlessness an egotistical, lewd attraction to beauty of form. She sucked them all into her flesh and blood and enchained them on the chain of her forms. When the magic of her body was shattered, all my desire from the spectral world of astral swamps went with it. My impassioned, sidereal second body was burned by the fire of thought, and my third one appeared numb, dormant, ignorant, and inexperienced, a junior ready for awakening, realization, and illumination. I didn't participate in the Order's gatherings while my body and brain were developing. Instead, my parents introduced me to mental exercises. They forced me to do organized work regardless of how difficult I found it. During certain hours of the day, with no exceptions, I had to perform various assigned tasks, writing, translating difficult texts from French to German, or, most arduous, I had to memorize portions of books whose unknown oriental language had been notated in Latin characters. Later, I studied Hebrew, Egyptian, Urdu, Sanskrit, Tibetan, and Chinese, and learned all their strange characters. These tasks strengthened my restlessness, and quickly distracted mind, and compelled me to concentrate and persist diligently, even when the task itself was unrewarding. Boring though they seemed, they were still the only way to learn, and I was richly rewarded for these dry hours by the hours when my parents worked to waken my mystical senses and train the delicate feelers of intuition which seek out the truths of etheric akasha beyond thought, time, and space. My bedtime stories were occult music and poetry, which filled me with thrilling moonlight of mysteries and taught me the meaning of symbols. The Temple of the Moon For many peaceful years, 
the same silvery night seemed to fall on my father's study as though it had stopped in time. The same highlights shone on the gigantic copper-colored organ pipes, and the triple rows of keys responded in the same way to my father's agile fingers. This huge instrument was the channel through which I experienced the exalted beauty of transcendental poetry, just as Orpheus, that most blessed and misunderstood interpreter of the divine art, was able to recreate the illusion nights. My father always established the atmosphere for his story with the strange, sonorous colors of the organ. He would play bewitching mystical chords that flowed together without resolution. These evoked wonderful luminous colors to the seeing eye and the tale in living symbols that needed only to be translated into words. And the first story he told me was this. Once, long ago, there lived in the city of Ur, where the people wore the gentle moon mask of the nightborn, a princess named Belshalti Nanar, the daughter of King Nabuniad. Now all this took place during the last days of Abraham's city of Ur, after the death of the great Nebuchadnezzar. The eyes of this princess shone like the pure lines of the moon temple, and their depths were like the shadows of moonlit nights. Though Belshalti Nanar was beautiful, she was a stranger to all mankind. Her female companions shunned her, for they sensed that she was much older than they, and the men avoided her, for they saw behind her purity not the hungry fire they expected, but the ashes of horrible fires long dead. Thus, Belshalti Nanar became a priestess of the temple of the moon god, and Ningal, the moon goddess, a temple that lay beside the stepped ziggurat and was lit by the bright moon disk. Belshalti Nanar knew and loved the traditions of the ancients and searched tirelessly for knowledge concerning the glorious sacred past of the city of Ur. Like her father Nebuniad, she read the secret messages of the ancients upon their statues and stone tablets. She had a contemplative and questing mind in a bold spirit, for she did not shrink to take her questions to Nanar the moon god and his radiant mate, Ningal. She besieged them continually with questions, for she wished not merely to believe, but to understand. The nine old priests would smile wisely as they watched her tall, slender figure follow the moon over the holy road and turn into the corridor of the nine columns. Then they would retire silently to the lesser sanctuary and light the four oil lamps around the throne of Ningal, the veiled goddess. Belshalti Nanar would ascend the four sets of seven steps and stand upon the square tower of the stargazers in the face of the full moon. And lo, her blue garment shone in the light that threw deep shadows behind her. Then would she address the disk of light. Behold, I am here. Thou didst call, and I have answered thee. My face shines with thy radiance, even as thine cloth shine with the brilliance of the sun. But lo, there is deep shadow behind me, and thee a shadow that cloudeth both heaven and earth. The very communion between us casteth a shadow upon heaven and earth. For this cause, I, who am slave to thy chain of light, serve thee weeping, for I can in no wise understand either thy nature or mine own. Thus spake Bel Shalti Nanar unto the full moon for seven years, and for seven years the moon answered not. It spake only with the silent tongue of the oceans, the blood, and the humors. But Bel Shalti Nanar did not falter, nor was she discouraged in her quest. Nor did she seek wisdom of the nine old priests, who lit the four lamps around the throne of Ningal in the lesser sanctuary. She knew that their knowledge could sustain and rejuvenate only those who drew from the secret fountain, which they did visit in secret. And the seventh month of the seventh year, the full moon spoke to Belshalti Nalnar. Those who persist in asking have ever received an answer. 
but mortals seldom wait until their question is fully formed and condensed into an arrow that can break the seal of silence. Because thou hast waited, even so, thou shalt receive an answer. Hear ye it, and lock it within thee, and allow no one who is unworthy to learn the words thereof. Verily, there is no limit to him who is boundless, infinite, perfect, and eternal. Thus, everything that existeth, truth, infinity, and even eternity itself, hath also its opposite. If this were not so, he would not be truly free. Hence the tree of knowledge, which is even a great analogy, could have stood in front of him who was free without harm, for it is the work of the everlasting emanated being. The evil and deadly, attractive and beautiful thing could have stood before him to awaken the desires of the flesh, against which the everlasting warned, but did not make impossible. Therefore, no mortal can give unto the inexperienced child his life experience, either in this world or the world above. For lo, the pattern must be repeated continuously, even as the ripples when a stone is thrown into the water. For the mortal must needs experience the evil form, the world of death, in order that he might know of a certainty that he is the right way, and that redemption proceedeth only from him. The eternal and Ningal, his reverse potential, are the divine duality, for the veiled goddess already ruled the lesser sanctuary in the sunken ancient homeland. She who hath been and will be worshipped and venerated by the nations of the earth, even she is the ruler of all the blessed and sinful women of the earth. She ruleth also over me, her humble servant, pronouncing my secret name Shin, and is even the mediator who ruleth over the planets, stars, and the very universe. Her veil is the Milky Way and the vast covering of the stars. She it was who was the goddess of your forefathers, the resplendent Ishtar of their sunken, ancient homeland, the Atlantean Isis. And behold, desire slumbered in Ningal, the temptress, and the desire of procreation flared within her. The everlasting was the begetter, and Ningal, the great mother from whose womb the third, the mortal being, came forth burdened with Ningal's mortal desires, and uplifted by that recognition of the everlasting that conquereth death. It was his word that spoke Ningal into being, but he himself is unmanifested. So Ningal's progeny, the mortal being, began his journey. And lo, the great law also began, as it is below, so it is above. The mortal being, like the great mother and father, was split in twain by desire and by the curiosity for the separate way. And this sundering born of desire and curiosity gave birth to the twin forces of attraction and repulsion. And from these were born a third, and the third followed the example of its parents. Thus an infinite number of mortal beings came forth from the womb of Ningal, and each was a repetition, a widening circle of the wondrous god-drama above. And the everlasting consented unto this, for the cure for desire is gratification, and the cure for evil is suffering. Where desire slumbereth, slumbereth danger also, danger that is averted only by the total fulfillment of the ripples of the omniverse. Though he is unmanifested, yet is he a part of every being an invisible substance that cannot be destroyed. For the everlasting needs no experience. He is unchanging and is lord over death. Behold, Ningal desired, she burned with the pleasure of conception. She brought forth her progeny in sweat, exulting in the illusion dance of time. She tried, without ceasing, to form eternal beauty from the temporal matter, but her labor was in vain, like one who maketh images in the snow. Ningal indeed experienced the pleasures of time, and behold, she found them to be nothing a bubble in the wind. She suffered and perished often in the drama of existence, always striving to return unto him who is patient, silent, omniscient, and eternal. To this end she endured the fiery furnace of pain to make complete her surrender. 
but this cannot be accomplished until three become two, and the two become one. And the mortal being returneth continually unto Ningal, and Ningal doth return continually unto him. Since the inner essence of every being is the omniscient and patient divine ego in each and every being, there liveth not only the figure of coming into existence, but also the desire of Ningal, born of her bitter disappointment and knowledge to return unto her divine partner. This is the meditation, knowledge, and disillusionment of the more mature Ningal as she ascends toward the unique, unmanifested, and everlasting. Ningal's cry of desire and wail of repentance echo through the omniverse even unto this day. The cry of lust descendeth into the lower paths of existence. In every bride, the veiled Ningal hasteneth with lustful excitement into dangerous desires and the elusive joy of creation. In every priestess, Ningal taketh the vow of chastity and resisteth those desires and passions that bring suffering. Every womb holdeth Ningal's new hope, her new invention. So also in every tomb lieth Ningal's bitter failure, from which is born repentance and recognition. For lo, a thing must needs die and decay ere it shall rise, if Ningal would rise unto him forever, for she and the beings to whom she gave birth must know death and decay. As it is above, even so is it below. Belshalti Nanar stood erect in the square tower of the stargazers and faced the disk of the moon that began sinking below the sand dunes. She breathed deeply as the pale, mysterious face of Shin disappeared, dragging her long, milky veil behind her to make way for the dawn. But Belshalti Nanar did not await the sun. That lamp of red joys, she returned down the four sets of seven steps and hurried along the corridor of the nine columns, with the light of the sun reaching longingly after her. But the princess would not turn away after it. Instead, she walked swiftly past the nine old priests, who stood in ceremonial order before the door of the lesser sanctuary. As she approached, they drew open the curtains unto her. So Belshalti Nanar entered into the sanctuary, and approached the base of the throne where the four oil lamps enveloped the veiled goddess in shimmering light. She knelt before the throne, making an obeisance, then sprinkled incense into the vessel prepared for it and lit it from one of the oil lamps. This done, she began to gaze intently through the blue smoke at the veiled face of the goddess, and lo, the silence of ecstasy reigned within the sanctuary, and only the vigilant priests numbered the days and the hours thereof. And lo, the veils began to drop from Ningal's figure quietly and without seeming motion. On the fourth day after the fourth test, Belshalti Nanar discerned the soft contours of her knees, waist, and arms. Upon the fifth day, she saw her hands which held the key of life, and upon the sixth day the last veil fell, and she beheld the face of the goddess. And, behold, it was as though she looked into a mirror. Then did Belshalti Nanar understand the illusion of all things. Even that delusion, condensed into matter, divides that which is one. She understood the tragedy of living beings, and her own tragedy within it. Redemption and liberation were also made known unto her in this moment, but lo, they were afar off at the very end of the days of the earth, and she was consumed with bitterness and dejection of all her fastings and sacrifices. She spake unto the goddess, O oh, thou silent and disappointed mother, thou wretched mother of the world, alas, we must remain in this dark world, until the last desire hath been burnt from the cosmos, until the pharos of the last emotion dieth out, and the last question of mankind becometh ashes, 
until the bubble of the last death bursts upon the eternal river. Alack, we must wait and dance the dance of the great spiral, the endless ring dance piped by the flutes of our own bones. And Belshalti Nanar wept bitter tears as she gazed upon the uncovered visage of the goddess on which her tears were mirrored. Then, a seventh time, she filled the lamps at the four corners of the throne and threw fresh incense into the censer. And lo, after the endless night, the seventh day dawned, and the tears of the goddess were dry. She smiled as a bride who journeyeth unto the bridal chamber. And behold, the door behind her, even the door of the greater sanctuary, was opened. And the eldest of the priests awaited her upon the threshold, his robes embroidered with the pale green and gold sign that signifieth Aquarius. He stretched out his hand unto her, and she rose and followed him. And Bel Shalti Nanar smiled with hopeful smile of the goddess as she entered unto the greater sanctuary. The Greater Sanctuary As another dusk turned into evening, my father continued his story. Inside the Greater Sanctuary reigned a darkness as deep as the velvet inner spaces of the deepest meditation. It clung to the opened eyes of Bel Shalti Nanar as a heavy sheath. Stretching forth her hand to feel her way, the princess continued forward on her quest. The sanctuary was a long room, and the floor thereof began to slope, and lo, the passage became narrower also. The ground beneath her feet waxed, difficult and uncertain, and she was compelled to bow her head beneath the roof. The very air stank with damp, evil odor. Then were the ears of Bel Shalti Nanar smitten by a dull, throbbing noise, a sound which had no form or shape but yet was infinitely menacing. And behold, the roof was now so low that the regal princess must needs crawl upon her knees, moving among things that impeded her progress. A great anguish fell upon her, like unto a black owl that hunteth its prey. She felt the whirl of its wings upon her, and tiny pearls of horror started from her fair form. Already she felt she could go no further, but now she lay flat in a tunnel, scratching at its walls with her fingers to pull herself along. And lo, suddenly she came upon two points of light, lights that glowed with green, evil gleam. She stared as one in a trance, and the icy serpent of horror coiled itself around her heart. For the points of light were set in a face. They resolved themselves as two scornful eyes. Stop! These eyes commanded, as Bel Shalti Nanar gazed upon the face, its features appeared in the greenish light. Behold, the skin was scaly and repulsive and glowed with decay. The large imprint of the nose barely visible in the decaying substance. A third dead eye sat in the middle of its forehead, and within its gaping mouth shining worms whirled in voracious hunger. And yet the head glowed with evil life. Bel Shalti Nanar felt its presence suffocating her soul, and its contemptuous doubt boiled about her spirit to drag it into the depths of the astral reptiles, the misery of an animal existence. Look at me, the face commanded her. Then was the heart of the princess, Bel Shalti Nanar, smitten with unutterable memories and feelings, and the head spoke. Dost thou not know me after these tens of thousands of years? Dost Thou not know me, whom thou didst deny, abort, and slay, from whom thou fleddest behind the seven veils of matter? It was to escape me that thou didst pour into thine ears the hot lead of human voices, and did blind thy eyes with the glittering treasures of the earth. Yea, thou didst run and shout, drink, and go in unto men, and throw thyself at the feet of alien gods whose temples resounded with the sistra, the flute, and the gong, all to drive out the memory of my face and put away from thee the moment 
when we should meet again, thou and I, the murderer and the victim. Hadst thou known that it was I, even I, who lured thee through the chamber of the lesser sanctuary into the trap that is the greater one, that it was I who awaited thee at the end of this horrible tunnel instead of the illumination and redemption thou desirest, then wouldst thou have hurled thyself from the summit of the ziggurat unto the stones below? But thou wist it not. This is the consequence of thy sin of forgetfulness. Behold, thou art here, weakened and thirsty from eternal want, delivered into the hands of him who hath waxed strong through hatred and waiting. And even thine own fear, the fruit of thine own sweat and tears, contendeth with thee for its freedom, striving to gain power over thee. Slowly the vapors of memory arose within Belshantinar, and she perceived the name of this three-eyed monster. It was the faith she had betrayed, even the holiness she had defiled, and then discarded secretly as a woman leaveth her ill-gotten babe upon the stranger's doorstep. This had all befallen long ago in the ancient homeland before the time of the destruction, when the titans, ruled by the third eye, lived in the paradise of three worlds, and knew no death. For lo, the third eye in a man's forehead is the gateway of mystic sight and power. When the titans sinned and turned their strength one against another, it became the entry unto the hell of deadly hate. And behold, the serpent of wisdom left their minds and did slither into their loins, there to become the passion of the lower world of instinct and the feverish passion bore its fruit of selfishness, discrimination, pain, violence, and destruction. For though the titans knew the world of the spirit, they knew not of the lusts of the tempting earth that is poisoned by death. They were as newborn babes and thus were lost. The forces they drew from the cosmos through their mystic eyes waxed exceedingly dark and destructive for they had to pierce the defense of others as powerful as themselves to take what their envious senses did desire. Thus the pure light of the sun turned its face from the earth, and the evil emanations of the gutted ghost planets were drawn into the world through these transcendental eyes. And lo, the initiated priestesses also turned away in this time of mystic storm, and the pure temple in her soul sank within her, to be overgrown with weeds, yea, the very key thereof was lost, and the betrayed idea in the sunken sanctuary became a bitter ghost, an evil demon on the threshold. And behold, the judges of the cosmos made an end to this hellish drama. A small moon crashed upon the earth, and it was cleansed with fire and water, and the rebellious titans were driven forth from the eternal paradise and the third eye was taken from them. There remained unto them only a tiny, mysterious gland behind the forehead, a center of dim presentiments and warnings. And lo, the titans became men. They learned the secrets of sin and suffering and strove to develop their understanding, struggling with the hieroglyphs of nature to grasp with their mortal minds the great cause they could no longer divine and the heavens closed against the men, and the fear of death oppressed them. They searched the dark void with their minds and hearts, pitiful and helpless. The gods their fear created were not but threatening tyrants. Lo, they could neither comfort nor heal. Thus blinded mankind perceived only the prison walls of cradle and grave, and the serpent of passion within their loins demanded yet more bloody sacrifices and sensual delights. So blind and damned mankind begat blind children unto damnation. The stricken titan Gilgamesh wrote the words of his horror, which he had felt as he mourned over the body of his friend, who had become mortal. Enkidu, thou friend of mine heart, thou panther of the meadows, 
Lo, together we had reached the gates of truth. Our feet had trod the great mountain, even the peaks thereof. We had conquered the heavenly ram and broken the pride of Humbala of the cedar forest. What dream hath now seized thee? Thy face is dark, and thou hearest not my voice, nay, neither do thine eyes regard me. He laid his hand upon the heart of Enkidu, but lo, it was still. Then did the faithful friend cover the silent body as though it had been his bride. And he cried out like the lion, even as the lioness robbed of her cub. And he threw himself upon the body of his friend and tore his hair in agony, fragment from the Gilgamesh epic. Yet the forgotten temple still waited silently deep beneath the waters of remembrance, sunk into the depths of the waters, and the key thereof had been lost, and its dead god haunted its sanctuary as a monster. Now Belshalti Nanar understood that she was within the forgotten temple once more. She had found the corridor leading back to the past where she had once walked, ere the very memory of it had been wiped from her soul by the hand of the judges. Thus she stood at the door of the sanctuary prison and was confronted by the demon of the faith she had repudiated and disgraced. And Belshalti Nanar was exceedingly afraid. As her fear waxed into terror, the guardian of the threshold waxed increasingly strong. Then as her terror was like to become insanity, a vision appeared before her, like unto a shipwreck that riseth from the deep. Behold, she saw upon a column of the temple a picture of the guardian and the priest, overcoming him by shining the light of a lamp upon him, which light pierced him like a dagger. Now, Belshalti Nanar knew what she must do. Her fear was changed into purpose, and lo, the light of the lamp spread throughout the place, and the monster face began to fade. Then did the inner voice of Belshalti Nanar speak into the mournful gloom words that were as daggers before the demon's face. How shalt thou overcome me, unhappy shadow? Wouldst thou overcome thy creator? For thou art indeed that which I have created and would save. Thou art part of my own being, made unclean by mine own ancient sin, and now I would redeem and purify thee. This desire is within myself, not from any other source or against my will. I shall redeem thee, guardian, not by hating thee, but by having compassion. I shall not turn away, but shall embrace thee, touching thy wounds and washing my festering sores to disperse clotted time into infinity. Yea, come unto me. And lo, the face faded away before her and became as ashes in the light of the lamp. The accusing eyes dimmed, the bony skull disintegrated in the dusty air, and behold, a small light stood in its place, and reverent joy filled the heart of Belshalti Nanar, for the only flame in the greater sanctuary is upon the altar, even the eternal fire in the alabaster chalice, and it did beckon unto her. Now she could stand erect, and her astonished eyes beheld immense columns rising unto the starry firmament. And lo, she did walk through eight spacious halls, each larger than the last, and in the eighth hall there was an altar upon which stood an alabaster chalice holding a single flame. Behind it lay the boundless space of infinity. And lo, as she became accustomed to the dim light, she saw a coffin, even an open coffin before her, the healthy young body of Bel Shalti Nanar shuddered as she touched the cold, deadly stone and smelled in memory the stench of reopened graves. She felt every part of her body scream within her, rebelling in the fear of death. Her will to live arose and essayed to push her away from the coffin, but Bel Shalti Nanar stood firm. She freed her pure spiritual awareness from the tempters and commanded them to be silent from the height of the holy goal. And behold, the clamor ceased, and there was silence. And Bel Shelti Nanar laid herself in the coffin, stretching out between its icy stone arms. And lo, her body began to cool and harden. 
her eyes closed and opened a few times with a strange clicking noise, then remained open, gazing at infinity. Her consciousness remained unto her while her jaw slackened, and then, suddenly, she began falling inward at great speed. The consciousness she clung to so desperately now left her, and darkness rushed over her as waves over a drowning man. She knew she must not lose herself, so she set her thoughts in the present upon the light on the altar, and the vast inner spaces became as a funnel beneath her, a tight-throated funnel through which she fell head first. Her awareness contracted into a tiny point, and lo, she slipped through the narrow space into which she had been led. Then did Bel Shalti Nanar enter the bloodstream of the vast, ringing, rushing, radiating, whirling, and revolving universe, the infernal cosmos in which the planets, suns, galaxies, and nebula did dance the unceasing dance of death and rebirth, and she was filled with unimaginable pleasure. The intoxicating lust of power as her awareness grew and she realized that these suns, stars, and planets were her own, moved by her own power. For all these creations danced, died, and were reborn in, through, and around her. She was the synthesis of their being, the Titan, the God of the universe. It was she who gave them meaning. The majestic chords of contentment and pride resounded through her being, accompanied by the jubilant music of the spheres. So Bel Shalti Nanar sat enthroned in majesty above the physical universe as she looked down and felt what was told of old of the day after creation, and lo, it was very good. Thus the endless revolutions of the universe flamed and glowed and whirled around her, and slowly, after endless time and repetition, the princess waxed weary, and her weariness became apathy, and apathy became boredom. No longer was she the triumphant ruler, but rather a prisoner chained by the bondage of iron laws. For since she was the total consciousness of the entire universe, she was completely alone. Thus, in her bleak isolation, Belshelti Nanar drew unto herself her own inner universe searching for some companion, and immediately the harmonious creation over which she had presided exploded. Everywhere she looked were beings in her own image who ran from another, collided, fought, loved, prayed, cursed, procreated, became ill, and died and lo, all that they created died also. And she beheld her own inner conflicts played out in them as theirs were played out in their offspring in perpetuity. Then was Belshalti Nanar shaken with horror and helpless agony, for she perceived that matter itself is a trap both above and below. And with her entire being, she longed for freedom. But could there be such freedom? Could she escape the circle of the serpent devouring its own tail? As her desire for liberation grew stronger, the mind of Bel Shalti Nanar became concentrated as a single, tiny wand of light, and lo, her whole spirit became this wand. Its dagger point sought and found the hidden opening through which she might escape from the labyrinth into meaning. And lo, she came unto the antechamber of the Messiahs. The Antechamber of the Messiahs The Antechamber of the Messiahs was a place without form, glimmering in transition, for this is the place of the Immaculate Conception by which the unmanifested seeketh to make himself known. It is even the gate of the world where the essence of truth floweth before it is dressed in the material word in the world of Ningal. Here did Belshalti Nanar learn the secret of full knowledge and liberation, 
and from hence she returned by the secret path one last time, for every one must return from the antechamber of the Messiahs when he has become impregnated with the word. When Belshelti Nanar arose from her coffin in front of the altar of the great sanctuary, the nine old priests awaited her with their ninety disciples and all those whose souls belonged to the true temple, and they awaited her word to learn why she had returned to them. The eldest priest bowed and spoke unto her, calling her by her true name. Then you have returned unto us, O Belshelti Nanar. I have. She who was called by her divine name answered quietly, I have returned to speak unto you, and behold, the words which I speak must not be recorded. Neither shall they be preserved in pictures, for the words I speak are the path itself, the action, and the end of all action. I shall speak of the final step. To hear these words is to do them, to submerge into the separateness that in the end leads to the liberation of unity. For lo, I have returned not from a place, but from the ending of every place. The very word end hath no meaning there, nor can the thread of speech reach beyond its threshold. And she pronounced the word unto them. Man himself is the secret of liberation, for lo, he is the image of God. He mirroreth the image of Ningal, but he hath the everlasting within him. Behold, Ningal may be liberated only at the great dusk, the time when the last of the fruit of her womb shall be returned to her. But man may walk a separate path. Man can redeem himself. For lo, we have a way, even God the begetter, the unmanifested. Watch ye for the Messiah, the avatar who cometh again, and yet again to play out the mystery. He walketh upon the road and calleth unto man to follow him into freedom. He walketh upon the road for a while, then turneth into the hidden path which leadeth to the secret gate. Watch ye. Behold, a woman conceiveth, and in every country among every race and kindred where runneth one legend, immaculate conception. And lo, it was immaculate conception, even as life was conceived in the womb of Ningal by the word of God. And when the divine child appeareth, the earth is fearful and dark. Then are the planets in oppressive, murderous conjunction. They fill the world with horror. Evil emanates from the fixed stars, and lo, the comets plow the sky, and sunspots and magnetic storms shake the net of the earth and waters. Strife erupts in the earth, and illness becometh Mortal mania turneth to madness, and quarrels become wars that anoint the earth with blood. Shaken and aroused by strange happenings, the three blood-stained plains of the microcosmos await with trembling as he cometh. Then the child becometh a man. For a time he walketh like unto other men, remembering and preparing but already is his enemy stirred, watching and opposing him. For lo, their senses recognize danger and the presence of a being greater and more destructive than any other. Within him lieth a cold loneliness, the enemy to the hot current of life. He is as one who carrieth smuggled merchandise, yea, even that which disintegrateth matter, the matter hindereth him, torturing his body, senses, and feelings. Its weapons are the ridicule of man, obstacles insurmountable, slanders, hunger, want, and sickness, even doubt, beauty, and the many colors of pleasure. But even these trials bring purification and strength unto him, and the Messiah proceedeth upon his path. Now his step quickeneth, as he turneth unto his own path, following in the ways of others no more, he marketh his path and declareth himself, and lo, the spiteful whisper, as they watch the lone figure, they know it is he. The feet of the feeble begin to follow, for they recognize him. The winds of the world move them with wild force. They would sweep away the mortal hands that cling to him, dissolve in flood the roads in front of him, and reshape the very earth around him. The powers turn the spinning wheel of life to stun and delude him, and those who would follow him. But lo, the shadowy walls of matter part for the Messiah, and he crosses the torrent in safety. Then for one moment is the path filled with light before all 
the three worlds and the gate appears. It is in vain that matter seeketh to deny his words and put him aside, for the cruel death of the Messiah is even martyrdom, and his martyrdom becometh the key of the gate of liberation. Thus the mysterium cometh to pass before the eyes of men. The revelation hath come, and the word hath been spoken. Lo, the light shineth, and bright footsteps show the way, the way to salvation through suffering and death. When she had done, a silence fell upon the hall, and the slender figure of Belshelti Nanar grew paler and ever paler in the blue moonlight. And who shall explain her disappearance, for it was unfathomable. And lo, the elder priest vanished even as she had done, yea, and the other eight and their ninety disciples, and all those who were of the true temple, the secret priests, cultivators of the holy science, the dreamers and sages. Thus it came to pass that in the day when the fate of Ur was fulfilled, the temple of Nanar lay empty, for the soul had gone out of it, and lo, its hall was silent, neither were the hymns of Nanar and his divine mate heard from within its precincts. The colorful procession of the holy emblems with the sound of harp and lute emerged no more, and the storm that had long been forming in the east broke mightily soon after the spiritual force had gone from Ur, Belshazzar, the brother of Belshalti Nanar, even he who acted the regent for his father was slain by the Persian invaders, and Nebuniad himself was made captive. Then was the kingdom of Babylon delivered unto the great Cyrus. And behold, the people who dwelt in childlike ignorance near the temple began to quake, for they felt that the power of the empty temple had deserted them. Thus they wandered away, seeking new light, like unto a swarm of insects. And the slow grinding mills of time worked their will upon the temple. The Persian kings also, who followed Zoroaster's religion, cast down its images and hastened the total destruction of the city. Only a heap of ruins remained. Its very name was forgotten. Wild beasts sheltered within its terraces, and Bedouins camped in its shadow, never knowing that beneath their feet lay buried the sanctuary from which the liberated had begun their journey unto the antechamber of the Messiahs. He Who Never Dies When I was 18, I was made a practitioner, the third grade of the order. The laboratory work I began to perform under my father's guidance was completely new and entertaining. During those quiet, absorbed hours, I learned the true characteristics of nature and the great laws of the divine life force that work behind them. Poor blind Burris, he had simply played with these phenomena like a child playing with dynamite, and all the vast knowledge of homunculus was miserably small beside the knowledge of a single functioning cell for it is filled with life secret and performs a transmutation every second. The members of my order have been variously called Rosicrucians, Templars, and Trinosophians. But in essence, the order was simply a continuation of those ancient communities which guarded the traditions of the most profound philosophy. The school of Pythagoras performed this sacred chore to the same extent as did the Essenes of Judea, among whom Jesus prepared himself for his mission. I have intentionally omitted the Masonic Lodge from this group, for it is deviated into worldly affairs. In the 18th century, the centers of the order were the castle of Karl von Hess and the mystical school Louisenland in Schleswig. Its leader was the Count St. Germain, a friend of Karl von Hess, who was revered by the Brotherhood, misunderstood and admired by the nobility, and execrated by the masses who referred to him as the man who has never died. He was the quintessential wizard, scientist, and artist. The Magus, he had been the eyewitness of millennia, this enigmatic emissary of the secret Brotherhood. 
The Hermetic Order itself was basically Egyptian in origin, but it also embodied the Christian mysticism of Christian Rosenkreuz. This Rosenkreuz had been born in 1388 in the German nobility and reared in a monastery. During a pilgrimage in the Holy Land, he was initiated into the mysteries of the secret sciences by some erudite Arabs in Damascus. After three years in Damascus, he went to Fez in Africa where he learned more about magic and the relationship of the macrocosmos and the microcosmos. Then he returned to Germany by way of Spain. Once home, he founded the monastery community of Sanctus Spiritus, where he retired to continue his studies. Later, he accepted some of the monks from the monastery where he had been reared as disciples and thus formed the first Rosicrucian society. These monks wrote the results of their researches in books still available to Rosicrucians today. Rosenkreuz's tomb wasn't discovered until 120 years after his death. It was an underground vault reached by a staircase, and there was an inscription on the door that read, Post Anos CXX Patibo. Inside the vault, a light was burning, but it was extinguished the moment someone entered. The vault had seven sides and seven corners, and each side was five feet long and eight feet high. The ceiling, which symbolized heaven, was quartered in triangles. The floor symbolized the earth. In the midst of the mystic chamber was an altar. There was a copper plate on it engraved with the initials ACRC, and chiseled below it were the words Hoc Universi Compendium Vivos Mihi Sepulchrum Feci. Four figures surrounded this altar. Each of them was inscribed, and the inscriptions taken together read Nequam Vacuum, Legis Jugum, Libertas Evangelii, De Gloria Intacta. Rosenkreuz's body was found under the altar. It showed no signs of decay. His hand held a scroll on which an illuminated tea was visible. The members of the Rosicrucian order took a vow of secrecy about this matter. Really, Rosenkreuz was fulfilling a mission in doing the work of his distant masters, who saw that at the time was ripe to establish spiritual embassies. Today, the history of the Fratemast Rosicrucius is well known enough not to require further discussion. St. Germain, however, was more conjectural. The public part of his life was so astonishing, and his personality so fascinating and unusual, that the average person could not understand him. He had traveled widely, was wealthy without visible means of support, and had a penetrating intellect. These things all aroused suspicion. People who had to have a label for everybody called him an imposter, but no one ever caught him in a swindle. Instead, he was highly esteemed by rulers, philosophers, scientists, and artists. I was 20 when St. Germain paid an unexpected visit to the castle of Grote. I had heard a good deal about him, of course, and I had been granted entry to the secret place that housed his famous occult library and rare manuscripts. His secular friends also knew about this library, and they tried without success to find it after his supposed death. I had also seen his paintings whose colors were mixed so brilliantly they dazzled the viewer. It was a well-known fact that the French painter Van Lu had asked to learn the secret of this mixture and had been refused. And I knew that Saint Germain was in the habit of giving violin concerts, conducting symphonies without the score and composing both leader and operas. Many of the powerful personalities who knew Saint Germain, Frederick the Great, Voltaire, Madame du Pompadour, Rousseau, the Earl of Chatham, and Sir Robert Walpole had tried to find out something about the origins. The most common theory was that he was the son of Rakosi, the Prince of Transylvania. Later, the Theosophist declared that he was Ferenc Rakosi himself and that someone else had been buried in the great man's place. Other people believed that he had appeared in various countries under different names. The Marquis de Montferrat, in Venice, Chevalier Schwenning in Pisa, Chevalier Weldon in Milan, and Leipzig, Comte de Soltikoff in Genoa, and Leghorn, Graf Zaragi in Schwalbach and Driesdorf, Rakosi in Dresden, and Saint Germain in Paris, The Hague, and Saint Petersburg. Some of the mystic writers connected him with the various Comte de Jabalis who came to the Abbey Villiers 
and gave him some essays on submundane spirits. Others were sure he was the Signor Gualdi of whom Hargrave Jennings had written in his book on the Rosicrucians. They also suspected that he was really Count Hampesh, the last Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. All of this was understandable in view of St. Germain's widely varied life, but it is certain that he was not really all the people he was alleged to have been. In those days the world was still a huge place, and more than one adventurer countries away from the original took advantage of the prestige of his glistening personality. The same thing happened to another initiate, Count Cagliostro, a man of noble aspirations who became completely fused in the popular mind with the charlatan Joseph Balsamo. I myself obtained evidence that Cagliostro and Balsamo were two different men with widely disparate personalities. But anyone who thought the multifaceted Count St. Germain was simply an adventurer out for material gain was thoroughly mistaken. He owned, in his own right, an unrivaled collection of paintings and precious stones, and Madame de Pompadour testified that he gave the king valuable Velasquez's and Murillo's, and presented her with the rarest and most valuable of her gems, for he was always the patron, never the patronized. He never betrayed confidence, yet no one was ever able to determine the origin or extent of his wealth. He had no connections with any of the great banking houses, but he appeared to have unlimited credit. Currently, St. Germain was friendly with Louis XV, whose whole court was fascinated by his knowledge of chemistry. At Louis's request, he would remove flaws from diamonds and rubies right in front of everyone. He also achieved astonishing results in coloring precious stones with his own mixture of paint and crushed mother of pearl. The king lavished him with favors, and he virtually turned the court upside down, bringing a new excitement and freshness to the rigid aristocracy. People began to look for miracles everywhere, and could talk of nothing but alchemy and the occult and St. Germain's strange sayings. The Count had a perfect knowledge of history that went back thousands of years. He talked about events at the court of Francis I, as though he had been there himself, giving an intimate description of that king, and even imitating his voice and manner. Furthermore, he could give just as many confidential details about Babylon during the reign of Cyrus the Great. Naturally, he dumbfounded people. Some branded him a compulsive liar and sensation-seeking charlatan, but even they had to admit that his facts were always accurate and were presented naturally rather than being introduced artificially. St. Germain had the genius to comprehend the entire European situation at any given time, he parried his political enemies with the greatest of ease. The court always seemed to have letters of recommendation that opened the highest doors in Europe. He had lived in Russia during the reign of Peter the Great, and he had been the honored guest of the Shah of Persia between 1737 and 1742. It appeared he was known and respected all over the globe. And beyond all this, St. Germain had a supernatural command of languages. He could speak German, English, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Arabic, French, Greek, Latin, and Chinese. So fluently that he was accepted as a native in all these countries. Only his French was slightly accented. He spoke it as do the Piedmontese. He was ambidextrous and could write the same text simultaneously with each hand or a different text with each. Sometimes he wrote a sonnet and a mystic poem both at once. St. Germain had performed public transmutations twice, and people always flocked to get his rejuvenating elixirs and medicines. Frankly, I didn't like what I heard. Undoubtedly, he had the extraordinary abilities that should belong to a real magus and initiate. But why did he display them so openly, almost blatantly? Why the dazzling fortune and the two valets and four lackeys in cream and gold lace livery? Why should an adept have a wardrobe like a courtesan? fresh jewels for every week, and a new name for every year. I voiced my doubts to my father, and he smiled. St. Germain doesn't need those trappings any more than you or I. His real home is the Hermitage in the Himalayas, from which he came, and to which he will return when he has completed the mission assigned him by the higher forces. I myself can swear that he never eats at the rich tables to which he is invited. He eats a meager, meatless diet that is prepared to his own recipe, 
Every morning he does esoteric oriental concentration and meditation exercises without fail, and he refrains from having intimate relations with women, since he can make stones into gems and base metal into gold. It is easy enough for him to put on this character which the world accepts more readily than the yellow robe and shaven head. Those diverse abilities are nothing but the toys a doctor uses to captivate a sick child while he examines its ill, slips a dose of bitter medicine into its mouth, or cuts out a dangerous abscess. You know yourself that this sick, fermenting world that has deviated so completely from the source of all spiritual health would never understand the magus in his true form. Our sophisticated, monomaniac universe is drifting toward a crisis and St. Germain has been sent out into a quaking world, already facing a grim sunset to establish first aid stations for souls. The thing he must do to attract their attention, they are so blinded and deafened by matter that he must ring all the bells and show them marvelous colors and phenomena. He has to be a king among kings, a Croesus among the rich, an Amagus among the philosophers. He has to understand everyone's tongue, see through everyone's eyes, and at the same time hear the secret voices behind the visible actions. He even has to penetrate walls. My father concluded with a sigh. But who is he really? How long has he lived in one body? My father gave me a gentle, understanding glance. I asked St. Germain the same question many years ago when I was a practitioner. What was his answer? He said the secret science was his father and the mysteries his mother. Did that satisfy you? I was disappointed. Not then, but later I realized that is all a true adept can ever say about himself. One evening, I went into my father's study just as it was growing dark. I had been in the park all afternoon practicing my nature and symbol understanding exercises. A creek hurried along under the old trees there, and I had collected from its bed strangely colored polished pebbles whose delicate translucent bodies were veined with lines like ancient hieroglyphs. These lines were mute screams of pain and yearning. You only had to read them. I had also spent some time watching a teeming ant hill near a huge linden tree. The ants scurried to and fro about the base of the trunk. This was a real ant metropolis, totally absorbed in its industrious, fascinating work. Yet the little insects were prisoners of their communal instinct, Watching them, I realized that the experiment of collectivism must always be a fiasco. It locks itself into a circular cage of slavery to achieve the outward appearance of liberation, sustaining a lifestyle that leads nowhere. The society grinds without seeds, makes strenuous efforts with no meaning, refines its operations to masterly precision, all going nowhere until the fragmented group consciousness rouses itself to break out of the swirling hell of this ingenious and terrible society and forms into unique self-aware individuals. This September evening, as always, I reported my results to my father, putting my prize pebbles on his desk. He had just finished writing and was waiting for me. He listened to my observations and then added his own remarks, which often helped me to get entire thought complexes into focus. Then he had finished. I got up to leave and prepare for supper, but he restrained me. Wait. We're going to have a visitor. A visitor? I was surprised. So far as I knew, we had neither letter nor messenger that day. Who is it? The room had grown dark. Suddenly, I felt a presence that had not been there moments earlier. My father also felt this, for he stood up. Following his gaze, I turned around. The newcomer stood in the glittering gray rectangle of the window. Now he came forward. Perhaps we might light the lamp now, Cornelius. He had a pleasant voice, and his speech was polished and attractive. Welcome, my father shook his hand with real joy. Then I knew who the man was, and I felt a sudden stage fright that made me remain motionless while my father did the work of lighting the lamp. As the blue-white light poured through the room, St. Germain came over to me. So this is he, giving my father a friendly nod, and the pressure of his strong, dry hand put me at ease. At last... But not for the first time. Good evening, he said softly, staring into my eyes. Good evening, I returned his greeting, relaxed now and unselfconscious. I stared at this mysterious man. It wasn't the first time I had seen him, 
the memory of him slumbered deep within me. At last, but not for the first time, oh yes, he knew, he knew where it was we had met in the dim, distant past. Only the shadow of remembrance brushed me. The man's eyes were dark and gentle, but there was an intelligence and mystery there too. They seemed to see and understand everything. His face was oblong, with delicate, slightly curved nose, and a mouth where smiles seemed to lie in waiting. When he did smile, an expression of pure joy transfigured his face. For the rest, he had a slight tan and black hair, and was wearing a simple, if finely woven suit on his medium frame. I couldn't begin to estimate his age. It was unusual that I was able to meet him, for generally the lower grades of the order were not allowed to get acquainted with those on the higher levels except for the immediate next grade. There were nine grades in all, juniors, theoreticians, practitioners, philosophers, minors, majors, adeptus, exemptus, magisters, and finally, the magi. There were a good many members of the lower grades. Membership diminished in proportion to the difficulty of the grade, of course, the ultimate rung on this ladder was God. He stood in the position of ten. This represents the duality, God equals one, world equals zero. But my situation had been exceptional from birth. My father, who was my master, and had directed me from my earliest exercises, was already a magister, the second highest rank. No one ever called Saint Germain by his secular name, even when he made unexpected appearances at the Order's meetings in Rettenberg. Each member of the order had a fraternal name different from the one by which he was generally known, and his secular name was never used. St. Germain's fraternal name was Tempio Aperto, Open Temple. When he conducted the secret initiation ceremonies, he was called Hierophant. Of course, the exceptional opportunity to meet him was not a divine grace that had fallen into my lap. I had worked for this privilege once upon a time, I remembered it gradually later during the silence of initiation. I had actually been a member of the fraternity for many centuries before my fall and had gotten as far as the threshold of the final trials, but my talent, intellect, and discipline had been only on a human order, and during the convulsive crisis of conscious death and rebirth, I had yielded to my weaknesses, fears caused my imperfect knowledge, and passion caused by unresolved emotions. Yet my ideals had ever been high, and I really understood a good deal of the theory of secret symbols and the truths of existence. My return had been a genuine joy to my fellow members and the Magi, who had never ceased to regard me as a member. Really, my lapse, in spite of all the misery it had caused me, was simply a practical test of a tenet of faith laid down during my mystical initiation. I had to learn and understand it thoroughly and make it a real part of me, despite the tangling chaos of material unreality. Initiation always occurs twice. The first time is when an entity has come to earth, but still has an undimmed awareness of the other world. Then he steps into the temple of mysteries. During the trials he is alone in the silence of condensed time and shrunken space, and an indelible sketch is etched upon his soul in a few sure marks. The trials themselves are symbols of all the temptations, possibilities, and dangers to be undergone later and of the true meaning of existence. This sketch once made is guarded by the soul and its lines are still visible through the thickest body dress, even though their meaning has been forgotten. It is the burning urge that appears in our restless dreams and drives us to and fro from experience to experience in the barricaded physical world. It is the source of the eternal discontent that causes us to reach forward for ephemeral goals, for behind these goals is the chimera, the sacred riddle that lures us on even through the midst of passion, ambition, intellectual attainments, death, and rebirth. No matter how far we stray, we are still on the prescribed path and will return to our beginnings. Then there is the second final initiation that takes place at the end of the road, after the fires of passion are burned out and human experience has been endured, the theory becomes a living reality, and the gate of the first mystery swings open. But once you have passed the first gate, you cannot leave until you have trod the entire maze. St. Germain's arrival caused a real change in my life. My father told me I was to accompany the Count to Paris. I could tell he was watching intently to see how I would react. Would I reveal joy, immature excitement, or anxiety? 
I confronted myself honestly facing the ashes of dead fires the name conjured in me. I knew that I must go where I was sent, that every course set before me was a part of my personal task. Knowing this, I submitted obediently. What will my duties be in Paris? I asked quietly. You are to be the court secretary and famulus to learn from him and obey his instructions. How long will I be in this post? I suddenly felt sad at the thought of leaving my parents and this beautiful peaceful park where I had spent so many wonderful days. Until your work is finished, my father was firm. I was ashamed of having been so immature. My mother came up to me, encouragement in her every feature. I embraced her. The distance means nothing to the soul, she whispered. You have to check your knowledge before every important examination. You know. Go in peace, Cornelius. The First Messenger from the Past I thoroughly enjoyed my journey with the witty and amiable Count St. Germain. The Count's famous thoroughbreds drew our luxurious carriage, and inside were all kinds of ingenious mechanisms to add to our comfort. Our trip itself was so well organized that his own rested horses and servants awaited us at every relay. It was in St. Germain's carriage that I first saw a drop-leaf table, a small refrigerator for food, a water tank, and a heating device that enabled Yidam, the Count's mute Tibetan servant, to make coffee or tea. There were even push-button sensors for incense that either refreshed or tranquilized with no after-effects. Do you like my little toys? St. Germain smiled at my bewilderment. They astound me, I admitted. Louis XV thought they were devilish, but he wanted them so much he tried to steal them. Really, this wizardry is just a little loan from the future. Such things will become commonplace. People will acquire these comforts only to find they do not solve their problems. The evolution of man is headed in that direction, but right now it is hard to believe it will ever come about. Nevertheless, the framework of life will expand alarmingly, and the classes will become better equalized. The masses will begin to live more like the privileged few and share their problems. Aren't you talking about a revolution? Revolutions, he revised, many of them external and internal. They will erupt periodically for centuries. The Count stared pensively into the distance. The first will come soon, he added softly. Before we went to Paris, we spent a month in the strictest seclusion in Ghent. St. Germain never even set foot outside our quarters. I was his link with the outside world. The old town of Ghent seemed to have stagnated in time. Its ancient houses with their narrow windows, arcades, and ornamental carvings, and the cobblestones underfoot reminded me of Nuremberg, where I had also walked with Amagus. I was again serving the same man, of course, though he had a different body and face, but I was completely different from the persecuted, obsessed Hans Bergner. St. Germain kept a strict diet during his seclusion and fasted periodically. I supervised the preparation of his meals, not because Yadam needed my oversight. He executed his master's thought commands perfectly. But to teach me about nutrition, the main ingredient in his menu was oat flour. Yidam used a small hand mill to grind it to varying consistencies. He didn't use much salt, but did much of his seasoning with honey, milk, and lemon. Everything was cooked in pure vegetable oil. Fresh butter and fruit completed the menu. I was glad to share this repast. I had become accustomed to such meals in my parents' home. I dwell on this to point out how much the old alchemists knew about the necessity of a proper diet and the importance of vitamins. They taught even then that diet was decisive in preventing or healing most diseases. 230 years before, Rochard had kept a vegetarian diet and prescribed the same for his patients. In addition to maintaining a strict diet, St. Germain, like Paracelsus, Trismosin, Albertus Magnus, Sendavogis, and Rochard used a medication that strengthened the human organism and improved its resistance, the essence of nature's healing power, the secret of regeneration they had gained from profound knowledge and intuition. I was only allowed to see the Count for one hour every evening. He was always serious and taciturn, very different from the worldly, vibrant cavalier. There was an abstract, noble simplicity about him. 
He was regenerating those energies that he must pour on the world so that a very few of the millions of possible seeds on the barren soil might take root. He would listen to my summary of his mail and dictate brief replies. These letters came from almost every important personality in Europe and brought him all the latest news, usually with requests for advice. Thus, he saw events before their birth and was sometimes able to change them. Unfortunately, not often enough to make the world picture a saner one. While we were in Ghent, St. Germain intervened to give me a strange and important experience. One morning, two of our servants, one permanent and one temporary, were walking the Count's thoroughbreds in front of our lodgings. I was just coming back from my early morning walk, and I noticed a man eyeing the horses with approval. Soon he began striking up a conversation with the servants. He was a conspicuous man in foreign clothing with an olive complexion, dark burning eyes, a large aquiline nose, and a strong jaw, obviously of Latin origin. I estimated that he was about 45 or 50, though his tall figure was still muscular and youthful. Yet it wasn't his appearance that caught my attention. It was a certainty that I knew the man from somewhere and had forgotten his name. I stepped back under the arcade and watched his animated features and broad gestures. He was asking the servants what nobleman it was who owned such rare, beautiful animals. Our regular stable boy was too discreet to reply, but the other took it upon himself to declare that the horses were the property of Count St. Germain. He added further that the Count had been in residence for a month and would see no one despite many entreaties. The foreigner immediately responded eagerly, why, I know St. Germain, know him well. Announce me immediately, he'll see me. The servant, scared and apologetic, refused. I was annoyed by the importunity of this aggressive man, but I was more certain than ever that I knew him, and it worried me. Well, I'll write him. The man cut off their argument with the arrogant gesture of a man performing before an audience. Then I recognized him. Louis de la Tourzel, the drunken satyr, who had been my father in my previous life before he got killed in a brothel brawl. I watched his retreating figure. He had kept the feline movements of his previous life. His body was obviously still merely a vessel of passion, but there was more intelligence and complexity in it. St. Germain noticed my brooding immediately that evening. When he asked, I told him what had happened. Before I could even finish a rock with a letter attached to it crashed through the window, that's just like him, I said resignedly. Somehow I still felt I had to apologize for him. I went over and picked up the note, which proved to be both aggressive and theatrical. His writing was bold and coarse, but the note was admittedly witty and original. My dear Count, you won't keep me from communicating with an old friend even if you have a seven-headed dragon at the door. When would it be convenient for you to see another master of the art of living? I burned to shake your hand. I'll be round tomorrow evening to collect your answer in person, your Casanova. The signature made me gasp with surprise. Casanova, well, this is progress. No, St. Germain contradicted quietly. Fulfillment, it is the logical end of a lifetime that is going in the wrong direction. It contains the decline within itself. He seems to be exaggerating when he calls you an old friend, I prompted unable to resist the temptation to learn more about this enigma. There is such a thing as a one-sided friendship, Cornelius. I have run into him a few times on the stage where we both play a role. You obviously play thoroughly contrasting roles, I replied. We do, for that very reason, they are complementary. Like light and shadow, you mean? In the material world, one can't exist without the other. He arouses strange feelings in me, I admitted, thoughtfully. I'd really like to do something for him. He repels me, but I pity him. I feel responsible for him, just as if he were still my father. I'm ashamed of him, but he interests me. Are you going to receive him tomorrow? St. Germain said nothing for a moment, staring at me steadily. I think I'll have to, so you can understand him and get him out of your system, Cornelius. You need to realize that neither one of us can do anything for him right now. God himself does not interfere, you know, but merely allows him to continue to live an experience. I awaited Casanova's visit with a troubled excitement I had not felt in a long time. The Count was once more the man of the world for the occasion. 
His dark suit and doublet bore jeweled buttons worth a fortune. His hair was powdered, and a huge clear sapphire sparkled on his finger. Tonight, you will have the opportunity to understand something important, Cornelius. You can't become a master until you learn the real nature of things, including the law that a person can be reached only at his own level and only to the extent of his capacity. When there is no capacity to understand, you cannot force even the greatest and most wonderful treasures on a person. A prophet who keeps on preaching the word to a rock is undoubtedly a lunatic. Just then a servant came in and announced, Jacques de Casanova de Sengol. St. Germain stood up and went to greet his guest, while I remained in the background a mere observer. I enjoyed the advantage of this position many times during the years I was with him. Scores of candles were burning in the room, but the window arch was shadowed, so I withdrew to watch this renowned and infamous man of whom so little was known and yet so much discussed. I was a part of his past, the past that was only a dim presentiment to him. He had changed a good deal. I don't mean his features, of course. They were different, though it was easy to distinguish traits of Louis de la Tourzel, but Casanova's face was darker and more passionate, yet with more cunning and experience. He was debauched, but not a drunkard. His eyes glittered with intensity and distrust, the adventurer who sought and shaped his own destiny. There was just a trace of sardonic humor about him, a bitter, skeptical humor, which was now only the ashes of fatigue, nausea, and old age. Yet it was a humanizing element by which his spirit had begun to grow. His exaggerated and expensive clothes invariably aroused antipathy in men, but you couldn't deny that the man had a presence. He maintained eye contact with whomever he was speaking, virtually leaning toward them physically and overwhelming them with the force of his voice. This technique swept over the weak and thoughtless of both sexes like a tidal wave. St. Germain just smiled at Casanova's fulsome compliments and pledges of friendship. You were good enough to write, my friend, that we are both masters of the art of living. Why don't we put aside the flattery we both reserve for the seduction of the masses? Let's allow ourselves the luxury of pure frankness tonight. Now, by God, there's a tempting offer. Casanova was enthusiastic. Dressing gown and slippers, then? My dear Casanova, complete nudity. The other man's face was perplexed. Then he hooded his eyes in watchful caution. As you will, will you disrobe first? Naturally, St. Germain replied sonorously as he bowed his guest to the table. Edom appeared quietly with a heavily laden tray. He laid out rich, spicy dishes and poured Casanova some wine, leaving the Count's glass empty. Then he left silently. Help yourself, St. Germain said cordially. You may want the strength for this unusual performance. I observe you're not eating the same food as I, Casanova remarked, and your glass is empty. What proof have I that Europe's greatest sorcerer doesn't wish to poison me? True, the Count nodded. I see you've begun to disrobe first after all, Cornelius. I stepped out of the window arch. My appearance definitely deflated Casanova. Startled, he just sat staring at me. Where the devil did he spring from? I've been here all along, sir. I spoke politely and bowed. Cornelius von Grote at your service. He's my famulus, my shadow, if you will, St. Germain explained. You need take no note of him. He will remain, but not as a factor in our conversation. Cornelius, taste our friend's food and drink some of his wine. That won't be necessary. Casanova grabbed the glass and drained it at one draught. The Count had reckoned correctly, of course. I had been alarmed since I never took alcohol or meat, but a mere doubt of the man's death-defying bravado would make him still greater risks for vanity's sake. I sat down at the table. Does it bother you to have Cornelius here? St. Germain asked. No, why should it? There's just something damn strange. What do you mean? Casanova turned directly to me. Tell me, boy, haven't we met before? I looked at St. Germain, and he replied for me. You have, in a way. He was once the only legitimate son you ever had, Casanova. Not now, of course, but in a previous life. That is so, my lord, I affirmed. It was obvious that the man was greatly disquieted and did not want to admit it. 
Finally, he laughed aloud. Your imagination is unrivaled, Saint Germain, but why try your tricks on an old skeptic like me? You are wrong, my friend. I am being entirely honest. Then I will be too. I think this whole thing is a fraud. Casanova retorted crudely, but I'll go along with it. Continue your disrobing. Where did you get that black cook? I brought him back from Tibet. And when were you in Tibet? Eighty-five years ago. So that makes him... Yadam is one hundred and twenty. One hundred and... Oh, all right. How old are you? Ageless. Foul. You are evading. Only by your narrow definition. But if you want to know, I have existed ever since the material world has existed. And you remember all this? Yes. All right. Tell me some nice gossip about Cleopatra. I found her fairly commonplace... She was really just a muddled, lustful woman maddened by reflections of an ancient glory, a cow resting on the throne of departed eagles. She had nothing in common with the real soul of Egypt or the ancient pharaoh priests who had possessed the great truth. Even her fabled beauty was exaggerated. She was no prettier than a young slave girl. It was only the splendor of her position that made her desirable. She was simply willful, incapable of the creative concentration that forms destiny. That's why she fell. Oh, come off it. You're interested enough, but you're cheating. I deny that. I don't want to insult you, but I am continuing to go naked. By all means. So I may continue to question the conjurer? Of course. And you'll answer anything and tell me your secrets. I repeat, I will be frank. And what precisely do you mean by frankness? You spoke of secrets, Casanova. True. I have them, just as nature does. But disclosing them is not just a matter of desiring to. Nature keeps no secrets, you know. She answers all questions in her own language. To understand the answers, you must understand the language. So, now I'm stupid, too. No, you are just a man who has studied different types of language. A satisfied, lecherous smile stole over Casanova's face. Certainly, there are some languages I know very well, indeed. But you speak them nearly as well as I do. Your mysterious ways are just as effective with women as my notorious reputation. I've envied you more than once. The way you can bring a shadow of youth back into the face of a woman who fears she is losing her charms. Why do you envy that? Because it's the key that opens every door. Perhaps so, but I've never used it as such. Casanova's eyes showed cynical scorn. You mean you're not interested in making love? I am interested in everything, even that. Then why your previous remark? Haven't you ever taken advantage of your opportunities? Perhaps I've used them differently than you have, but I've always been satisfied. Casanova laughed sarcastically. How about the ladies, my dear Count? Were they satisfied? I think so. I was honored with their continued friendship, and more important, they were grateful that they did not have to feel nausea and regret. Then they left your bed untouched, my friend. Untouched bodily, yes. So you celebrated a soul wedding with them. I would have thought that an impeccable cavalier like Saint Germain would be more afraid of ridicule than of feeding the host to a hungry woman. There, my dear Casanova, we come to one of the secrets it would be useless to explain to you. The only rapture you understand is the rapture of pleasure, which lasts only until the wick of the candle of the spiritual column is used up. By the way, you had better start being thrifty with it. My ecstasy doesn't consume my energy. The longer it burns, the greater its vitality, and those with whom I share it never feel the fatigue of its burning out. Oh, I've heard the myth of eternal pleasure before, and I don't believe a word of it. I myself have gone through every hell and by way of pleasure, and I haven't found it. I've had dark, insatiable, Asian bitches who had learned their art in the holy books and could prolong for hours what passes in seconds in the West. I've had Sappho's descendants in Greece who would make love-making a long, deadly ceremony of beauty. I've had Italian women right beside the bedrooms of their old husbands, and I've had Spanish women who wore their chastity like a fiery cross. I've known the cold and determined art of the French courtesans that is more maddening than all the others combined. But all the ecstasies led to fatigue and the lamp of pleasure burnt out. 
There's simply no pleasure without the body, and the pleasures always end sooner or later because the body's strength is finite. No. The body's strength is infinite, like any other force. It simply eludes those who don't know how to retain and renew it, retorted St. Germain. You mean your famous nostrum, the athoether, partially that, of course, is only a symbol of the universal spirit. Would you show me some? Certainly. To my surprise, St. Germain rose, took a carefully sealed crystal vial from his cabinet, and handed it to Casanova, who took it eagerly. There was a milky fluid in the vial that glistened and tilted with the movement of the bottle. This fluid, like the human body, contains condensed, undiscovered forces, the Count explained quietly. You can see it and weigh it, shake it a bit, and let the light shine through it. I warn you, though, if you or anybody else who does not know the secret should desire it, it will vanish like vapor right before your eyes. Do you believe me? No. Well, here is a pin. Puncture the wax. If you can swallow a single drop of that fluid, you'll renew your virility for years. Casanova grasped the pin, impatiently punctured the wax, and held the vial next to the candle. The light shone through the transparent crystal of the milky fluid. There was no sign. What happened to it? He burst out. What happens to the energy of youth? Where is the vigor of our seed scattered in dreams? What happens to life in an instant when it flows from the bloody stump of a severed head? How should I know? I can ask unanswerable questions as well as you can, but the answer is in your very hand. You just don't understand its language. You needn't rub it in. Me, I believe in what I can see, feel, touch, and comprehend in this world. I have no inclination to go back to the school bench, but I must confess that this idea of rejuvenated virility strikes close to home. I don't know the secret of it. You say you do. Then allow some of your vanishing atho-ether to enter my system, and I'll be eternally grateful to you for lengthening the one thing that means anything to me. I cannot do it, my friend. It would merely delay your growth but I will be glad to heal your gout. Fifteen of my pills will heal your pain in three days, and you'll regain your elasticity. To hell with pills, Casanova exploded rudely. There's a catch to them, just like your rejuvenating medicine. Then you would explain that they didn't work because I thought of a limping jackass when I took them. Show me some material results, something I can touch like a wine goblet or a woman. Give me something that warms me and gives me energy, something I can taste before devouring. Do you have a large silver coin? St. Germain cut in smoothly. As it happens, I do. Why? Lend it to me a while, and I promise you it will bring you interest before you leave this room. Casanova handed him a silver twelve sou piece. Immediately, the door opened, and Yidam brought in a portable iron furnace. He put a thin sheet of steel on the floor, placed the furnace down on top of it, and set about making up the fire. Excellent teamwork! Casanova applauded ironically. You've got it down pat. Your mute servant enters exactly the right moment and carries out your prearranged orders. I gave Yadam the orders in your presence, St. Germain replied simply. How? I didn't hear anything, but Yadam did. He hears differently than you do, for he knows the language. Why do you keep saying that? To make me feel stupid? I haven't repeated myself. I'm just stating facts. Anyone can learn what he does not know, if he wants to, and has the interest to persevere. Well, I don't. Furthermore, I don't believe there is anything to learn. I have no desire to be considered a superman as you do. I know you don't believe that there is anything to believe, or that I can tempt you. That's all right. Would you like to examine this crucible before I close it? He passed it over to Casanova, who turned it upside down, and then tapped its sides inch by inch with his ring. Then St. Germain put the twelve sous piece into it, fastened the lid, and put the crucible on the fire. Yidam turned the sand glass on the table. Casanova and St. Germain watched him silently as he performed his tasks. The room was silent, save for the hiss of the bellows, yet it was filled with the sound of Casanova's nervous restlessness. I could see his dense waves of protest and instinctive resistance swirling around St. Germain, who stood watching the fire with crossed arms. The last grain of sand dripped to the bottom of the glass. Yidam nodded and set aside the bellows, then unscrewed the lid of the crucible with wooden pliers, 
St. Germain held his hand over it and dropped in a softball of wax. Then Yidam placed the lid, turned the sandals, and applied himself again to the bellows. The heat grew almost unbearable, just as it once had in the workshop of Anton Brugendorf. But a Casanova would not budge from his seat beside the furnace. The heavy metal and his conflicting emotions added to the heat he was feeling, and beads of sweat glistened from under his wig. His face was flushed, and I could see a nerve beating in his forehead. At last, the time was up. Yidam opened the crucible, then submerged it in water. The pure yellow gold was cooled in minutes, and St. Germain pried it loose and handed it to Casanova. Have it examined by a goldsmith tomorrow. Get him to weigh a twelve-soup silver piece and compare the weights. I promise you it would be equal. But now, Casanova's blind temper erupted. It's a cheat, just a mean, ordinary cheat. He almost choked on his hatred. I stood there and watched you smuggle the gold into the crucible. St. Germain remained impassive. I believe that after that, it is unnecessary for us to continue this evening. He bowed slightly and Yadam opened the door. Casanova threw down the gold, flung on his cloak, and stormed down the stairs. We would hear him cursing on the way down. Lousy hypocrites, trying to cheat me, conceited charlatan. His face faded into the night. I turned back to St. Germain, who was opening the window to clear the dense, hostile odors with the cool autumn air. Edom had already left. I quietly extinguished the candles until only one was left burning. Then I went to the window and thanked the Count for the mystery he had showed me. Paris, 1780 It felt strange to return to the city after so many years. I could feel and almost touch the progress of its disease, the loosening of its fibers as decomposition became imminent. The lava that would erupt into the streets was being heated most vigorously by those who danced atop the volcano, the majority of the nobility, for this was the era in which Versailles and the Trianon were virtually two hostile fortresses with the weak-willed king swaying between them like a limp bell clapper. Yet despite the lampooning poems and scurrilous slanders, the people in general would have been willing to make their peace with Marie Antoinette. In spite of the inflammation of their chronic dissatisfaction, they were still spellbound by the magic of the throne. It was Versailles, deserted and mocked by the careless queen, that howled for vengeance. We got to Paris at the end of October. The Count did not go to court immediately, but remained at home in his own palace, it was tucked away behind the St. Roche Church and set in its own large park. There was a small building in front that camouflaged it nicely. What you could see through the trees looked gray and insignificant. The same duality was found in the house. It was a true reflection of St. Germain himself. If one entered through the main gate, he went through a tropical greenhouse filled with exotic vines and flowers and decorated by artificial lotus pools. Then he came to the splendid halls within. The walls were covered in brocade and damask, and the upholstery curtains, Venetian mirrors, porcelain fireplaces, carpets, chandeliers, tapestries, and artworks overshadowed Versailles itself. But on the second floor, where St. Germain really lived, there was no such luxury. His bedroom was like a monk's cell. There was an enthralling painting of Christ over his narrow iron bed. He had painted it himself with those colors that glowed in the dark. The only other ornament was an ivory statue of Buddha that was fully half a meter high and had a green gem in the middle of its forehead. It stood on an ebony pedestal set in a small niche, and a lotus-shaped sanctuary lamp burned in front of it. There were two rooms off this cubicle. One was a well-equipped bathroom and dressing chamber. The other was a small, almost empty room whose windows were covered by a heavy curtain. A rush mat was on the floor, and the walls were hung with large-colored prints of twenty-two hieroglyphs. The only furniture was a long, narrow table, which held a large sky globe and two seven-branched candelabra. Both star map and hieroglyphs glowed in the dark, as did the portrait of Christ. The laboratory and the library opened from this meditation room. I occupied a section similar to the Count's, and we shared the laboratory and library. My cell wall was decorated with a cross. As I came to know St. Germain, all my doubts and suspicions vanished and I admired and trusted him absolutely. Every day we got up at dawn, 
bathed and put on long dark robes like monks' cowls. When we each went to our meditation rooms to perform meditation exercises, in addition to animating hieroglyphs, I also worked on my telepathic ability. At a predetermined time after our basic exercises, St. Germain would send me a telepathic message from the other wing of the palace, geometrical symbols, letters, and finally whole sentences I had to write down verbatim. During this exercise, I wore an Egyptian headband with a gold serpent in the middle. After these exercises, we would stroll in the park for an hour, then breakfast on porridge and fresh fruits. Generally, we spent the morning working together in the laboratory. After lunch, I read and made notes while St. Germain worked on his principal book, La Tres Saint Trinosophy, the Most Holy Trinosophy. This book is a work of unparalleled significance. It is really the diary of a soul's coming of age and may be seen merely as a description of St. Germain's own initiation and progress in the mystical brotherhood. The purpose of the book is to teach disciples who already know the terminology. The text begins with all the allegorical details of the ceremonies of the classic age and symbolic language is used throughout. Thus, the work seems incomprehensible on initial reading, but deeper analysis will show the hidden significance of each detail. The book is written in 12 parts, and each has a sketch that supplies the explanation of it. The first parts deal with the so-called Memphis ceremony of the Neo-Egyptian tradition, and the tests applied to the aspirant are related to the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Its basic pattern is the powerful one of the 12 houses of the zodiac. The zodiac is the great cycle of the soul, and it was by watching the sun's orbit across its signs that the ancient priesthood developed the idea of the sacred cycle. They believed the first sign was the beginning, and the last was the end of all human wisdom. St. Germain constructed this book of the three-layered wisdom in alchemical symbols for the most part. What he was really describing, of course, was not the real chemical knowledge, since he, like all other great alchemists, regarded gold-making as only a very small part of knowledge. He was writing about the spiritual process of man toward adepthood. During the afternoon, I would take care of the mail and then walk for two or three hours. I roamed the streets of Paris freely, but felt no desire to return to the scenes of my memories. Still, I remembered my mother's parting injunction and decided not to avoid them. I would settle the matter, thumb through my old theses, and see if there was indeed a gap in my knowledge. First, I went to the little shop on Rue Saint-Honoré. It didn't seem to have changed at all. There were the religious relics crowded on the rough wood shelf by the cellar door, just as though they had been in the Petre's time. There was a musty odor about the place, which immediately conjured up the image of the ravaged, slovenly Rosalie. It was still a bookshop, just as before. The bell over the door sounded so familiar that my heart skipped a beat. There was a small, ugly girl squatting in the moth-eaten silence. Her hollow face lit up as she jumped up to serve me. Can I help you, monsieur? I watched her light the candle lost in my memories. The girl, mistaking my silence for hesitancy, hastened to reassure me. My father's out for the day, but I can get you anything you wish. Absolutely anything, monsieur. I was sure from her voice that she was offering some of the secret literature so much in demand those days. Anything? I prodded. She nodded, disappeared behind a tattered curtain, and returned with a little yellow pamphlet. The latest, she whispered. I leaned toward the candle and opened the pamphlet. Chacun se demande tout bas. Le roi pentil ne pentil pas la triste reine en despere. It was a satirical poem against the queen. As I continued to read, the girl became agitated. Please, monsieur. Someone might come in. To quiet her, I put the dangerous merchandise in my pocket, paid and bade her farewell. Then I hurried to get home through the darkening streets. Voices rumbled out of the darkness, laughs, snatches of curses, and the sound of running feet filled the air around me. Somewhere someone was mockingly reciting the banned poem I had just bought, extracting the maximum laughter from the erotic details. That evening at supper, I showed the booklet to St. Germain and told him how I had acquired it and later heard it recited in the Paris streets. This is another poison that has overflowed from the palace into the sewers. The Count remarked as he leafed through it. Fools! Don't they realize these attacks on the throne are deliberately undermining the only system that supports their own privileges? 
they're paying these poets to write their own death warrants. I shuddered at his ominous words. I too felt this premonition ever since we had come to Paris. They say terrible things about the queen. You know her. Is she really as bad as all that? She's no better and no worse than the others. She just doesn't pretend. She isn't really evil, just extravagant. A curious, hedonistic, and superficial woman with all the amiable characteristics of a self-assured child, but this child doesn't realize she's playing with explosives. Maybe you could warn her, I ventured. I haven't even tried words bore her if they're not the most transparent rococo lace. Her soul has all the depth of the ornamental pool at the Trianon. Fate always chooses the best tool to fulfill itself. It will take searing events to change Marie Antoinette and burn the dross from her, but you'll soon meet her for yourself, Cornelius. Really? How's that? Oh, she'll need me, he replied evasively. The Bloody Crystal I decided to make a pilgrimage to my old home. All that stood on the site was a small shack. The garden was overgrown with weeds, and only the stumps of the fence were left. What in the world had happened? I wondered. Time hadn't done all that in just a few decades. As I approached, an old beggar crawled out of the shack and studied me suspiciously. I decided to ask him to explain the mystery. There was a brick palace here some years ago, I began. Maybe there was, he replied tersely. Who owns this property now? Now he became positively hostile. It's not for sale. Belongs to the city. With that, he crawled back into his hovel. Curious. I started making inquiries at nearby houses and shops. Finally, an old woman told me the house had burned down in 1750. A fire had started in a locked room, and they couldn't find the key in time. A fitting fate for a house whose occupants had been destroyed by inner fires. The Marquis de Anjou's palace, where the lambs had met, was still unchanged. It had changed owners during the time of the spendthrift Carina. She had been the sole heir of the D'Anjou fortune, for her sickly brother Christian had died young, but palace jewels and all had disappeared under the ministrations of Germain and Martin Allais. The palace became the property of the Polignac family in 1780, and a distant member of the clan now occupied it. St. Germain's name would have gotten me in, of course, but I had no desire to revisit those pompous old rooms. The only person I felt any nostalgia for was the kindly Dr. Pollock. Maria Theresa, Empress of Austria and mother of the French Queen, died without seeing the birth of a Dauphine, an event for which she had longed. She had hoped that production of an heir would solidify her daughter's position and bring her emotional maturity. Now Marie Antoinette was completely alone, the Empress's ambassador Mercy no longer had any influence with her now that his mistress was dead. The death of her mother terrified the thoughtless Marie Antoinette. Marie Theresa had scolded her like a naughty child, but she had cared for her even though it was from a distance. Now the Queen felt she had lost her only rear guard, the only person she could count on to support her against the world and even against herself. She found herself surrounded by selfish, frivolous friends a weak and indifferent husband, in a world that watched her with suspicion. She was overcome with anxiety, and her only true friend, the little Lambelle, could only weep with her. Her other confidant, the Countess Polignac, was ill and could not come to court. Dark premonitions tormented her. One evening in early December, I returned from my evening walk to find our lower halls brilliantly lit. Deducing that we had company of high rank, I circled the house and went up to my room the back way. Here, Yadam was waiting for me with a message. I was to don full evening dress in honor of our exalted guest, the Queen of France. I was both curious and self-conscious as I made my way into the salon. I found two young women in deep mourning, the Princess de Lambelle and the troubled Marie Antoinette, whose eyes were red with weeping. The Queen received my introduction formally, almost absent-mindedly, and impatiently told Saint Germain to begin his experiment. The Count led his guests into the ornate study we never used for that purpose. A crystal ball stood on the desk, glittering in the light of the multitudinous candles. Obeying St. Germain's mute command, I extinguished all save the ones at either end of his desk. 
After seeing the women in comfortable chairs, he sat down before the ball. I lit the censer, and soon a soothing, comforting fragrance filled the room. Princess de Lambelle uneasily moved closer to the queen and glanced fearfully at the count, who was absorbed in the crystal ball. Soon, she was also mesmerized by the sparkling crystal. During this hypnotic silence, I stealthily watched this woman, who was the most envied and hated person in all of France. Marie Antoinette stared motionlessly in front of her, a mask of sorrow. Her regular, delicate features could not compete with the childlike beauty of her companion, but a certain vibrant restlessness made her the more striking. Even now, she exuded willful, haughty impatience, and those sensitive, sensuous lips revealed great potential for rash words, irrevocable insults, and irretrievable silences. The curve of her nostrils mirrored her insatiable demand for new and different entertainments and her total disregard for everyone else in the world. There was no depth to those clear, flashing eyes. She looked to the external world for her light. Just now her sorrow had unleashed forgotten perceptions from the death chamber of dormant abilities where both her past and her futures awaited her. Having deciphered this hieroglyph, I turned my attention to the ball. It was already clouded, coming to life. A whitish mist swirled with darker patches in the midst of it, just like the mute, crowded jostling of astral matter. Slowly, the delicate face of the little lamb bow emerged through the murk, but it was the face of a dead woman. The mist about her began to grow blood red, and parts of her naked body floated to the surface as if spewed up by an ocean of blood. The flesh of those begrimed limbs was decayed and corpse-like. I was aroused by a scream. The Princess de Lambeau was screaming wildly, her cries interspersed with gasps of horror. She pressed her hands to her eyes and gabbled hysterically, Sweet Jesus, help me. Let me get away. I can't bear it. I won't look anymore. Lead us not into temptation. It's too horrible. The queen quickly knelt before her, stroking and comforting her. St. Germain mixed a tranquilizer in a glass of wine and forced it between her trembling lips. Finally, she became somewhat calmer but refused to tell the queen what it was that had frightened her. It was nothing to do with your majesty, just me. I'd kill myself here and now if you commanded it, but I can't tell you what I saw in that crystal. Please don't be angry. Don't ask me to do it. I can't even bear to think about it. It's too horrible. Her lips began to tremble again and she broke into quiet sobs. The queen, pitying her, did not ask any further, but turned to St. Germain. Well... Can't you say something consoling? She spoke with reproach of a spoiled child. The near future is like a sunset, your majesty. It shows a dark night coming upon us. But if you are satisfied with the light of a few years... Well, what is it? Marie Antoinette's voice snapped with fear and tension. One year from today, the Dauphin will be born. A small sigh arose from the queen's lips, and the joyous smile of the mother spread over her face. The Dauphine, my lord and God, if it only were true. It is already a fact, your majesty. This part of the future awaits us like a refuge. Let's say in Varennes. We have only to travel there on the carriage of time. The queen positively glowed at the thought. You don't know. You can't possibly know how much that would mean to me. How many of my problems it would solve. It will solve many problems, your majesty but it won't silence those you expect it to. They will become even louder for the birth of the Dauphine will thwart many plans. Then I couldn't care less about them. This careless comment epitomized the Queen's attitude up until the tragedy struck. What can they do to me if I produce a legitimate heir to the throne? I have a humble request of your majesty, St. Germain spoke quietly. But what, majesty? Marie Antoinette spoke jestingly, all attention and generosity. You know I can take care of my friends. If the heir is born, as I said, will you give some thought to some advice I add to my prophecy? Speak, Saint Germain. Tonight I will even listen to advice. Will you follow it if... If the crown prince is born? Well, maybe... Assuming you don't advise something contrary to my nature or something that would bore or humiliate me. Maybe I don't use the right word, Your Majesty. St. Germain's face was grave. This is not advice. It's a warning. 
It may well bore and humiliate your majesty in your present mood. What I ask is that you make a short trip to Versailles after the Dauphine is born. Build a bridge between yourself and the nobility and another between yourself and the people. This would resolve and rescue everything. I'll have to think about it, the queen replied, leaning back in her chair. First, let us see the prophecy fulfilled. Suddenly, she made a mischievous face. Have you ever met the king's sister, Count St. Germain? Or that old tombstone, Madame de Noailles? I can't even think about them without yawning or laughing. They just want to take out their aborted lives on me. I believe they would send me to the stake if they could take my youth and the few free moments I snatch by doing so. I wish I knew why they get so mad, because I want to breathe fresh air and enjoy myself like any other simple French woman. Unfortunately, Your Majesty was not born a simple French woman. You sit upon the French throne at a critical period. Your country is threatened by danger both within and without. Its throne must be a living, fighting symbol. It must fight the greatest battle in history for the trust and love of its people. Your Majesty must give birth not only to a Dauphine, but to a fuller idea of the kingdom, an idea that can survive the dangerous currents that have been building up since the time of the Sun King. St. Germain's voice took on a more urgent, persuasive note. Your Majesty is bold enough to take a stand against old prejudices, make war on the tradition of Versailles, and scorn the hate of the nobility, just to gain a little freedom and light-hearted pleasure. Won't you do the same thing just once for the good of the people? Try to understand and remedy their ills, acknowledge that they are in an untenable situation. Thus, you can make an alliance with them. No one on earth fights two enemies at once with any hope of success. You have to align yourself with one or the other to survive. You do not wish to ally yourself with the past. Make an alliance with the future. Let there be a bloodless revolution of long-awaited reforms. These things will eventually come to pass with or without your majesty. The queen listened to St. Germain's quiet voice with a growing discomfort, and gradually her face hardened into rigid rejection. I prefer not to understand what you have just told me, Count St. Germain. She said coldly, If I had chosen to understand it, I would have called it a threat rather than a warning. The kingdom, thank God, is still strong enough to put rebels in their proper place. It is the king's province to govern and handle the problems of the people. I never interfere in that area. His majesty certainly does everything he can. No outsider can judge a leader truly. And you are greatly mistaken if you believe my personal quarrels and the petty intrigues against me mean I am rebelling against our past traditions. I believe unreservedly in the God-given power of the king and in the ancient, unshakable superiority of the throne. After all, good times and bad come to everybody. The people become discontented from time to time and sing rude, satirical songs, but they always rally around the throne when crisis comes to the nation. I'm not afraid of my people, and I do not find it necessary to make alliances with them, for I am their queen. And the hostility among some of the nobility is just the bitterness of a neglected lover. They know that any revenge they might take would shake the throne and destroy themselves. No, the nobility can never endanger the queen. She spoke with proud stubbornness, drawn up to her full height, as though the armchair were her throne. Poor blind woman. He was both pitiful and majestic at that moment. Abruptly, she leaned back as though exhausted, you are mistaken, my lord. You are merely exaggerating trifles. I hope your prophecy is more accurate. Well, we'll soon know, your majesty, St. Germain responded equably. I have only a year to prove it. After the women had left, I told St. Germain the horror I had seen in the crystal. He nodded. The crystal was swimming in blood, Cornelius. It showed the future so clearly that even the frightened, childish Princess de Lamballe saw it. That's why she was so upset. Poor little princess, what an end. The Trianon 
The Dauphine was born in 1781, on the very date predicted by Saint Germain. Everywhere, there were jubilant festivities, and it seemed as though all the suspicion and misunderstanding between the queen and the people had evaporated. The nobility was silent for the moment, and glorifying odes replaced the slanderous poems addressed to the king's consort. She was the mother of the heir to the throne and was received enthusiastically everywhere. To her credit, Marie Antoinette did not forget Saint Germain in her victorious maternity. The Countess Polignac brought us her invitation to the Trianon in person. She was even pleased to mention my humble person. Since I had been present for the prophecy, I should also be present for the fulfillment. Thus we were invited to the Trianon, that small Rococo palace that stubbornly isolated itself from the world. There'll be just a few of the Queen's close friends there, the Countess told us, just a few gay and entertaining people among whom the Queen desires to rest from the fatigues of her obligations. Marie Antoinette worshipped this Countess Polignac and followed her smooth and tactful guidance blindly. Unfortunately, the Countess was wed to her own family interest and was neither astute nor sympathetic enough to guide the reckless, sentimental Queen properly. If she had only realized the danger of that tiny fairy tale palace that opposed Versailles and alienated Paris, she might have changed the Queen's fate when the blow did fall. But it was more important to her and her family that no one else have any influence upon Marie Antoinette, and they virtually isolated her in a vacuum. The Queen left her little citadel only to go to the seething, scandalized Versailles to get more money for the Polignacs or else for the Trianon itself. It consumed vast amounts of money. Physically, the Countess was more beautiful even than the Princess de Lamballe. Her loveliness and grace misled the Queen and everyone else who could be deceived by skillful acting. Really, the delicate, fragile figure with the narrow Madonna face and wide, innocent eyes were signs of a personality that needed constant attention and protection. Her untreating, tinkling voice could both flatter and evade, and there was incredible tenacity hidden in that graceful, transparent figure. She could instantly recognize both possible advantages and possible dangers, and her tongue was a light, lethal weapon to execute opponents. It was entirely a different woman that I met that evening amid the pastel tapestries, musically curved furniture, and petal-like porcelains. A thousand candles sparkled, and multiplied in the mirrors, and she came tripping over the soft carpet like a reflection of their grace. There was no sign of the sorrowful, anxious person I had met the year before. Marie Antoinette was the very personification of Rococo, a lovely, gracious pink goddess who stretched out slender fingers to acknowledge our homage with generous gratitude. Come, my lord, I want to announce your marvelous wisdom and ability to the world. She took his arm and led him toward her gay, curious guests. There was an inimitable rhythm in her walk that evening. She seemed almost to float, totally unaffected, fresh and vibrant. An atmosphere of joy and victory surrounded her, and even this second birth had not affected her figure. Her waist was still waspy over her blue brocade, crinoline, and her naked powdered arms and neck sparkled with jewels, as did her towering wig. The guests were young, handsome, and richly dressed. There was only one withered and overpainted belle dame among them, the spirited and wickedly witty Countess de Amar. I understood later that she was accepted by this youthful elite. She was their court jester, a distorting glass who mirrored their carnival antics. But how hard she worked to maintain that position, what an effort it cost her to camouflage her age and looks under a barrage of ribald stories. They expected her to entertain them, and she bent all her talent and energy to do so. Now the whole group crowded around St. Germain, asking for prophecies, beauty preparations, and the elixir. They asked childish questions and said stupid, frequently insulting things. He bore it all with equanimity and provided an answer for everybody. Finally, the queen rescued him from this embarrassing situation. She came up with the Princess de Lamballe and the Countess Polignac and asked him to go into another room and give her some private medical advice. Now my habit of being inconspicuous became useful. I simply withdrew into a small, ill-lit salon and watched the chattering groups through the open door. The Countess de Adamar soon dominated the conversation, announcing that she had some exclusive inside information about Count Saint-Germain. 
It seemed the Countess had been at a gathering during which the elderly Countess de Gurgi had suddenly come face to face with the famous Magus. The old woman had stepped back in amazement. I met you in Venice, she told him, fifty years ago when my husband was an ambassador. You look just like you do now, except now you look younger. The Count had bowed deeply. You honor me by your recognition, Countess. But you called yourself the Marquis Belletti then. St. Germain smiled. The Countess de Gurgi's memory is as good as it was fifty years ago. Well, I certainly wouldn't forget the man whose medications are responsible for both my memory and my health. I am happy to renew my acquaintance with one of the strangest men in the world, no matter what he calls himself. I hope the Marquis Belletti did not have a bad reputation. On the contrary, the Countess responded eagerly. St. Germain took her arm and escorted her to their hostess. As they left, he murmured over his shoulder to the Countess de Ademar, In that case, I gladly acknowledge my grandfather. This incident came to the ears of the Marquis de Pompadour, and her curiosity was so great that she tacked St. Germain directly. The Countess de Ademar heard all about their subsequent conversation from Madame de Husset, the Marquis' lady-in-waiting. It was known that St. Germain enjoyed the confidential friendship of both the king and the Marquis and could enter their suites freely at any time. He was very tactful about using this privilege and never came at the wrong moment. When he came, he was always expected and wanted. Thus, it was after his meeting with the Countess de Gergy. The Marquis de Pompadour was excitedly telling her lady-in-waiting about the incident when suddenly St. Germain appeared before them. They had not seen him come in, and Pompadour was truly frightened. This is witchcraft, she burst out. How did you get here, just as we are talking about you? It was natural enough, madame. You called, and I came. But I hadn't sent for you. I haven't even got out of my chair. But you were thinking about me and wanting to ask me some questions. Am I not right? Yes, it's true enough. Then I am entirely at your service. The Marquis just shook her head helplessly. What am I to do with you? When I try to pin you down about something, you manage to evade me and say only what you want to. I suppose I must stifle my curiosity and put up with your mysterious ways. Sometimes I think you just enjoy being mysterious and are intentionally obscure, but at other times I am completely under your spell. I would swear you have supernatural powers, yet the only thing I am sure of is that your friendship and advice are indispensable. You have been sincere with me, madame. I will be sincere with you. Did you really meet the Countess de Gurgi in Venice fifty years ago? Yes. But that would mean you're over a hundred years old. Is that so impossible, madame? I should say so. You can't be more than forty. I cannot make you a liar, Marquis. The Countess de Gurgi, though I respect her greatly, obviously must have talked nonsense. You are evading again, but this time I'll pin you down. I have no reason to doubt the Countess' story, however fantastic it may be. She also told me you gave her an elixir that made her look no older than twenty-four for several years. That's possible. Well, did you or did you not give it to her? I gave it to her, but the Countess has exaggerated its effects. It merely healed her indigestion and helped certain natural substances in her system. This restored her beauty. Why can't you give the king a remedy like that? The king doesn't need it. How can you say that? You know that some days he is dizzy and suffers tormenting headaches. Why could not he too be made fresh and young? I have already given the king advice on that matter. And? He won't follow it. You are such a charming creature, madame, and the young ladies you so generously bring the king are so irresistible. You mean to say he abuses his strength? You know it as well as I do. You know also that neither one of us can stop him. If you did not supply him, you would go to others. That's true, the Pompadour replied sadly. St. Germain had touched her deeply. Her face became thoughtful, and it was obvious she was thinking of something that troubled her greatly. She tried to conceal the tremor in her voice as she continued. If I dared ask, but I will ask you, Count St. Germain, how long can I keep the king? And if I lose him, God forbid, what will happen to me then? No, don't answer. I don't have the courage to face it. It tortures me more and more as time goes on. 
She glanced uncertainly at St. Germain, whose face was gentle as he returned her gaze. Madame du Hausset said he seemed to be looking at the beautiful pompadour with pity. Do not be frightened, madame. I will not alarm you. Your star is still in the ascent, but stars, you know, are like people. They die and are reborn. Even the finest child is born under the sentence of death, and those who die in one place are reborn elsewhere. It is like the evening when we sleep to wake in the realm of dreams. One chapter of life closes, and even more important one begins. Change is a law, madame, but it is also a law that no change extinguishes life. This was the story the Countess de Ademar had gotten from Madame du Husset. Now the queen returned with Saint Germain and her two friends. She was smiling and laughter bubbled beneath her voice. The curious countess threw out an open gambit. It seems the wonderful count has brought your majesty some good news. Marie Antoinette seated herself among her guests. Perhaps. Is it a secret? The countess persisted. No. The queen's silvery laughter flooded the room. He says I'll have two more children. Two more children and inner stability as well. I can believe two children, the Countess de Adamar responded dryly. Oh, stop laughing. The queen made a mischievous face at her. I can grow up as well as anybody else. May we beg your majesty not to, the Countess Polignac intervened. Come, Count Saint Germain. Can't you give the queen an elixir that would make her an irresistible child forever? St. Germain shook his head with a smile. I'm sorry, Countess. God has ordained that children should grow up, and I can't work against him. What a shame, the Countess Polignac responded. Adults are so boring. Then perhaps you ladies do not know the tale of the Isle of Children. St. Germain glanced around the eager group. They had not heard the tale and clamored for him to tell it. Many, many thousands of years ago, he began, there were two emerald islands in the Mediterranean Sea. These islands were really the peaks of two mountains, which had once been the landmarks of a sunken world empire. Millions had fled the terrible cataclysm, but only a few managed to reach the mountaintops that became the Happy Isles. Then, the storm was over, and the angry vault of heaven was again a brilliant blue. The survivors organized themselves one on one of the twin islands. Using the memories of their advanced culture, they built permanent homes, cultivated the soil, tamed wild animals for domestic purposes, and followed all the useful scientific pursuits. They recreated their culture's laws of peaceful coexistence, which were based on ancient revelations and established a society that would be of benefit to their children. But the children, in the meantime, while the adults labored, had roved unsupervised among the rocks and had become used to the irresponsible freedom. They would plunder birds' nests and drink the raw eggs or kill small game with stones and share their prey. All this made them muscular and rough-skinned, and they became boastful and competitive because of their physical strength. They thought it was fun to fight and believe they could get anything they wanted by beating someone else. Their emotions were unbridled. They had no patience. When the adults had completed their labors and believed it time for their children to take over, they called in these children to teach them their new duties and the law. Great was the sorrow of these wise and gentle people when they saw the feral herd that appeared before them. They became painfully aware of the fact that while they had labored, their children had been left to become wild. Their bodies were strong enough, but they were mentally lazy and their emotions were like unchecked weeds. The adults tried to enlighten the coarse minds and to teach self-control and consideration for others, but it was in vain. Their youngsters abhorred their efforts, and in the stupid arrogance of their physical power revolted against the leadership of the elders. They went off to the other island to establish their own free child empire. The first thing they did was to build droll houses of branches whose roofs were decorated by flowers. These funny green tents were quite gray in the sun, but soon it was noticed that some were larger and more beautiful than others. These had been built by children who were physically weak but clever mentally than the others. The strong ones who excelled in fighting had not been able to produce anything but shapeless, ugly lean-tos for their hands, and minds were clumsy and unskilled. Immediately the strong forced the weak to leave their beautiful dwelling so they could have them. When they saw that the weak were easily intimidated, they became drunk with power. They compelled the weak to do all the drudgery while they occupied themselves with hunting, fishing, and dancing around the fire. 
In addition, they took all the best food and allowed the weaker children only scraps. Meanwhile, the weak children, made weaker yet by hunger, hard labor, and abuse, became embittered. Their suffering and oppression produced growing enlightenment. The strong children, on the other hand, became fat and lazy from their intemperate eating. It did not take them very long to gather all the food they needed, so they spent most of the day eating, sleeping, and abusing their slaves. Nor did the violence stop there. The fat tyrants began to quarrel among themselves with increasing frequency. The slaves witnessed their daily outbursts and the way they abused each other over trifles. They watched their raging fights in which their masters bit and tore one another like wild beasts. They saw the defeated grovel in helpless rage, and the slaves began to think. Were the strong ones really as invulnerable as they had thought? After all, they died off steadily. Their bodies had grown fat and soft from a luxurious living, and their reflexes were no longer swift. They slept until high noon while fish teemed in the lakes, wild fruits hung ripe from the trees, and grain blown over from the other islands made luscious wheat fields ripe for harvesting. The climate was so mild and beneficent that food in abundance could be gotten free. But the fat tyrants had become too lazy even to reach up and pick the fruit above their heads. The slaves had to do all this for them while they sprawled in the shade, and they ate their fill before giving those slaves meager scraps. Why? Because they had made a mutual agreement. After all, the tyrants in power weren't even physically superior anymore. The slaves had more agile and tenacious, for they had to build the fires, fish hunt, and tan hides. They then knew, too, how to bear trouble and suffering, and they were in the majority. And at first only a few thought like this, and they kept their magnificent, terrifying thoughts to themselves. Then some decided to change the rules. When they made a catch, they ate what they wanted first, and then gave the scraps to their masters. The tyrants immediately responded by executing the rebels in front of the stony eyes of their comrades to deter them from committing similar improprieties. They tortured them to death in all the ways their inexhaustible ingenuity could invent. Some were flayed alive and had salt rubbed on their raw flesh. Some were cut to pieces as slowly as possible. Others were flogged to death or crushed beneath large rocks. Still, others were immersed in water filled with leeches. Not surprisingly, every such example multiplied the number of sinners. Soon, there were intrepid bands instead of lone rebels. The machinery of execution came to be used almost every day. It stank of rotting blood. Meanwhile, the weather had become oppressively hot, and the air was filled with the tension that precedes a rainstorm. The fat tyrants were preparing a new festival of execution. They had managed to drive crowds of escaped slaves out of the caves and expected to get the rest later. The noise of rats they heard with increasing frequency... The crude signs on the cave walls and the red flowers that were put on their houses every morning didn't bother them. The heat increased their impatience and restlessness. They were eager to work out their own tensions on the bodies of the tortured slaves. But the slaves were also awaiting the festival. They knew they were in the majority. The magic word had been spoken, like the sinister tolling of the death bell. Now they spoke other words as well. They talked about the diminished strength of their masters and their own newfound strength. They talked about the injustices they had suffered, nor did they forget to repeat the slanderous accusations their masters had shouted at each other in their rages, nor to tell the staggering secret they had learned during these fights. Their masters had bodies as vulnerable as their own, and blood just as red. The adults had continued their meditative life on the other island, learned what was happening on the Isle of the Children, and they were deeply saddened. They held a council and decided to send emissaries to both sides in an effort to keep the tension below the breaking point. But the emissaries could do no good. Emotions had flared too high. The tyrants were unwilling to give up their lives of luxury. They buried their heads in the sand like ostriches and pretended nothing was wrong. As for the embittered and starving slaves, they had become obsessed with choking hatred for their masters. They were already a force ready to strike. All that was needed was a moment of ignition. Realizing the situation, the emissaries returned hastily to their own island before the Holocaust and reported to the council that their mission was hopeless. The group was overcome with compassion and sorrow, but their leader, who was the oldest and wisest adult, remained calm. Why are you so upset because the law of nature is also the law on the Isle of Children? He asked them. The forces must be balanced everywhere. No weight can be carried properly unless it is distributed properly. 
If it is not by the law of reaction, it crushes the one who pushes it too far. How can these children learn this? From words? Words don't mean anything to them. They are symbols of reality. The children must experience the reality themselves before it means anything to them. Our emissaries have not really been ineffective. Their warning will lie dormant until after the flood of passionate events fulfills it. Then, when the passions abate, it will come to life and have living consequences. You know that flesh and blood, that they may be butchered, are not identical to life. Then the peace of understanding came to the members of the council. They returned to their work and meditation and awaited the calm that would follow the storm. Now only a few candles cracked in the salon at the Trianon. As St. Germain's voice died away, silence reigned unbroken. His hearers sat quietly, overwhelmed by their feelings. The bird of gaiety had flown. Queen's lips were pressed tightly together and her face was pale as she stared at the floor. Even the ever-watchful eyes of the Countess Polignac were turned inward, where troubled presentments swirled in her thoughts. The Princess de Lamballe seemed completely withdrawn, her hands clasped as though desperately praying. The ugly, bird-like face of the Countess de Ademar seemed suddenly old and tired. Two servants came in and put fresh candles in the chandeliers. This broke the spell. "'What happened on the other island?' the Countess de Ademar asked hoarsely. On the Isle of the Children, St. Germain turned and looked at her gravely. It happened just as the adults had foreseen. The festival was turned into a bloodbath. The slaves massacred their masters, and when they had killed all of them, they turned on the slaves who had been faithful to their masters, and then on those who had been indifferent to the struggle, and finally on those who had not been sufficiently brutal in their murdering. The lovely island became a slaughterhouse in which no one could be sure that his turn would not come next. St. Germain's voice was soft, but his audience was spellbound. No one thought of gathering food or carrying on the normal tasks of life. Everyone was celebrating the victory that had turned into a holocaust. Starvation was general now, and epidemics began to break out. On top of all this, a tropical storm washed away their crude houses, which had sheltered their dark lust for murder. Shivering and sick, they finally had to face their true situation. "'And they must have remembered the adults,' murmured the Countess de Ademar. "'Not yet, madame. "'That was still far in the future. "'The time I speak of was just a lull, not a resolution. "'There was much more strife yet to come, "'for the children did not yet understand the law of balance. "'There was always one individual or a small group "'who pushed the burden onto others "'before it came back to crush them.' "'That was a horrid story,' the queen broke in angrily. "'If I had known what it was about, I wouldn't have let you tell it. "'How could you do this to me?' her voice choked with resentment. "'I was so happy this evening.' "'It was only a story,' St. Germain responded. "'Did your majesty imagine there was some other meaning to it?' "'I can readily imagine what you meant by telling it.' "'The queen stared coldly at him. I know very well, and all I can say of the matter is that it is only a stupid, brutal nursery tale. She rose and turned her back on St. Germain. The ladies lingered a little while longer, but the queen did not speak further to the count. She soon retired, pleading fatigue. Two letters. Two days later, St. Germain got a letter from the Countess de Ademar. I still have this letter along with the Count's reply. The Countess was a witty, observant woman and a talented chronicler of her own time. Her letter ran like this. Dear Count St. Germain, Ever since that strange evening at the Trianon, which unfortunately ended in your disgrace, I have been filled with increasing uneasiness. I am an old woman. I have seen much and experienced much, and I think I can say I've lived my life with my eyes open. My perpetual interest in people and social connections has not persisted just to gain this superficial success, though that has had its part. It has been a secret passion. Despite my weakness, I am truthful with myself. This has been both a burden and a blessing, and I assure you my opinions on serious affairs are constant, even though I conceal them for opportunistic reasons." or out of cowardice. 
I am telling you this so you will know why I am writing. The grave truth in your nursery tale disturbed me greatly, for you verbalized problems of which I have been aware of for a long time. I truly love the queen and her carefree friends. Their youth is both electrifying and charming, and their cultured beauty fills me with nostalgia. Alas, I am still vain in my old age, and still love my pleasures." Nevertheless, I am not blind to the fatal mistake that happy artificial empire is making by neglecting the convulsive questions of our time. I know well enough the stubborn faults of that old-fashioned circle at Versailles and the weakness of our poor king in a time that demands bold, courageous action. As for myself, I confessed that I adore this graceful, elegant, decayed old world. I am a part of it. I was born to it. I was young among its traps and pleasures, and I am thankful that I grew old with it and won't have to live to watch it fall. But I pity these young people. My heart is heavy when I think of the future awaiting these carefree infants who play as though they lived in the dawn of an era rather than a bloody sunset. I feel helpless and grieve like those adult council members in your story. I keep trying to think, what can I do? It would be so terrible for all this beautifully sculptured charm to suffer this brutal consequence of the sins of people now moldering in tombs. Marie Antoinette's crime is one of omission only, and the king himself is a harmless, well-meaning man, although I know well how dangerous it is for the government to be in such a weak hand during this critical time. I am confused and in despair. Perhaps you can tell me what I can do and what I must do. I can already feel the approaching catastrophe in my bones. Please help me, your sincere admirer, Countess de Aremar. St. Germain's reply, preserved among the Countess' papers, ran thus. My dear lady, your worries are the same as my own. My transparent little allegory was intended to reveal rather than conceal the dangers into which the royal couple, the nobility, and the old regime itself have drifted. Truly, the time will come when thoughtless France, which once could have protected herself, will be in a state like the hell Dante envisioned. The scepter, the censer, the scales, the spires, and coats of arms, even the white flag itself, will fall. I cannot only feel this future, Countess. I have already seen it. I am still enthralled by the horror of what I have seen. There were rivers of blood flowing from every city, a cacophony of human screeches and screams of pain as courage vanished. The word of the council meant death, and great God, who could answer such murderous judges? You do not know what it looks like when the axe falls, but who will listen to the cry veto today? I knew when I told the queen that parable I risked expulsion from the Trianon. I would have risked even more. Nor was this the first time I have tried to avert disaster, but eyes are blind and ears are deaf. Dear lady, for the time must be fulfilled. You and I can do nothing more but be at peace within yourself. The storm will not reach you. You will escape, but I fear. That is all I can offer in the way of consolation. Yours, St. Germain. After this exchange of letters, the Countess asked St. Germain to meet her yet again. This last most significant meeting took place in the Recollets Church during the evening Mass. St. Germain supplied me with the details of their dialogue at my request. The Countess was both agitated and crushed, she begged St. Germain to try to reason with the Queen once more. A meeting could be arranged, she told him. The Princess de Lambeau, who was also troubled, would see to that. The Count refused, telling her it was already too late for warnings. What do you mean? The Countess de Ademar asked fearfully. Do you know of some conspiracy? No, madame. The Queen has simply missed the moment when she could have changed her fate. She should have acted immediately after the Dauphine was born, when the people's faith was reignited, and they reached out in trust and longing once more. Instead, she turned her back on them and went back to the Trianon. Even the maturity gained by her multiple motherhood won't help her. They won't trust her anymore. She has sown the wind and will reap the whirlwind. Even now the forces have moved to pronounce judgment on her. And their sentence? The old woman stared at him fearfully death. The Countess reeled, and St. Germain had to support her. It's horrible, she whispered. I wish I could deny what you say, laugh at you, but I can't. It's just as you say. 
I can see it. But what do they want of her? What will be the charges against her? The charges, madame. Every playful, innocent pastime will be turned against her. Every lampoon and slander will be treated as a serious charge. And what do they want? The utter ruin of the Bourbons. The royal family will be driven off every throne they occupy. Within a hundred years, the survivors will return to France as simple citizens. France itself will be shaken and tormented by all manner of governments, kingdoms, republics, and empires. Noble tyrants will be replaced by ambitious and unworthy ones. The Countess de Admar buried her face in her old hands and prayed for a long time. Then she stared up at St. Germain with tears rolling down her cheeks. If you knew how much I love life, and yet I'm happy you have said I'll die before the eruption, she whispered. He would have demurred, but she waved him down. I know well enough what the last part of your letter meant. How much longer will you remain in Paris? Perhaps a year. I see. The emissaries returned hastily to their island before the Holocaust. St. Germain was silent. Cagliostro's Double I was glad when St. Germain told me that we would only be in Paris another year. It was not that I wanted to leave St. Germain. On the contrary, I was thankful for every second I could spend with him. He had taught me a great deal and led me into important experiences. It was Paris, this restless, unhealthy city that was alien to me. The city reminded me irresistibly of a man whose fatal illness had temporarily regressed. St. Germain avoided both Versailles and the Trianon, but he received many visits from the nobility. He was also visited by artists, scientists, simple citizens, and even dubious and bizarre charlatans. One of the latter was Giuseppe Balsamo, who frequently impersonated the Count Cagliostro. Like every cheat, Balsamo was a skeptic. He hoped to find in St. Germain a less skillful but fortunate colleague. The Count was willing to receive him and even asked him to bring along his wife, who was his medium. And thus I met Martin Allais. The smooth old scoundrel in a new body was more polished and dangerous than ever. His dark experiences, though he did not remember them, were concentrated like a hypnotic powers of a snake on every weakness that becomes his prey. Physically he had changed surprisingly little, although his features were sharper and more refined. His hard, oily black eyes were overlaid with thick, tangled brows, and his lips were again thick and bluish, though firmer than before. His fingers were now longer and narrower. Altogether, he was more articulate, the voice was softer, the speech more soothing and dazzling. In his desire to impress people, he had managed to acquire for himself a tall figure, but even now it was beginning to fill out with the sensuous corpulence of Martin Allais. An evil aura streamed from him, repulsive and attacking. I realized with a shock that his wife and medium was Jean Gerard, now superficially young and beautiful. Her name was now Lorenza Feliciani, and she vaguely resembled the shining, irresistible Corina. How that confused, greedy creature must have longed for Corina's marvelous and destructive beauty. How she must have admired and envied to burn the idea into her soul so that she could carry it with her even through the maelstrom of rebirth. Alas, the same thing had happened to her that happens to any chubby woman who wants a slender, noble figure. She managed to put one on, but it looked completely different on her. There was no lustful, enthralling power of the dark Eros in those slanted black eyes, just a lurking cunning. Her forehead receded and her shining hair was coarse and stiff. The mouth was a little too large, the nose a little too stubby, and she was already becoming thick and stocky. Undoubtedly, she was a beautiful woman, though perhaps more desirable to a low and sensuous appetite, a more refined taste would have been repelled by her obvious vulgarity. Now she was Balsamo's victim, whom he had shaped into a blind instrument. One can imagine how. This was the man who had broken and chained Karina's demonic strength, 
and he turned this hysterical, obsessed woman with her dim, inchoate memories into pliant wax. The demons who had possessed her previously were gone, driven out by a more concentrated power. Balsamo frequently hypnotized Lorenza. He had this ability, though he didn't understand it fully, and he used and misused it whenever possible. Now the poor woman was possessed by an embodied demon rather than indecisive astral ones. Balsamo exuded great strength and uninhibited will. He practiced black magic, although he didn't believe in it. It was strange that Italian-born Lorenza Jean and the Sicilian Balsamo should have drifted back to the scenes of their former lives. They were instinctively attracted, as though they had left something undone there. Of course, they called the phenomenon another name and entertained firm, if dubious, plans for their stay. These would have to be tried out in more virgin territory to succeed, yet they were drawn back to the magic center of Paris again and again. St. Germain received the couple in the workroom on the ground floor. Their self-assured skill as they entered was admirable. You could almost see the many thresholds they had crossed, prepared for anything. Balsamo had the adaptive ability of a hunting and hunted animal, and he had imparted it to Lorenza. Now they promptly adapted themselves to the splendor and refined elegance of their surroundings, but they couldn't fathom St. Germain. His real being was incomprehensible to them. Thus the tone of the encounter was elegant, and the gestures deliberately languid. Balsamo began by fulsomely flattering the amused St. Germain. Encouraged by her host's smile, Lorenza, after a graceful wave of her black lace handkerchief, admired his sapphire ring. He promptly took it off so she could look at it. You shame me, madame. Certainly Monsieur Balsamo must make better stones to enhance his wife's beauty than my own humble work. For a second, Lorenza stared at him stupidly. Isn't it real? Why shouldn't it be? A jeweler offered me a fortune after appraising it. Madame pretends not to know what I'm talking about, but you're among friends here. After all, who can tell transmuted gold from natural gold? Nobody. There's no difference. Isn't that so, Monsieur Bosomo? The man narrowed his eyes like someone reacting to a quick blow, then addressed himself to Lorenza. You don't have to pretend here, my dear. His lordship the Count knows all about it. He turned to St. Germain. My wife is an ecstatic partner in my enterprises, rather than a conscious one. I understand perfectly. If Madame desires it, you may keep this ring that has aroused your fancy as a memento of our little visit. Lorenza looked at Balsamo, eager yet hesitant. You cannot insult his lordship, the Count, by refusing. He said rather too quickly. You honor me. The woman trembled with excitement as she put the ring on her finger. She was so moved by so fine a gift that she could not hide her feelings. Balsamo noticed that I was watching her and promptly glared at the unfortunate woman. It was a terrible flash that froze her completely, her eyes dimmed, and she put her other hand over the one where the ring sparkled. Meanwhile, the two men continued exchanging mutual courtesies. Balsamo was feeling his way cautiously, adroitly, offering his various gambits, but now he was dealing with someone who saw clearly with the third eye. St. Germain, while appearing perfectly straightforward, answered his overtures evasively. The result was that sometimes Balsamo was sure he was addressing an overconfident cavalier whose belief in his own shrewdness was a veritable treasure trove. Then suddenly he would sense the hidden scorn and frightening intelligence in his host's eyes. Occasionally, his fine criminal instinct sensed danger and he would retreat, but his greed was greater than his caution and he continued to play. Finally, St. Germain asked him to demonstrate the experiments he did with Lorenza. Balsamo obviously wanted to avoid this without flatly refusing. I myself would be happy to oblige you, Count St. Germain, he said politely, but the matter is not entirely in my hands. Lorenza is not always in the proper state for such demonstrations, and I believe that she is a little indisposed today. He turned to her expectantly awaiting for her to confirm her wishes, but she was staring at the ring and did not notice him. He favored her with his piercing glance, but even this did not rouse her. When he spoke to her, she did not start like a little terrified child, as she usually did. Yes, her voice was calm, her eyes distant. I was just saying that you are not in a proper state for me to perform any experiment today. 
Balsamo's voice was subtly threatening. Remember, you have a bad headache last night. You're wrong, Giuseppe. Her soft voice was mechanical. I feel perfectly all right. She lifted her hand and stared at the sparkling ring, oblivious of all else. Then she continued in a rather dozed tone. This blue stone has such an interesting thread. Look at it, Giuseppe. But how could the Count give it to me when it is a part of himself? I believe Madame's condition is ideal for an experiment, St. Germain remarked. Perhaps we could start now, Monsieur Balsamo. Balsamo got up reluctantly and stood fidgeting. If you need help, Cornelius, is at your service? St. Germain leaned back in his chair as though awaiting an experience of interest. I can manage, Balsamo said roughly. He advanced to his wife. Lorenza, he spoke commandingly. Look at me, Lorenza. The woman did not respond. She sat spellbound by the glistening stone, which almost seemed to live. Suddenly her expression became one of wonder, then of fear and unspeakable horror. She jerked upright and clasped her hands convulsively to her body, raising her head as though she were suffocating. Help me. The blue snake is strangling me. Order it back into the ring quickly. Balsamo leaned over Lorenza, yanked the ring from her convulsed finger, and threw it into St. Germain's lap. So there is your ring. Now wake her up this instant. He was hoarse with rage. I will awaken her soon, Monsieur Balsamo. St. Germain spoke calmly without moving. I admit, I have borrowed your superb instrument temporarily. Lorenzo Feliciani is truly an excellent medium. What do you want of her? Balsamo thrust forward, a face distorted with anger. Calm down, my friend. She is in less danger now than she is during one of your experiments. Soon she will awake up and be livelier and prettier than ever. I just want you to hear something from her, something you should take to heart. Lorenza, meanwhile, sat erect and motionless, an expression of horror still on her face. St. Germain got up and stood in front of her. Involuntarily, Balsamo stepped back. Do you hear me, madame? St. Germain's voice was gentle. Yes, she answered mechanically. Who am I? The friend and comrade of Count Cagliostro in the secret brotherhood. Balsamo's face drained of all color. And... Who is Giuseppe Balsamo? The woman pressed her lips tight, shut her eyes. Not willing to reply, Balsamo leaned toward her, his lips forming urgent demands for silence. Then St. Germain spoke again, and what a voice he had, quiet but firm as a diamond. You must answer me, madame. You are not afraid now, and you will not remember anything I do not wish. You are unfettered now completely free and calm. Lorenzo's face cleared magically. This is intolerable, Count. Balsamo rushed to his wife and tried to lift her, but she could not move. She seemed to be anchored to the chair. Balsamo's red with his exertion, but in his rage he tried again. He grabbed her arms and pulled until St. Germain was moved to intervene. If you keep on, you'll injure your medium. Sit down, Balsamo, and be quiet. Believe me, there is nothing else you can do. The Count spoke again to Lorenza. You heard my question, madame. Who is Giuseppe Balsamo? Now she replied smoothly in a mechanical sing-song. He is the Count Cagliostro's shadow, forever one step behind him. Should the Count turn around, he disappears. The two are of the same name and sign, the sign of Gemini. They were born of a month and look alike. They are even of the same blood, but their souls are as different as daylight and dark. The shadow crawls upon the ground and dances on the walls, weightless, with no life of its own. It is merely a phantom, a slave of light. Giuseppe Balsamo cheats others, but he cheats himself worst of all. He does not know that a stolen name can become a tunic of Nessus to a usurper that is a dark fate as well as a bright shield. The fate of a shadow is always dark. Now Balsamo enjoys the riches of Cagliostro's palace. Therefore, Cagliostro's earthly karma will be fulfilled on him rather than on the Count who has stepped aside. Cagliostro has liberated himself from his past actions. The bloodhounds of karma have run on below him. But there on the ground is the shadow, a prisoner of that name. Cagliostro, Balsamo. One is above mortal consequences, unreachable. But the other here below is the target of those consequences, Balsamo Cagliostro. 
or Balsamo. Thank you, madame. St. Germain leaned over her and gently placed the palm of his hand on her forehead. Lorenza opened her eyes and gazed about wonderingly, then she looked timidly over at the agitated Balsamo. Did you put me to sleep, Giuseppe? I didn't even notice it. Balsamo did not answer. It took all of his willpower to cover his confusion, but soon his uninhibited cynicism triumphed, and he looked over at St. Germain with scornful superiority. He didn't have to be so theatrical, my dear Count, but telling me, you know about my little business? After all, I'm of the same craft myself, and it's hard to dazzle me. I use poses, certainly, but I hate them and shed them gladly when I don't need them. We have the same philosophy, you and I. A painter is paid for his pictures, a musician for his music, a writer for his lies. Why not pay the swindler who gives better and happier illusions than any of them? People really want to be cheated. They're too credulous and stupid to face the fact that the ideas of good and evil, God and the devil, are simply lies invented by a clever clique of swindlers to serve their own interests and console morons. The lies are always unveiled for the initiate who is strong and brave enough to face them. Why should we fight each other? You don't really expect me to believe you produced all this enormous wealth from your alchemist crucible. I have a false bottom crucible myself and a very cunning stirring spoon. We both change stupidity into gold, my dear Count. You might as well come on down from Mount Olympus and tell me what you meant by that little charade. St. Germain leaned back cheerfully in his chair. You have a remarkable philosophy, my dear Balsamo, and I won't deny I find it amusing. Balsamo smiled a victorious and self-satisfied smile and winked at St. Germain. I thought we could come to an understanding. You have your territory and I have mine. The name Cagliostro, I have reason for using it, that I'm not going to tell you or anybody else. I may have a better right to it than you think. At any rate, it is a name with a proven value, and I like it. It suits me, and believe me, I worked harder for it and deserve it more than the man who legitimately owns it. I put a good deal of my own work and energy into it, and it's worth a substantial amount of money to me. Why do you want to take it away? I don't, Bolsamo, and the Count himself doesn't particularly care either. I'm just advising you not to use the name. Get rid of it before it's too late for your own sake. Now don't play Dondonian Oracle with me. I know you're used to using that pose, but I want a straight answer. Why do you advise me to stop using the name if it, it doesn't matter to you or Cagliostro? I'm simply warning you. You expose yourself to danger by doing this. If you live as Cagliostro, you may also have to die as Cagliostro. Balsamo threw himself back in his chair and laughed. I thought the Count St. Germain was a better student of human nature than that. I quit wearing swaddling clothes a long time ago. Living itself is dangerous, and I was fully aware of the hazards when I chose this route. I also knew that only fools die when they get into difficulties. There is no prison that doesn't have at least one crack if you only know the magic spell. And I know it. I've gotten out of hell itself with my incantations. I don't really care whether they bury me as Balsamo or Cagliostro so long as I live to a ripe old age. I cannot withhold the facts. St. Germain continued unperturbed. Your continued use of the name Cagliostro means death by torture in the prison of the Inquisition in Rome. It will be quite impossible for you to die of old age. Why do you keep up this ominous blather? Balsamo broke in angrily. Do you really think that you can scare me? Why don't you come on out and admit you don't want me to use Cagliostro's name? Then I could give you a straight answer, that I will never stop using it under any circumstance. I've already told you it doesn't matter to me, St. Germain explained patiently. I'm not asking you to do it or threatening you if you don't. I'm just giving advice that you can accept or reject, to be exact. I'm informing you of the risk you are running using Cagliostro's name. If you continue to do it, it's your responsibility, not mine. Nor will the Count Cagliostro, in whose stead you will have to die a horrible death, be responsible. Soon you won't be able to free yourself of his name by any means. There will be no one to prove you are two different people. The two will become one in suffering danger and death. Cagliostro and I will both be far away when you are dead. He will be rid of his dangerous name forever. 
Oh, this is absurd. Balsamo interrupted angrily, but St. Germain silenced him. Wait, I haven't finished yet. I'm going to interpret Madame Lorenz's trance. Cagliostro's name is in the path of forces which cannot reach him any more, for he has risen above them. You, however, cannot dodge these dark forces if you lock yourself into Cagliostro's name. I don't know what you're trying to do, Count, but I know what you've done. Balsamo burst out. You've confirmed me in the use of the name I've yearned for, hated, and fought again for years. Now I find it more desirable and exciting than ever. In fact, it is essential I will cling to it as I do my life. Even if it means death by torture, I don't believe that fairy tale. Answer me, Balsamo. Don't be so melodramatic. You make me laugh. Laugh all you like, but answer me. All right, I will. Yes, even if it means death by torture, assuming I'm stupid enough to be caught. We heard a strange whimpering behind us and turned to look at Lorenza, whose presence we had all forgotten. Tears were pouring down her face, and she seemed to look at some horrid scene far beyond us. You have said it, Giuseppe. The woman was trembling. You have said what he wanted. The circle has been closed and the judgment pronounced. No knife can free you. No word can absolve you. The judgment is final. Be quiet, you stupid hen! Balsamo spat. Lorenza came to with a convulsive jerk and started sobbing hysterically. Stop that, her husband snapped. You know I won't tolerate bowling. Be patient with me, she gasped. I, I, I can't stop. Moved. With compassion, I spoke involuntarily. Please calm down, madame. I'm sure Monsieur Balsamo will stop using Cagliostro's name if you ask him. I will not, Balsamo retorted. The name is mine. I have more right to it than the effeminate bastard who had it thrown in his lap by chance. Of course, he won't stop using it, Cornelius. St. Germain said calmly, Balsamo cannot discard the name now. It is already grafted to him, whether he likes it or not, and he must wear it until he dies. The finality of those words seemed to fill the whole room. Even the skeptical charlatan was shaken. What do you mean, whether I like it or not? Balsamo asked. The name has come to life and will follow you for the rest of your days, ruling and shaping your destiny. If you stop using it, you will be addressed by it. If you deny it, People will swear that it is your identity. If you throw it away, it will return like a boomerang. If you drive it away, it will slink back like a dog. It is tenacious, merciless executioner, a magic robe that clings to your flesh. Let's go, Lorenza, Balsamo said hoarsely. Recovering his poise, he added ruefully, I am bored with his lordship, the Count's pompous theatrics, I am disappointed with the results of this meeting, St. Germain. I am not, Balsamo. The Count spoke with friendly courtesy as he escorted his guest to the door. Anna Mueller We started back to Castle in the spring of 1784, I was relieved when we passed the French border. It was like getting out of an overheated room. As for St. Germain, he was quiet and introspective. I didn't like to disturb him with questions, though I really wanted to know how long he was going to stay in Castle. He had been so good to me that I hated to be separated from him, and not even the thought of reunion with my parents compensated for the loss. I dwelt hopefully on the idea that we were only going back to Castle on a visit and might then go somewhere else as his mission called him. He didn't talk about the near future, and I had been trained to curb my curiosity. Nevertheless, a link had been formed between us when I learned to obey his unspoken commands, and it transmitted my inner turmoil. He answered my questions without my having to put them into words. Don't be uneasy about the future, Cornelius, he said. You are at the beginning of a productive period, and I will remain for a few months to prepare you for the examinations that you, like all mortals, must face alone. When we had crossed into castle, we ran into a violent storm. 
High winds drove huge masses of water upon us. The carriage was impervious, but we turned into the nearest village inn to spare the servants and horses. Then the storm ended as quickly as it had begun, and the bright sun swept a green and pink landscape sparkling as with diamonds. Even the puddles glistened on the ground, bright with the petals that had been blown into them. As we were leaving, a maidservant came up balancing buckets of rainwater on a pole over her shoulder. Her skirt was pinned up over pillar-like legs, muddy to the knees, and her wet, matted hair hung straight down her back. She was obviously pregnant. She looked at me with dull eyes, murmured a greeting, and went on to the squalid servant's quarters next to the pigsties. I watched her sluggish, stout figure as she stooped to enter the low wooden door. Brown water and rotting straw seeped out from under the styes, and I could see the black noses of the snuffling hogs. The very fowls in the yard looked wet and filthy. For some reason, I couldn't leave this miserable scene. Then the maidservant came back out with a feeding bowl. She glanced at me, then stopped to look more closely. She took a few uncertain steps toward me and asked if I wanted anything. No, thank you, I replied. I don't need anything. But then I asked her name. Anna Mula, she responded, startled. Her peasant accent was very apparent. I pushed some money into her hand and joined St. Germain in the carriage. Was it she? He asked quietly when we were underway. I nodded. Karina. Strangely, I had recognized her more quickly than in the deceptive body in which I had known her. That had been an artificial costume made by demons. Now she was unveiled, massive and ugly in her strong primitive instincts that she satisfied like an animal. She belonged in this world of evil smelling barns, pig pens and chicken coops. Her station as a drudge befitted her spiritual development. The dainty beauty and complex perversions had all been sloughed off in the peasant womb her drifting soul had found. All that was not a real part of her was gone. She was no longer a demonic genius. Now Karina was herself an ignorant and immature beggar at the beginning of her journey. I was still mulling over this illuminating meeting when I returned home to the quiet and permanent castle of Grote. My parents did not meet me at the door. Rightly, they waited upstairs. Our relationship was not one which required emotional outbursts. I met them again in my father's dim study. Tall, slender figures wearing identical smiles, and again I felt the inner warmth of deep peace and gratitude that had kindled within me the spark of the burned-out alchemist's furnace. The Coffin My father had advanced to the highest grade of the order during my absence, and I also had progressed appreciably during the nearly four years I had spent with St. Germain. I had passed the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades and begun the studies for Adeptus Exemptus. I was now familiar with the various magics and Kabbalahs and practiced many exercises of Indian and Tibetan yoga. I also learned the mystery of the secret sutras at a time when these spiritual treasures were still undiscovered by the white race. In November of 1784, we were invited to Rotenburg at a different time from our usual monthly meeting. At this time, we hadn't seen St. Germain for a week, and our last conversation, a deep and intimate one, had left me with a strong premonition. Under his guidance, I had made out a long work program that would last me for years to come. I had sensed a farewell in his manner, and something which forbade me to question. My emotional reaction could not bind him who was already free, and such feelings were also unworthy of the student. For us, change, separation, and distance were just illusions of the matter-bound personality which still suffers from such things. No matter where he went, St. Germain was still my master and the head of my order. Carl von Hess was one of the pillars of our order, not only because of his immense interest in the occult, but also because of his mental abilities and high ethics. He was one of the most cultured men of his age and astute enough not to scheme for political power and glory. Living modestly and contentedly, he was thankful that his desire for a secluded and introspective life accorded with the wishes of the ruling prince. Thus, he would raise his son, Victor Amadeus, born in 1779 as he wished, not as a member of an elite striving for earthly power, but as a humble novitiate 
of the Spirit. When our carriage turned into the stone court of Rotenburg that fall afternoon, I was surprised to see a black flag fluttering at the entrance. When I noticed the flag on the tower was flying at half-mast, and the servants who came to meet us in mourning, discomfited, I had turned to question a servant when I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. He motioned me to silence, his face curiously peaceful. We walked up the long stairway under tall mirrors, swarthed in black. The very bouquet in the oriental vases were draped with black veils. Passing the huge, silent library, we went into the hall of the order. In the center of the hall stood a coffin covered with a funeral pall on which a single exquisite gold rose glittered in the light of four surrounding candles. The coffin stood on a platform reached by seven stairs. Only seven candles burned in the room beside those by the catafalque. These were placed in wall brackets under seven frescoes, which St. Germain had painted in his deep living colors. They seemed to glow with light from some hidden source. The scarlets looked like burgundy by firelight, and the greens were like the tender buds in May. The first fresco showed a padlocked gate, which an angel was trying to open. Its golden caption ran, Signature ne Perdature. The second showed a lovely green island emerging from the sea in the clear light of sunrise and was inscribed Aurora ab lacrimis. On the third were the twelve signs of the zodiac, with the sun passing through Virgo. This one was captioned Lam Micius Arde. The fourth showed lions, eagles, and bats warming themselves in the sun and was captioned Non possen ibus ofort. The fifth was two stringed instruments, one of which was being plucked by a delicate ethereal hand. Its inscription was Unam Tetigis Se Sat Est. The sixth showed Noah's dove bearing its olive branch over an immense expanse of sky and water. Its caption ran Emerger Munchat Orbem. In the triumphant seventh fresco, a bird flew out of a nest, and the inscription was Ad Sidera Sursum. Three people stood behind the catafalque. Saint Germain, wearing a long white shroud, stood in the middle with Carl von Hess on one side and someone I had never met on the other. Yet the third man looked familiar. He was tall and powerful, brown as an Indian, and had serious eyes under his domed forehead. His thin lips were set in an expression of resignation, since he looked amazingly like Giuseppe Bosalmo. I realized that this could only be the Count Cagliostro. The two men had been born under the same sign, Gemini. There were quite a few centuries of development between them. Cagliostro's purified, utopian being was a future state for the ignorant Balsamo, who was racked by passions and still languished in the Tower of the Dark Forces. Obviously, there was a blood relationship between them. This was indicated not only by their common birthplace and physical resemblance, but by the way their earthly fates were entwined. I later found out that Balsamo was a natural child of Cagliostro's uncle and a Sicilian peasant girl. This debauched nobleman had spawned numerous children among the peasant huts, and he cared about them quite as much as a tomcat would. Thus, Balsamo could hope for no name or help from his father and had to bear his embittered secret within the very shadow of the walls of his paternal castle. He managed to fight his way out of his peasant environment, but it was easy to see how his rebellious, envious hate became the driving force in that passionate personality and why he used Cagliostro's name. Giuseppe Balsamo had hated and longed for that name which he felt to be his by right, and yet had caused him so many humiliations it had made him an outcast, neither peasant nor nobleman. Now I understood his mingled pride and shame when he discussed his imposture with St. Germain. But now the tall, bearded Karl von Hess stood looking solemn and serious, and St. Germain wore the contemplative hierophant face the world has never known. My father pulled aside the curtains of an alcove on the ground floor, where there were an organ and some chairs. We went in and sat down. The curtains on the tiers of alcoves around the hall rustled, and I could feel the presence of other people. St. Germain mounted the seven steps and stood at the head of the coffin, his radiant face illuminated by the faint gold light. My friends and associates in the Brotherhood, that quiet, 
even voice filled the great hall. I have completed my mission and received the call. Now the world must hear the news of my death. I have already set our great work in motion, and the waters have begun to spring from the secret wells. Guard the source of this water and keep it pure. I have appointed a successor to be visible head of our order, but my death does not mean I shall leave the unfortunate land of the West. Certain events must take place first. You will hear news of me from time to time, and I will send you a last greeting before my final departure. I will also visit personally some to whom I have something to say. But before I turn to depart on my new road, I leave you these cardinal precepts, the eleven rules of the order, the six duties of the order, and the sixteen secret signs of the order. These thirty-three formula are the very foundation of our order. The Eleven Rules Love God above all else. Use your time to develop your soul. Be completely unselfish. Be sober, humble, active, and silent. Learn the origins of the metals in you. Beware of the charlatans and liars. Constantly revere the highest good. Learn the theory before you try to practice. Practice charity towards all beings. Read the ancient books of wisdom. Strive to understand their secret meaning. The Six Duties Heal the sick and relieve the suffering without thought of reward. Conform to the customs of the country in which you live. Meet with your fellow members in a preset place once a year. Select your own successor. Remember the letters RC, symbols of the brotherhood. Keep the existence of our order secret for 100 years. The Sixteen Secret Signs A member of the order is patient. He is compassionate. He is incapable of envy. He is not a braggart. He is not proud. He is not debauched. He is not greedy. He is not easily roused to anger. He thinks no evil of others. He loves righteousness. He loves truth. He knows how to remain silent. He believes what he has learned. His hope does not fail. He does not falter during suffering. He will always be a member of the Brotherhood. There was a great silence as he finished, while the candles cried their slow tears of wax. I could hear the soft footfalls as Von Hess and Cagliostro lifted the coffin cover to reveal the snowy lace interior. St. Germain lay down in the coffin and clasped his hands over his chest. His eyes remained open, but already he smiled the serene, undecipherable smile of the dead. Cagliostro pulled the face cloth over him and the two men replaced the lid and nailed it shut. The hammering sounded disquieting violent in the icy stillness of the hall. Suddenly dark-clothed figures appeared and lifted the coffin to their shoulders. Go with them, Cornelius, my father whispered. Take a candle and follow. He himself sat down at the organ whose deep consonances flowed over us like the silvery light of the moon. They spoke not of mourning, but of resurrection, and the secret joy of recognition. I became aware of more people joining the procession. I could hear the solemn shuffle of many feet. I did not look back to see faces, but I felt a powerful current of affinity. We went through a long corridor to the chapel, with the organs pealing following us like a distant benediction. Presently, it stopped, but as the crypt was opened, it burst forth anew from the chapel balcony, this was a composition my father had written especially for this occasion. He never played it again. Now the coffin was laid in its deep stone bed, and the procession silently left the crypt. St. Germain lay alone in his coffin. The iron sheath door rolled noiselessly back into place, and Carl von Hess refastened it with the elaborate seal in which the letters R.C. glowed. We went back to the huge darkened hall, and the mute figures disappeared through the draperies one by one. My father was already waiting in our alcove, and we went out the side door together. Three messengers were riding ahead of our carriage with a written announcement. The Count St. Germain, the magus and greatest wizard of all Europe, friend of emperors, poets, and scientists, died at Rotenburg in the province of Kassel and was buried at the castle of Karl Emanuel von Hesse on September 7th, 1784. It was a Russian chronicler, who reported St. Germain's first appearance after his death. He reported that sometime during the winter of 1785-86, to 86, the Count had had an important discussion with the Tsarina. 
The second report came from Count Chalons, who had just returned from his assignment as ambassador to Venice. He told his friends how he had seen St. Germain on the Piazza San Marco the evening before he left. St. Germain had seemed youthful and alert, and had laughed over the news of his own death. He who is buried many times lives forever, he said, smiling. Then he proceeded to tell Count Chalons the most intimate news about his family and distant relatives. His information surprised the ambassador greatly. To tell you the truth, I didn't believe him, Count Chalons related, and I thought he was being unspeakably vain to use such means to get in effect. But when I got home, I found out he was telling the truth, even though changes had taken place that no outsider could readily have learned. Of course, the most interesting thing was that none of the family had talked to St. Germain or even seen him in years. The third appearance was in 1789, five years after his death, to the Countess de Ademar, who related the incident in her memoirs, though she only told a little about their conversation. It occurred again in the Recollets church during the morning mass. Suddenly, she saw St. Germain's dark-clothed figure beside her. He gave her a friendly nod. His presence was so natural and serene, the Countess wrote. But I was not the least bit frightened. It was just like continuing a conversation that had been interrupted the moment before. He spoke, and I answered like a sleepwalker, though I was more intensely aware of my surroundings than I have ever been. Then the news of your death was false, I said joyfully. I should have known. To the world, the news is true, madame, he replied gently. But those who do not believe in death know that all such news is basically erroneous. I can't thank you enough for the hope you've given me as an old woman heading for the grave. Thank God I can see you again. You know my faith is as weak as my character, and I pray to destructive doubts. I am afraid to die, and long for certainty. But I always kill the most soothing arguments with the poison of doubt. I dread the thoughts of annihilation in the cold, frozen darkness, my Elements are heat, light, and emotion. My body is a disobedient wreck, but my soul is alive with curiosity and energy. You will live many times, madame, he responded, simply because you wish to live. Your soul is a vigorous young tree. The state of your body is only in autumn. Who can say the tree is dead? When the winter comes, many new springs will bring its buds and flowers, and many summers will bring it thick foliage and fruit. I wished our conversation could have lasted forever, the countess related. After mass, I asked him to see me to my coach. He took my arm to support me, for my legs were weak and arthritic. Once we got outside, I noticed how young and healthy he looked. His arm was like steel beneath mine, and he walked with a springy step. When he saw how I clung to him, he got into the coach and drove home with me. We drove slowly and I even told the coachman to make a detour just so I could talk to him a little longer. There were so many things to talk about. I told him how all his predictions about the queens were proving horribly true. Marie Antoinette stands alone with an icy cordon of enemies, even though she has matured a great deal since the birth of her four children. I told him that she could really be a good mother and queen if time would only allow it. She sees her danger and is trying desperately to make amends, but... No one will believe her. Then we discussed other matters, strange things that exalted me and strengthened my faith, but I promised St. Germain I would write nothing of these. It was with regret but renewed soul that I bade farewell to this brilliant man whom all believed dead. To me, everyone else was dead and lifeless in comparison. St. Germain appeared again to the Princess de Lamballe as she was being torn to pieces. He also stood beside... Jean Dubarry at her execution, a noble reserved figure amidst the screaming mob. These details come from Grossly, who also tells how St. Germain disappeared from prison. During the terror, he wrote, the police arrested a foreigner who was always present at the executions and showed a marked sympathy for the victims. St. Germain, for it was he, went with them without resistance. He found a great many friends and acquaintances among the captive nobles and strengthened them by his calm and tranquility. When he was speaking, grossly related, the horror of death vanished from their faces like snow under the spring sun. His name was on the list to be executed, and he even lined up with the others. 
but he was not there when they got on the tumbrel. The guards didn't notice his disappearance until they were making their tallies at the end of the day, when they all ran around shouting, but the whole day he had stood by the guillotine. The chronicler added, a tall, calm figure amidst the raging mob, his face was the last thing seen by the condemned, and his smile lingered on theirs, a smile of serenity on bloody, severed heads. The Kiel Corps in 1793, Carl von Hess entrusted me the education of his son, Victor Amadeus. The boy was amiable and brilliant, had just turned 14, but there was an old spirit in that young body. He was keenly interested in the occult and followed every path of learning thirstily. His knowledge was like the counterweighted lid of a treasure box. It sprang open at the first touch. It was as though I were merely reminding him of blurred memories there was no trace of self-interest left in the boy. His ascetic life cost him neither strain, repression, nor self-deception. He was simply indifferent to the temptations of the flesh. Working with Victor Amadeus was a beautiful and easy task. He not only walked obediently, he flew without effort, and his soaring intuition often left me behind. Soon, I realized he was to be the great missionary of the future and began preparing him for this mission. I was also gradually taking over the correspondence of the Order, a very important activity in such a far-flung organization. I learned the secret roster of members and was soon in contact with virtually every country that could be reached by mail. My personal studies were also moving satisfactorily at this time. I was occupied with animating symbols. Both alchemists and oriental mystics use magic scripts to learn how to create certain symbolic beings. Thus, they understand and experience the process of creation. This mystery is a small repetition of the great creation. Unlike the blind process of procreation and conception, this is conscious immaculate conception, conception of the spirit. It is the conception of an idea that can, with the help of the spiritual principle and the will, create karma and concentrate matter about itself. The original mystics perform this not by projection or transmutation, but by creating thought forces. They use certain diagrams like painting of gods and demons as the basis of their work. This is the Tibetan Prima Materia, a diagram they called Ki Il Kor. Saint Germain had given me one of these figures to animate so I could recognize and conquer my forces in this field. Every color Form and spatial distribution within a keel core is important. This mystic creature sits or stands in the middle of a diagram made up of symbols expressing its individuality. The animation of the diagram corresponds to transmutation. It is the custom of the Tibetan mystics to give some sort of magic assignment to their animated keel core and to judge it by the way it is executed, whether and to what extent they have succeeded in conceiving the idea and implanting it if this operation is executed properly, the spirit or demon of the heel core becomes truly alive and performs assigned tasks without fail. My keel core was a life-size statue of a Tibetan sorcerer. St. Germain had sculpted it from clay and painted it. It was a startlingly lifelike statue of a Tibetan sitting in the lotus position. There was a strange, withdrawn smile on the thin lips under the high cheekbones and slanted dark eyes. My first task was to conquer the feeling of repulsion it aroused in me. The more I looked at the figure and concentrated on it, the more malicious its expression seemed. The eyes seemed to stare at me dully, evilly. Slowly, I became convinced that this sorcerer must have been a black magician in his native Tibet. The forces of destruction seemed concentrated in him. I didn't understand why my master had chosen him, but I could not decline the assignment. I eliminated my repulsion. It was thirteen months before that rigid clay first quivered with the breath of life, and another nine weeks before he was breathing regularly. There he sat on the rush mat opposite me, warmed by my radiated heat and pulsing with my force in his veins, but he was still mute and motionless. I will not dwell on the bizarre and startling details of this huge experiment. It required the total concentration of my forces and abilities and involved disheartening relapses. When the life force is put to such a deadly strain and concentrated on a single object, it keeps trying to slip away and mysterious short circuits happen. 
then, the lifeless matter which has begun to live in this mystic excitement of creation promptly dies. Nor will I give the details of the tiring but stimulating watch that must be kept on the life flame, for this can be understood only after long study and experiment. I will merely say that this experience is a milestone, one of the ultimate and more dangerous rituals. There are now a good many Tibetan works on Kilokor available in European languages for those who are interested. It was two years before Kilokor's eyes showed signs of awareness. It was three years before his body and limbs began to move. Now the way he held his head changed, and his eyes began to follow me as I walked about in the room. Observing this, I called to him and he got up and began to follow me with slow, unsteady steps. He would creep behind me throughout the castle, then follow me back into the meditation room and sit down automatically in his place. He grew stronger each day. Now it was time for him to learn his name, Lugyat Khan. This means eight serpents. I repeated it countless times in front of him. Lugyat Khan, Lama of the Red Sect, who dwells in Mithongat Ka, the invisible mountaintop. Lugyat Khan, his mouth had moved. He quiveringly tried to repeat the name, but no sound came from his throat. His mute lips began forming the name more and more, definitely, than a soft hissing sound erupted from him. Lugyat. Khan. It was a muffled whisper, now growing stronger and stronger, as it vibrated through the living vocal cords. The word was hoarse and unmodulated, but fully understandable. Again, and again I repeated, You are Lugyat Khan. You are Lugyat Khan. He would repeat automatically. Then one day he said what I had been waiting for. I am... I am Lugyat Khan. It was no imitation. It was his own thought from his own animated personality. I was elated with unspeakable jubilation. At last I had arrived at the peak of my creative powers and acquired the key of life that Isis, the great mother, holds in her left hand. I was mistaken. This was only half the task, for Saint Germain had had a reason for choosing that particular statue. Spring was approaching, and the whole world seemed filled with its swelling life force. The branches were still bare, but the bark shone with a renescent sap. Even the apparently dead hummus poured out disquieting fragrances that disturbed the sleep of young animals. By now, Kiel Kor was moving about without me and performing the chores I assigned. At night, he would sit in my room and guard me with watchful eyes while I slept. One unusually warm March night during the full moon, I was aroused suddenly by hearing my name called. Cornelius. It became louder. Cornelius. I sat up and saw the keel core standing beside my bed, looking at me strangely, knowing that the anxiety that came upon me was the most terrible danger of my practice. I did not allow it to overcome me. Calmly, I ordered him to leave, but he wouldn't. Cornelius, he began, leaning closer to me. Abruptly, his voice was raised in malevolent joy. Are you afraid, Cornelius? He raised his right hand, and I felt his reptilian touch on my chest above my open nightgown. The fingers groped upward convulsively, then found a grip on my throat. I didn't move or let my panic-stricken life instinct cause me to struggle or cry for help. Instead, I looked straight into his eyes, blocking the fear that rose up within me. I felt the pressure of the cold fingers and the pulsation of my bursting veins. The pounding of my heart seemed to fill the universe, but I looked him in the eye. Let me go free. He spoke practically in my face. I did not answer. He relaxed his grip slightly, and a subtly imploring note came into his voice. Let me go free, to go out into the moonlight garden, where the animals are wailing in the pain of lust, and the buds are bursting through the branches. Let me go out the gate and walk along the highways among the people with their warm colors and odors. Cut the umbilical cord and let me be a separate individual. I promise you will never hear of me again. Let me live, and you will also live. I did not answer. Slowly his grip relaxed until his hand slid off me. He straightened up and began cursing me in sorrowful mumble. Unlawful creator, be damned! He was walking away from the bed now, but his disturbing plaints continued. What kind of joy can I have? 
What kind of life? No heat can warm me. No light can comfort me. No one can vouch for me or liberate me. I don't even have anybody to pray for me. No one strengthens me or defends me against this tyrant. Who could break down this prison? Why was I aroused to be aborted alive? The wailing, yearning voice was beginning to sap my internal resolve. Aching pity began to seep through the dam I had erected against every disturbing feeling. I found myself pitying my own materialized thoughts that I had formed into a fictitious being who was now rebelling to have his own way. I knew the situation was absurd, and these temptations dangerous, but still I faltered. I genuinely felt sorry for this projected part of my ego. While doubt and remorse were surging through me, the keel core suddenly stopped and turned around. Again I saw the evil in his yearning face. Then the current of my warning force rushed into him, and a single leap brought him back to my bedside. Now, give me your whole being. Your veins are open, and blood is flowing. Blood, heat, and life all flowing into me. You will be drained, and I shall have the power. Power! He became incoherent, with intoxicated lust. Suddenly he grasped the heavy marble lamp from the bedside and wielded it over my head. I resigned myself and waited quietly for the inevitable. I was not afraid, but I felt no more pity for him. My emotional storm had ceased. The lamp fell with a thud to the pillow beside me, cutting my forehead slightly as it dropped from weak, hesitant fingers. My forces had returned to me with my inner balance. As the oil poured out on the bed, the keel core began staggering, fell to his knees, then fell on the floor. I got up and lit a candle, then turned him over and felt his heart. His heartbeat was very weak. I lifted him and put him on the bed. As I moved, a drop of blood fell from my wound onto his face. He started convulsively and opened his eyes. Thank you, he murmured, then his eyes closed again. As for me, I was totally exhausted from my terrible struggle. I had to sit down because my knees were shaking. Meanwhile, the phantom I had conjured up and for the time being defeated lay on my oil-soaked bed. Finally, I got up and went to the room beside the laboratory to rest on a rush mat. The mat across from the stand from which the keel core had descended. I rolled up in a few blankets and fell into a deep sleep. I was awakened at a dawn by a feeling that someone was watching me. Then I saw that the stand was no longer empty. Apparently, the keel core was back in his place, peacefully meditating. Here we go again, I thought wearily. Here we go again, and who knows how many times I'm going to have to endure it before it consumes me. Internally, I groaned for St. Germain the magus who had given me a test that seemed beyond my abilities. Then my eyes cleared, and I almost cried out. It was Edom who sat on the stand. Seeing I was awake, he arose and bowed to me, then handed me a letter. Then he left without speaking. The sight of the letter fired me with such hope that I didn't try to stop him. I thought I could see him before he left, but he left before I could see him. Now I tore open the letter. Kill him, Cornelius. The words flashed from the page. St. Germain hadn't bothered with a greeting. If you bring a demon to life without being able to kill him, you face a greater, more complex danger than death. The keel core you have created and named is a cameo of the dark powers. It has brought back a mummified black cult that existed beyond your memory, though you yourself nurtured it at one time. It is the guardian of the threshold at the gate of your personal sanctuary, and represents the most ancient bondage. You must dissolve that bondage. A keel core must always be killed, else he becomes a tyrant. There is profound meaning in this construction and destruction process, the divine truth that the world is your creation. It was you who brought it into existence. You must learn to break it down and dissolve it, or you will never be free of its control. A keel core must be killed, be it saint, messiah, or god. You have forced him into matter and woven a body of death and illusion around him. The world itself and all its darkness and demonic chaos is nothing but an unconsciously created keel core. The entities which created it lost their keys, and that is why they were defeated. Their keel core became stronger than they, and it tormented them. Their own lewdness and greed produced depraved images, and their uncontrolled imaginations built these things with the elixir of life. The demons began to live, became independent, and made their creators their slaves. For a keel core must be served not only until the decay of one's current body, but even after death. 
and through future incarnations. It is a Moloch of passion, and it is insatiable. Weakness and fear have created a keel core of fear, sickness, and death, a monster that sucks up the most precious creative forces and uses them against trapped human beings. If you learn the key to creating and destroying the keel core, you will have the key to your own liberation and victory over your world. Now I leave you to your own counsel. You are alone. You begun to travel a separate road. Alone you created, and alone you must return your creation to its original elements. The discipline is alone during every crisis and every solution. Be careful, strong and brave, and persevere in your efforts. Remember, you cannot turn back. You are in the middle of the sea of mysteries and must reach the shore. You may reach this shore in years, months, or centuries. It all depends on you. But beware of killing the keel core. This demon is even more terrible than he is invisible. To rid yourself of him, your dagger must pierce all three of his bodies. You must burn him with a fire that will consume him in all three worlds. If you can annihilate the keel core, you will receive more powerful forces than you have ever had during your earthly life. And these forces will serve you obediently. But if you fail, you will not see me for a long time. You can summon me only by solving your problem. Then I will come and initiate the Magister. Now I heard the shuffling steps approaching. I turned to the door, which was opening slowly. The keel core stumbled in like a sleepwalker, my dried blood still daubing his forehead. He sat down on the stand, breathing heavily. Occasionally, a shudder racked his frame. Give me some warm food. I'm cold, he mumbled. His misery filled me with a premature hope. I had forgotten that it was my strength and emotions that fed him. My warm joy was his sweet drink, and my hope was his medicine. His face turned a healthier color and his eyes opened. His breathing cleared and he sighed with pleasure. Ah, that's what I needed, that's good. The weeks that followed were both difficult and terrifying. Vainly I tried to block his ability to feed on my forces. I could not succeed. If I destroyed part of him with days of grueling effort... He would rebuild in a few hours by tapping my forces when I relaxed. If I began to hope he was getting weaker, the hope would strengthen him. If I felt discouraged by his renewed strength, he grew yet stronger. It was a Sisyphean task, and as the months passed, I reached the point where I no longer cared about any changes in his condition. Thus, for a long time, we were at an impasse. He lived and moved beside me like a mere image, and my concentrated efforts couldn't diminish his vital force. I was depressed by this tenacity, and thus had to fight a battle within and without. If I succumbed either to my creature or my own despair, I was lost. My health was beginning to suffer. The constant tension made me lose my appetite, and I lost weight. The outside world ceased to exist for me. The keel core became a hateful monomania. The land about me, the castle, the quiet figures of my parents, none were real except he. My parents, of course, knew about the dark waves that threatened to drown me, but they could do nothing. How many ways I tried to cut myself off from the keel core to keep him from draining me spiritually. Nothing worked. I would painfully restore my balance of indifference only to find it immediately threatened with upset. Irritation and anger pried at my defenses and I felt I could not hold them off much longer. What I feared most was that my murderous hate would overcome me and I would kill him. I wanted to stick a knife into that breathing, vigorous body even if it meant my own death. The insane desire pulsed through my emaciated body and shaken nerves. Finish him off. Squeeze out his life or beat him to death. I was close to emotional collapse. Naturally, this made him stronger and even more self-confident. I saw I would have to give up. I could not find the connection that linked us. The current flowed between us no matter what I did. I had to face the fact that I would lose. I was overcome with shame and misery when I thought of all the trials I had gone through and what my future would be, my parents in St. Germain would be so disappointed in me. I had failed the great trial, and now I would again suffer the dark, bitter fate of the fallen novice. The keel core had simply gotten the better of me, and he would fulfill his murderous passion and evil desire for autonomy. He would kill me so he could live, and I would lose my body, the fruitful environment of the castle, my parents, and my memory. I would have to start all over again, groping blindly in everything the keel core did in the meantime would be my responsibility, for I had conjured up and loosed a monster on the world. 
I'd given a form, name, and personality to a blind, inexperienced force complex, which now sought the crude experiences of life because I had not given him my intellect. All he had was a life-filled body and an elemental spirit, a demon whose avid will was bent on the emotions and passions. But if I killed him instead of waiting for him to kill me, the situation was even worse, for he would then possess me. This demon would force me to do his will, use my body for his debauchery, and drive me to death or madness. And I still would not be free of him. I was in the worst trap I had been in since my alliance with Homunculus. When I realized I was well and truly defeated, my anger vanished, I decided I could never raise a hand against my creature, regardless of my consequences. I would rather be the victim. Now I decided to end the tension of waiting. I would confront the inevitable. I did not bid my parents farewell, for I felt I had lost that right. I simply locked myself in the meditation room with the keel core. I sat down on the bulrush mat, not afraid, but simply very weary. There was the keel core sitting across from me. I could feel his burning glance, but I didn't look at him. I wasn't interested in him. I was looking inside myself. I knew there could be no help from anyone else. My inner space was filled with still gray water, dark and rejecting. It would take effort to penetrate it, and I could not, did not want to, make that effort. I didn't even struggle as sleepiness overcame me, and my inner landscape blurred into darkness. My awareness slipped imperceptibly into the dark waters like a corpse. A strange dream came to me in this deep sleep. I saw the meditation room, and its image reflected in a mirror. The room itself was dark, but its mirror image shone with clear light. I saw myself sitting wearily in the shadowed room. My head hung down in sleep, but the mirror image showed me bolt upright, shining with the ecstasy of meditation. The keel core sat on his stand in the dark room, positively glowing with health, and he watched me like a tiger, but the stand in the mirror image was quite empty and I was astonished. Now, the keel core in the dark room got up and approached the sleeper on the rush mat with curved fingers. I was frightened and would have shouted to wake the victim, but the meditator in the room turned and put his finger to his lips. But he'll kill me in his sleep, I wanted to shout this aloud, but I was in the grip of a helpless paralysis. The meditator shook his head, then pointed to the empty stand. He may not be there, I responded desperately, but he's certainly here. I saw the keel coarse fingers close on the neck of the sleeping figure and choke off his breath. Then I felt my own breath being choked off. How could someone who doesn't exist commit murder? My alter ego spoke sharply from the mirror image. Why do you keep saying he exists? You have made him a monomania. Don't you know it is your belief in him that makes him invincible? Your belief is his elixir. If you take it from him, he'll be nothing but lifeless matter. Take it away. Release and new light flowed through me and an immense gratitude. I could breathe freely now and stare up at the keel core who held my defenseless body in his merciless hands. How could a ridiculous statue strangle me? How could a nightmare persecute me and make me run? My thoughts swooped down upon him. You're nothing but smoke, fog, and cloud. My imagination alone has given you meaning and form. I've done enough shadow boxing with myself. Disperse, ye elemental parasites. I hereby take back unto myself the energy and force I had loosed and dissolved the bond between us. I now take back that part of myself which I had released. You have no existence of your own. Your breath is my breath. Your blood is my blood. You have no independent will. It is my will that works in you. I now withdraw these things from you. What are you now? Lifeless matter I borrowed and now return. Return to your stand and stiffen in the pose your creator commanded. The keel core dropped his limp hands and shuffled to his stand. When he sat down and faced me, I saw rage, terror, and desperation in his face. Gradually, his features froze into position, but first he gave a horrible yell of protest. The painful scream became more and more inarticulate, but it was an intolerable sound and jerked me awake. I was astounded to find that this horrible sound came from my own mouth. 
As soon as I recognized this, the noise ceased and my throat burned from the exertion. The keel core sat motionless in his original pose, and his painted colors were dimly visible in the dusky light. I got up and went over to touch him. I touched cold, hard matter. The paint had peeled off one place on his face, and the yellow clay underneath. It crumbled. And thus the master came to me again and gave me what I had earned, the total knowledge of things and processes. At last, I had achieved what I had sought for centuries, had killed for, suffered for, fought with demons, and died to attain. I became a magister and was accepted by the masters. I had reached the inner sanctuary, yet the person who was initiated had nothing in common with the greedy, confused, and temperamental Hans Bergner who stumbled after eternal life. True, the mystical process had begun in his soul. He was the lead that had been thrown into the crucible, heated by the fires of centuries and transformed by experiences and consequences into Cornelius von Grott, the Magister. Now, he had no more worldly desires, and now that he had acquired the power, he no longer wished to use it. But he had one more debt to pay, and it stood in front of him. Now the Magister stood before the last step. The next to last step, however, involves lengthy tasks which demand great patience and one can never ask when he will reach the end. He must first perform certain selfless duties that might take decades or more than a century. For the difference between a magister and a magus is that between an industrious talent and a genius. I spent my days quietly with my parents working hard. I performed exercises at dawn. In the early morning I worked in the laboratory. Then I worked with Victor Amadeus. This was more pleasure than effort. After that, I had lunch with my parents, then strolled in the park studying rocks, trees, plants, and insects. The late afternoon was spent working on the mail of the order, and the evening belonged to reading music in the company of my parents. In those days of crystal clear perfection, I blocked out the past and the future, for I knew this was just a passing rest to strengthen me for new events. I utilized my time thoroughly. We hardly noticed the turmoil of the French Revolution, which was then shaking the civilized world. Of course, we were aware of the various events, for we were in contact with many skillful and influential people who were doing everything they could for the victims. They could not, of course, interfere with individual or group karma. They were successful only where higher law permitted. The mirror reflects the past. In the spring of 1787, a lad of about 15 came to the castle asking for work. At that time of every year, hand was needed, and the homeless boy was hired to work the fields and chop wood. He was a large boned fellow with pimples and wary eyes that avoided everyone else. The protruding bone over his hooded eyes suggested he might be a cunning and sharp observer, but his sloping forehead revealed little capacity for higher reasoning. He spoke awkwardly through thick lips, though his strong jaw suggested a talent for speaking. The lad positively radiated a burning restlessness. His name was Ernst Mueller. Thus the illegitimate son of the maidservant Anna Mueller arrived at the castle of Grot to reopen old memories and bring me face to face with one of the greatest dilemmas of my life. Her fate held a mirror in front of me and did not even bother to tell a new story. Only the actors changed. Now a new figure took my old role while I stood in the magister's place. At first I didn't even notice the boy, but gradually I became aware that curious, eager eyes were following me when I walked in the garden and when I worked by the open windows in my study. Then I noticed the boy hoeing beside the gardener. Whenever I looked up, our eyes met but then he would lower his gaze quickly and continue his work. Once I walked over to him and asked him his name. He was so embarrassed, he blushed and perspired, but it was I who was shaken when I realized who he was and observed the expression of his eyes. They were filled with brooding hunger and fanatical intensity, and they showed me a familiar hell. Those were Hans Bergner's eyes. I was moved with compassion and irresistibly drawn to the lad, he had come then to reflect the past like a mirror. Had he come to Grot to return an old visit and collect a debt? 
I thought I had paid with the pain of blood of centuries. I could only consult my past, for the present was silent and the future would reply no more to me than to ordinary mortals. Yet I had presentiments at once repulsive and attractive. There were so many clear references in Ernst Mueller's life and personality. How could I misunderstand? I simply watched and waited. A few days later, I noticed that someone had been into my library. There was a book missing from one of the higher shelves. I had no doubt about the identity of the culprit. I had seen Ernst Mueller's eyes, and I remembered too much about Hans Bergner. I went out into the park to follow the thread that linked us. He was beside the barn, screened by a pile of dirty wheelbarrows, sitting on a tree stump. He bent intensely over his reading, his hands against his ears to block all the sound. I recognized the book immediately. It was The Triple Stones of the Secret Fires by Johann Glauber, an alchemist who had been born in Karlstadt. I touched his shoulder and he jerked up, confused and muzzy-eyed, as though he had been snatched from a heavy sleep. Then he sprang to his feet, terrified, and stood in front of me, making no attempt to hide the book. "'Where did you learn to read?' I asked conversationally. It was a while before he could comprehend the question. As he calmed, the evasive look returned to his eyes." at the inn from a stranger, he replied haltingly, and he held out the book to me. I swear, I would have put it back. Are you going to dismiss me? I made no move to take the book. I don't know yet, I replied. Please don't dismiss me, he begged. It's just that I, I see these books all the time, so, so many of them. Hadn't it occurred to you that you might ask? He shot me a glance of mistrustful calculation. No, he admitted at last. I didn't think you'd lend me one. Why not? Well, a person like me. Don't you know you're stealing? I told you I, I'd have put it back, he blazed. Why did you take this particular book? He refused to look at me. I didn't mean to steal, he repeated dully. I could not let him avoid the question. Why did you take an alchemist book? Because I'd like, I'd like to learn about it. Gerber, that taught me to read and write, he said alchemists have a secret. How to make gold? That, yes, but something else, too. What? The elixir of eternal life, the magic wand. You can make storm and hail with it. Command spirits, be above everybody. The boy seemed to regret his vehement outburst midway through. You know, he ended lamely. What do I know? The whole thing upstairs. What is upstairs? A workshop. Now he gazed at me with boundless longing. So he had spied on the laboratory, too. He must have climbed one of the trees to feast those hungry, lynx-like eyes. They were all kinds of rumors about the castle of Grot. Well-meant, as well as spiteful tongues, had combined to weave a legend around it. Young Mueller had heard these things, and they had brought him straight to me. I took the book and said I would think about his fate. For the next few days, I was conscious of his eyes following me everywhere. Should I teach him? He was crude and confused like Hans Bergner, and he had a great deal to go through. But Rochard hadn't refused Hans Bergner. It was an accident that decided the matter. While I was away in Rotenburg, Ernst fell out of one of the trees by the laboratory and suffered several serious breaks in his arm and thigh. By the time I got home, my father had cleaned and dressed his wounds, put him into splints, and given him a sedative. So I had little to do when I visited him in his shabby quarters in the woodshed of the gardener's hut. He was breathing heavily and looked exhausted and frightened. Were you spying again? I asked quietly. The lad bit his lips and made no reply. Answer me. Suddenly he broke into bitter sobs, disarming me completely. How, how else can I get there? How else? He gasped between sobs. And you took back the book before I had finished reading it. I've had no right to complain, of course, but I wish I could learn too. be in a workshop like the Lord's. There was a terrifying force behind this blind ambition. I knew it was the striving of the fallen novice for the dimly remembered light. Do you remember what it means to study? I asked cautiously. I've done it before. But once in a while, between play and chores, could you start something and stick to it for years? Study subjects that are difficult, dry, and boring. This is not just irresponsible daydreaming about sorcery, spirits, and eternal life. You have to work for knowledge and submit to the discipline. Curb your curiosity. Unless you submit to these conditions, there is no knowledge and no power. It's a power entirely different from what you crave. You cannot have it if you want it, just to control other people. Then what do you use it for? 
he challenged in the dim light. To control yourself. That doesn't sound so attractive, does it? Yes, it does, the lad retorted. I enjoyed learning all the letters and numbers and wished I could do it all the time. I don't care about anything else. and I'll work any length of time for it. Ask for nothing. Just a little to eat. I'll do anything you want. Anything. I wouldn't ask for pay. Just a chance to be among books and in the workshop. In his excitement, he struggled to sit up, then sank back with a groan. Calm down. You mustn't try to move. I went and wedged the open the window of the woodshed so I could see his injuries. His face was distorted with pain. I leaned over and began examining his bandages. Suddenly, I recoiled. There was an old dog-eared book on his blanket, smudged and stained by dirty fingers. It was the story of Nicholas Flamel. Then I knew I had to teach him. Ernst recuperated slowly. The splintered bones gave him great pain. In the meantime, I brought him books I thought would help organize his inner world. He greeted me with gratitude and dog-like devotion when I visited the woodshed. I could see his emotional dependencies grow greater every day. To him, I was the guardian of heaven, holding the key to his life and his future. Yet every day, I saw even more clearly what crude material he was and how little I could hope for his progress. What he needed to learn could be taught only by time and experience. Knowledge could not polish his passions and instincts. Only living them out could do that. Every other master would refuse him without a second thought. Obscure feelings and violent desire were not the attributes of an occult student. Only his mental and spiritual readiness and his own progress would determine his fate. Meanwhile, I made myself familiar with Ernst's miserable childhood, which differed from that of the animals which he was raised only by being more neglected. Even in their filthy pens, the animals got their food on time and received sufficient care to prevent illness. But Ernst soon became aware that he could depend on no one. The world was wicked and hostile, and he was small and weak. His mother didn't care anything about him. She noticed him only to beat him when he got in her way. His grandmother would throw him some food occasionally, but she herself was a sick woman who could barely drag herself about on swollen legs. Since both were helpless, they came to depend upon each other, a dependence mixed with jealousy and suspicion, for both knew they were superfluous and feared there would not be enough for them both. One of Ernst's first memories was hearing his mother say how much easier things would have been for her if he had died at birth, while his grandmother continually lamented that God did not take her and him with her. And then, of course, the inn was on the highway and attracted many strange, diverse people. The boy saw agents, wandering journeymen, swindlers, peasants, and nobility, all roused his curiosity with their alien customs and boastful tales. They implanted the lust for faraway adventure, fantastic, unusual, and wonderful, but the most important influence in his life had been a wandering barber named Gerber. Gerber was a shiftless vagabond, frequently in trouble with the authorities, but he had managed to garner some confused knowledge from randomly found books and varied experiences. Discovering that Ernst had a receptive mind, he began to teach him. Then he would go off from time to time, not caring that the boy needed him like warm sunshine after a cold and terrifying night. Yet every time the barber returned, he was touched by the child's joy, love, and good memory. Ernst never forgot anything. He cherished his knowledge like a holy relic. Indeed, it was his only treasure, the only meaning of his life. His knowledge increased with Gerber's every return. The barber taught him to read and write, but also a good deal of twisted information, half-truths, and fantastic theories. Ernst had seen many fights at the tavern and knew all about knifings and spilled blood, but none of these prepared him for the experience of seeing Gerber die of gastric hemorrhage. And no one even wanted to help the dying man. The tavern folk responded to a situation by debating whether or not they should take him out to an open field, since it was going to be a messy death and might lead to complications with the police. Then the owner and the bartender hauled the helpless man out and dropped him in a ditch full of nettles. Ernst followed them, sobbing and trembling, and sat beside the dying man as the last drops of blood flowed out of him and his eyes grew glassy. The boy was horrified by such mercilessness, and something snapped inside of him. He began to remember something Gerber had told him. Do not work only for ordinary knowledge, my son. Acquire the knowledge of magic spells that will put you above the common herd of men. If you don't, sooner or later they'll trample you. 
It is only by terrifying them that you can get them to respect you. I made the mistake of my life by not taking service with a magus. I met one when I was a young man, and I knew right away who he was. Once I defended him, when he was attacked by robbers, they couldn't really hurt him, of course, because the elixir made him immortal. He could have struck all of them down just by waving his hand, but he liked my courage and took me into his confidence. He even offered to let me become his famulus, and sooner or later he would have given me the elixir too, if I'd struck with him. I could be making gold right now and not give a damn about death. Why didn't you stick with him? Ernest had asked out of a pounding heart. Gerber had just waved a hand. You wouldn't understand yet, my small friend. There was this woman I was crazy about, a big blonde. She was a mean, cold bitch. But anyway, the magus moved on and I stayed. She promptly betrayed me with the coffin maker. I gave up eternal life and endless gold for that woman. You see, I couldn't find the magus again. I looked for him for years, even today. Now Ernst sat beside the dying man and stared at the highway, hopelessly waiting for a miracle. Surely the Magus will come now, he thought. He'll come and bring the elixir and heal Gerber. He couldn't let Gerber die like this. Gerber is the only person in the world who cares about me. But the Magus didn't come and Gerber died in the muddy ditch. After that, Ernst could bear his home no longer. He ran away taking with him only the book about Nicholas Flamel and his implanted monomania. He went to find the Magus. When Ernst had recuperated, I began to teach him. First I laid a foundation of cleanliness and order. I taught him to eat at a table, keep himself clean, and behave politely, and provided him with necessary clothes, books, and writing materials. He was allotted a small room in the heated pavilion in the park. Ernst responded by keeping his quarters immaculate, There was never even a speck of dust on his bookshelf, and he cared for each object on his desk with devout love. His hair was always well combed, his suit pressed, and his nails clean. He was humble and compliant, and would do anything to please me, no matter how small or simple. As a pupil, he devoured everything with surprising speed. He was exceptionally perceptive and interested in everything. In two years, he had finished what most students do in eight. He threw himself into the study of languages, and his excellent memory allowed him to master French, English, and Latin. I might have been dazzled by this beginning if I had not been aware of his quick temper, uncontrolled sensuality, and natural guile. These alarmed me. I knew he was at war with the servants. This was not altogether due to the envy of his changed status, as I had at first thought. Ernst took good care to make them feel inferior, especially the gardener for whom he had once worked and who ironically had had pity on him. The gardener came to me and complained that Ernst was stealing the new red roses and tearing them out so roughly he injured the roots. When I began to question the lad about this, he blushed and avoided my gaze. I like roses, he said finally. If you left them on the rose bush, they'd be there longer for you to enjoy. I can't enjoy them with the gardener around. I can feel his poisonous hatred. Ernst spoke heatedly all the time, watching from under his eyelids for my reaction. Now I was alarmed. His eyes looked so sincere and he was lying. The gardener used to be your friend. I responded, why should he hate you? I wanted to see how far the lad would go because you've been so good to me. None of the servants can forgive me for rising above them. They'd love to see you get angry and dismiss me. So they've changed their attitude toward you? Yes. Have you perhaps changed your attitude toward them? Of course not. I leave them alone. If you leave them alone, then you have indeed changed your attitude toward them. I have nothing to say to them, and that is precisely how you have hurt them. Remember, you have nothing to be particularly proud of. You haven't risen above them. You've just taken another path. Your path is no better than theirs, not by any means. They are good servants who do their work well, and their path is useful and honest. You are a servant too. The fact that you have begun to study doesn't mean you're a sage. You're only standing at the threshold of knowledge and it has not yet been decided if you are worthy of the higher knowledge. Good perception and a shrewd mind are all you need for earthly knowledge, but you need other qualities to penetrate occult truth, qualities like moral strength, love of truth, unwavering courage, humility, self-denial, and the ability to experience non-sensual ecstasy. I see little of these qualities in you. Your every ambition is directed out toward the world. You collect the treasures of knowledge only to flaunt them like metals so the ignorant will admire you. 
That is not a proper goal for a true student of the occult. You are still on the downward road. What do you do with the roses? I had caught him unawares, and he could only stammer. I, I took them to my room, and then I put them in a vase on my table or the desk. I've been in your room every day, and I haven't noticed any roses. I, I was afraid. You hid them when I came in? Yes, that's it. Why won't you believe you can tell me the truth? The truth? Do you really believe you can keep me from finding out what you're doing and thinking? If you aren't ashamed to do something, don't be ashamed to own up to it. You needn't be afraid. I'm not angry with you, and I won't look down on you. I'm just your teacher. Just don't ever lie to me. That's the only condition I exact. Lying won't help you anyway because I can see through you. Elisa is a very young and inexperienced. You're putting her in danger with your braggadocio and stolen roses. He stared at me, crushed. You know about this? Yes. That should amply prove my point. I know all about your other affairs, too, but they don't bother me. Until you are mature enough to channel your sexual energies into creative forces, it's better for you to discharge them this way to keep them from hindering your work. Now, do we understand each other? You leave Elisa and the roses alone. He promised implicit obedience, but he broke his word before the next morning. Elisa was the red-haired 16-year-old daughter of the cook, a whimsical, sensuous girl. The local miller wanted to marry her, and she had been inclined to favor him until Ernst appeared on the scene. By now, Ernst was 18, well-built, well-groomed, and unusually mature in his appearance. He could talk intelligently and colorfully, and boundless confidence gleamed in his eyes. Elisa fell blindly in love with him. She was beautiful and willing, and Ernst was totally callous in his desire. He had no intention of refusing this ripe fruit that fell into his lap. For a while, the affair was secret. The girl would sneak out the pavilion during the night and then return at dawn. When Elisa became pregnant, she went to the dirty, ignorant village medicine woman for help, and Ernst somehow scrounged up the money for the old crone. One evening, the cook rushed into the study where my parents and I retired after dinner, she was frightened and crying and begged us to return with her to the servants' quarters. Elisa was in convulsions and would not let anyone touch her. We all answered the summons, but Elisa refused to see anyone but my mother. We waited while she made the examination. My mother sent the cook away as soon as she returned and then told us what had happened. The clumsy old woman had bungled the abortion and mangled the unfortunate girl. Elisa was hemorrhaging badly. There was no time to be lost. We ignored the girl's protests and went in. Together we cleansed her and administered sedatives and certain essences to heal the infection. This girl's horrible screams rang through the night. They drew Ernst deadly pale and trembling to the open window, while her bloody naked torso writhed in our hands. I happened to glance up and meet his eyes. Despair, pity, and guilt contorted his features, and for a moment I almost hoped the incident would cure him of irresponsible sexual escapades. When Elisa had finally calmed down, we turned her over to the care of her mother, with instructions to wake me immediately if she got worse. We returned to the castle, and I had already started undressing when I felt Ernst standing outside my door. Not daring to knock, his mental turmoil was almost a palpable force burning through the wood. Come in, Ernst. I called softly. I was waiting for you. The door opened and the boy staggered in, terribly agitated, before I could stop and he knelt before me. My God, my God, he kept repeating, never again, oh my God. I made him sit down and he stared at me with his eyes full of the one question he dared not to ask. She will live, I answered, but just fifteen minutes later would have been too late. Why did you let her go to that butcher? We, we were ashamed. Were you ashamed to perform the act? I countered. It's just a madness. You don't even notice when you fall into it. By all human reasoning, Elisa should be dead because of your madness. Worse, if you hadn't crossed her path and dazzled her eyes, she would have become a good wife and mother. Now she has no choice but to turn to harlotry, for the village will drive her away. I can't save her from that. It's not even as though you really loved her. You just wanted to satisfy your passion. You wouldn't marry her if you had the opportunity because in your heart you look down on her. You think she's only fit for sexual pleasure, yet you seduced her, and that at a time when you could have satisfied your desires with the baker's widow. 
Are you beginning to understand the nature of the power you keep burbling about? It is the power to control yourself and the weak moments you have to conquer, otherwise you'll be buried under avalanche of consequences. Ernst readily admitted the truth of what I had said and accepted his guilt, and he asked if I was going to make him leave the castle. Your future behavior will determine that, I replied. I'll give you a chance to change, but if you prove you can't, you need expect nothing more from me. This statement calmed him considerably. He had confidence in himself, but even more in my lenience. Now that his personal affairs were settled and he was absolved of all consequences, Ernst reverted to his monomania. Was Elisa saved by the elixir? He asked suddenly. What made you think of that? I tried to avoid his question. You said that by all human reasoning, she would be dead since she is alive. It was not human knowledge that saved her. It was the elixir, yes. It would have been wiser for you to wait to learn of it until your own efforts changed the legends into natural understanding. Why? Don't you believe there's an elixir? It was a raw challenge. You'll have a lot of biscuits yet to learn the answer to that. Well, can't you just tell me? I will tell you everything you're ready to learn, but the books will write about it openly. Why do they do that if I'm not supposed to know about it? The elixir you're talking about is very dangerous because it exists only in the minds of fanatics. I know of nothing but medications. Well, isn't that just semantics? I felt his excitement surge around me. No. You're imagining an elixir that will give your body immortal youth, sexual potency and attraction, some kind of miracle drug that will cancel out the effects of every debauchery. You want to live forever simply because you think it will take that long to sate your desires. I'm afraid I'll have to disillusion you. There are certain medications that can heal the body and prolong the lifespan. But to be effective, they must always be accompanied by a healthful lifestyle. The body can never really become immortal. It is a transitory form, an experimental workshop that is the prey of death. The body contains death within itself. It is the spirit that is eternal. If the spirit must struggle with its own body to gain this eternity. The two are like fire and water. They don't mix. One inevitably consumes the other. And man is the battleground of this war. The body's weapons are passion, desire, sensuality, and yearning after beauty. The spirit's weapons are the after-effects of gratifications of these desires. Nausea, disillusionment, suffering, aging, and death. The soul is the bridge on which the two forces fight continuously. Sometimes the body captures the spirit, starves it, and believes it has killed it, but the spirit has a weapon that eventually wins the victory. Immortality. The victory of the body is only temporary. When once the spirit defeats the body, it is annihilated forever. The true elixir of the alchemist is merely a weapon in the battle, a method of extending the lifespan and prolonging the spirit's existence in a hostile territory so it can perform its tasks with an older, finer-tuned brain and be better prepared for the final conflict. Only a truly aware spirit can acquire the elixir, and even then only if it will not be used for treachery. And this elixir, or shall I say medicine, is it, a, is it a powder or liquid? Ernst asked. He had not even slightly understood the meaning of my words. It was frightening to relive the same old argument on the other side of the table. I remembered so well how, how I had set across from the magister in Hans Bergner's body, driven by a passionate monomania. Now I knew the helplessness and sorrow Rochard must have felt when he realized they could not really pass on his knowledge his profound truths fell on barren rocks in Hans Bergner's soul. This ominous memory made it clear to me that it was futile to work with Ernst Müller any further. He was such raw material to be unworkable. He wasn't interested in what I could offer, and he cherished the firm belief that I could initiate him into a secret that would make him immortal and happy. There was no way to explain why I didn't do this. I knew it would be vain to pour the clearest white magic into his grimy soul, it would immediately be churned into the thick poison of black magic. He would promptly use all his strength and knowledge for his own selfish passions and interest. Now I realized I could stop teaching him. We had been brought together only so I could give him a start. I must remove him from the castle of Grot immediately. Of course, I felt responsible for the boy's future. I couldn't leave him alone. Thus, I took the first step into the dark corridor of the Temple of Mysteries. I did not know whether I was going upward or about to crash into a deep well. I only knew I could not stop.
the lion's claws. I soon found an excellent way to forward my plan. For some time I had corresponded with Jean-Marie Ragon, the outstanding Belgian mystic, and together we had established a lodge in Brussels. I decided to take Ernst with me and get him a good clerical position there. I knew the city would attract my student like a magnet, and the sooner he submerged himself in the ocean of astral passions, the sooner he would arise from it. At first I told Ernst only that I meant to travel and take him with me. I didn't mention my other plan because I wanted him to feel that accepting the new opportunity would be his own idea. Ernst's joy was boundless and his fevered preparations took his whole time, even distracting him from his studies. Time and again, he told me he could never repay what I had done for him. We started in March 1801, passing on the way the inn where Ernst's mother served. I wondered if he would ask to visit her so he could show off his new finery, but he drew back into the carriage and wouldn't even look out the window. He abruptly grew silent. What's the matter? I prompted. I hate this place, he burst out. I thought you might want to see your mother. I never want to hear of that place again. I understand, I replied. Hans Bergner had felt the same way. I had calculated correctly. The city of Brussels captivated Ernst, and I saw to it that he had free time and money to spend while I worked with Ragon. When he had his fill of sightseeing and public entertainments, I took him to meet some of the high-ranking families. The magic name of the order opened all palace doors to me and ensured a cordial, hospitable welcome. We began to attend five evening parties I would never have gone to on my own, and Ernst became immersed in the atmosphere of refined splendor and immense wealth and the assured bearing of the chosen caste. He had never seen anything like this at austere, monastic groat. Suddenly beautiful women with skin like fragrant petals and dazzling jewels buzzed around him. He began to hear delicate yet playful and enticing words directed at him, and an assortment of wines, spices, and exotic dishes tickled his palate. The brilliant, ostentatious splendor of these gatherings would have crushed a more sensitive and sophisticated person, but it inspired Ernst and set his sensuality aflame. He was as self-confident as though he was at last on his home ground. I was surprised at how easily he assumed a supercilious, aristocratic demeanor. He handled the ladies with a sure, easy hand, arousing them with his hungry, disrobing eyes. It was as though he and not they were experienced in the sophisticated art of love. Here was a castless nobody, the illegitimate son of a servant bridging the social gulf like a skilled tightrope walker. He used his excellent powers of observation to store everything he heard, then use it selectively at the proper time. People began to notice Ernst. They thought him original, unusually intelligent, and dangerously attractive, and he really was all that. He ported and played like a lion cub, but already his bloodthirsty claws and teeth flashed experimentally. I discussed my plans for Ernst with Ragon. We agreed that his employer must be selected carefully. First, we had to make sure there were no young women in the household in any capacity. Eventually, we decided on Charles de Blancourt, a wealthy old bachelor who was an avid book collector. He was anxious to hire a reliable, educated young man to supervise his library and find rare books for him. The old man's love of books and generosity made him an excellent choice. De Blancourt was no real student of the occult, just an avid amateur. He did not practice in any way. Since Ragon had helped him get rare books and was an erudite companion, de Blancourt was more than ready to perform a favor for him. De Blancourt made his offer to Ernst in the midst of a splendid party at his palatial home. He offered the boy a salary, luxurious appointments, and considerable free time if he would take on this pleasant and comfortable job. It was all a not yet established young man could dream of. Still, Ernst asked time to think it over. When we got back to the hotel, he asked if he might come into my room to discuss an important matter. He was pale and his manner was humble. I knew that he was going to say and I knew how I would have to answer him. He told me about de Blancourt's offer and I congratulated him on such personal success. I am well aware of the advantages of the position, Ernst stared at me sternly, and I passionately love everything he offers me, but I'd give it all up without a second thought if you could continue teaching me and give me some hope that someday... You would initiate me into the most important secrets of life. There are the only things that really matter. Well, I can at least give you a straight answer, Ernst. If I could give you a single spark of hope that I could initiate you during your present life, even in old age, 
I would tell you to stay with me, but I can't. I could only help you start. Your goal is still far away, many lives and deaths away. I wish I could tell you something different, for I have grown fond of you and I shall miss you, but the best advice I can give you is to take de Blancourt's offer. Grote could not give you any more. He stood up, a picture of anger and despair. Then what is it I need to do to be found worthy of the Opus Magnus? Am I not intelligent, persistent, and hardworking? Oh, I admit my passions defeat me, but I would subjugate them all for the great goal if you would but give me the word. Have you thought of the links to which you might drive me? I shall never stop seeking the occult. You know, regardless of what it costs me or anybody else, why don't you lead me down the straight road? Because it is better for you to go through the detours of experience that will purify you. Otherwise, you would leave the straight road at a later point and use your occult knowledge for the wrong purposes. I do not doubt your intelligence and your persistence, and I know you will never cease your search for occult secrets. When you arrive at the point where you can win the keys to the three gates of knowledge, I know you will make outstanding use of them. But there are other things you must do first. I am not belittling you by refusing. It's just that I cannot give you these forces to use in gratifying your passions. You see, these forces can be used properly only by adepts who are beyond the temptations of passion. I know you're bitter and feel I've misjudged you. If I have, I'll gladly admit it. The best way for you to prove me wrong is for you to remain steadfast and keep on working without my making you a definite promise. Actually, you can get closer to your goal if you don't stay with me. If you stay on the straight road all by yourself, that would be a definite indication of maturity. Let this be a trial. Prove me wrong and I will share all my knowledge unconditionally. He rose. All right. His response was serious. Should I contact you or will you send for me when you realize you were mistaken? I'll contact you, Ernst. You needn't doubt that. So Ernst took de Blancourt's offer for several months. I received long letters from him in which he faithfully recounted every thought and action. The youth had an original and colorful style, and he would give very droll description of the people he met. He respected de Blancourt and adored his work, throwing himself into it wholeheartedly. For a while, he was interested in nothing else. Regan also wrote me favorable reports. Ernst seldom left the house. He reported instead he spent all his free time reading and making notes. Blancourt liked the boy and appreciated his efforts, for he had managed to get two rare books the old man had wanted for years. He was glad we recommended him. Then toward the end of the year, Ernst's letters became less frequent. Though Ragon was still sending me good reports, Ernst was still doing well. In fact, he was, if anything, overworking. De Blancourt's began to worry about his health for he had lost his appetite and had difficulty sleeping. The old man urged him to relax, but Ernst would not hear of it. The brief letters he wrote me revealed that Ernst had found something that occupied him greatly, something he didn't want me to know about. His broad script narrowed and the letters now angled backwards, indicating a withdrawal from society and concentration on some subject. Then I knew that Ernst had left the straight path. Isabel. When Ernst had been in Brussels for three years, a tragedy occurred that at last revealed the young man's secret, dangerous activity. At this time, de Blancourt received a visit from his younger sister, who lived in England, and she brought her daughter Isabel with her. Regan said that Isabel was a cold-mannered beauty, tall and slender, with darkish blonde hair. The gray eyes and vivid lips of this extraordinary girl contradicted her apparent coldness, and she was wickedly witty. There was tension between Isabel and Ernst from the time they first met. The girl was wealthy, spoiled, and sophisticated, and she took every occasion to make Ernst feel like an upstart. It was her custom to make him the butt of her sarcastic jests during meals. According to Ragon, Ernst bore up with remarkable self-control and frequently managed to get the better of the girl with his agile responses. Isabel was engaged to Lord B., the eldest son of one of England's oldest houses, and upon her marriage would have a close connection with the royal house. Yet there was no doubt she was intrigued by this handsome lad of impossible background. She used her scorn to discharge this attraction and convince herself she could not possibly be interested in him. Ernst responded with polite reservation and avoided her whenever possible. This was the state of affairs that brought about the tragedy. There began to be a change in Isabel. 
She no longer threw scornful jests at Ernst, and she seemed quite listless and inattentive. Soon she became noticeably pale, and her lips grew dry and bloodless. Her mother, thinking she pined for her fiancé, planned a speedy return home, but Isabel would hear nothing of it. She wanted to stay longer than they had originally planned. Her mother could go home without her. Then Isabel's mother got a letter from Lord B, asking about his fiancé, who had not answered his letters in weeks. The girl was undoubtedly sick, but she protested desperately when her worried family sought to call in a doctor. When they sent for one anyway, she locked herself in her bedroom and could not be persuaded to come out. Now to Blancourt and his sister were thoroughly alarmed and bewildered. They suspected some emotional involvement, perhaps a love affair, but they could find no evidence among Isabel's acquaintances in Brussels. During the last few weeks before she had withdrawn completely from Brussels society, the truth came out in Isabel's suicide note. The girl had taken poison and was dead when they found her. She had addressed the note to de Blancourt, and Ragon was the only person outside the family who ever knew the truth. De Blancourt gave him permission to send a copy of her statement to me. Isabel had begun by asking that de Blancourt stand by her mother and support her in time of sorrow. Then she asked him to cover up the affair and use his influence to find a doctor who would certify death of natural causes. Finally, she told her story. It started two months ago on September 2nd, a warm, overcast evening. I could have chosen between two invitations, but I had a slight headache and didn't feel like going anywhere. I felt weighed down and oppressed at dinner. I sat opposite Ernst Mueller as usual. Every time I looked up from my plate, he was staring at me, as had been usual of late. That night it annoyed me greatly. For some reason, I could not think of the scathing sentences with which I usually pricked this conceited busybody. I could not but despise him because he always cunningly pretended to be a much grander person than he was. There was something strange in his face that night, and his eyes burned with hatred. Also, I can say it now since it doesn't matter any longer, and I want you to know what a horrible thing this monster has done in stealing my will from me. His glance rushed through my veins like a living fire. I was desperately ashamed and worried by this sensation, but I could not defend myself against its perverse attractiveness. I was filled with a mad yearning. He was repulsive and revolting. I hated him. If I had been in full possession of my mental faculties, he could never have conquered my resistance. I became very drowsy after dinner, so I retired early. I don't know how long I slept before I was awakened, but that's not the proper word. Only part of me awakened. My will and memory still slept. My body raged with burning desire. I heard someone call my name softly, Isabel. Come, come to me. The voice intensified my desire. I trembled and cried out with the pain of it. Then the inner storm washed my will and the memory away completely. I awoke fully to a situation so horrible and crushing, I can't even describe it. I found myself on Ernst Mueller's bed, dizzy, defiled, and bleeding. My body was scratched, and my shoulders bore marks of human teeth. There he stood by the ravaged bed, illuminated by the light of a candle. In a cold, commanding voice, he told me to return to my room quietly since the servants would soon be up. Then he added that he was sure I would be sensible and not change my manner toward him publicly. I burst into tears and began to berate him savagely using words I did not know. I knew. Rushing up, I beat his chest with my fists. He shoved me back onto the bed. Shut up. After all, it's more important to you that you not be found here than it is to me. What a little wild cat. She used her teeth and nails in love and her fists in hate. Scornfully, he bared his chest to show me the marks on his neck and shoulders. Now get out. I'll call you again. I almost fainted with humiliation, but I managed to drag myself back to my room, moaning. My one thought was that I must quickly dress and go to the river and drown myself, but as soon as I got to my room, I collapsed in exhausted sleep. My mother woke me at noon. I told her I was sick, so she let me stay in bed, but she stayed with me. It was evening when she left. I felt desperately ashamed when she kissed me, and I longed to cling to her and to that bright, sunny young life I had lost in the night. But she left, I prayed for a long time, then began dressing to carry out my purpose. Yet while I was dressing, I felt again the sweet, debased yearning that conquered everything in me. I heard the voice again, Come, Isabel. Nothing else existed for me except the voice and my raging passion. Before dawn, I awoke to find myself in Ernst Miller's bed again. That was what kept happening. Every day I started to go kill myself, and every day I defiled myself yet again. Once I was 
right at the river when the monstrous puppeteer jerked me back on his thread of dark passion. But now I've got some poison, and I'll take it the first chance I get. I have no other recourse, for my will is completely broken. He has infected me with desire as with the plague. Now, I lust after his cold fiend's face and muscular body, even in the daytime. I find myself being jealous, and I await the night with terrible, joyous anguish. Also, I know I'm pregnant. That is the final blow. I cannot remain alive and bring such shame to the parents and fiancé who so trusted me, or give birth to Ernst Mueller's unwanted bastard. I, Isabella de Blancourt, wells by my own hand. Ernst disappeared without a trace when Isabel committed suicide. He probably left Brussels altogether. Ragon and I both realized what had happened. Ernst had found a large collection of books on sexual magic in de Blancourt's library. This exposure had been fatal. His natural sensuality and ambition had sucked him into the womb of the dark forces. He must have practiced for months before Isabel incident. I could calculate his progress almost exactly from the change in his letters. Now, this unfortunate suicide had proved the success of his labors. Ernst was dangerously talented in this area. He had enormous sexual energy, great intelligence, and diligence in all he pursued. What he did not know, or wouldn't believe, was that the dark forces always turn against the one who uses them and avenge all at once the injuries he has done to others. In the meantime, well, in the meantime, he could cause many tragedies, for he was loose in the world with supernatural powers. Of course, he could only assault women who were morally weak and passionate, but how many women are truly strong? Ernst Mueller would bring them bitter suffering with his evil pleasures, and he would stiffen their resistance in their next life. There was no stopping him now. He was on the downward path, and would have to reach bottom before he turned in the right direction, just as Hans Bergner had. Isabel's death may not have shaken him momentarily. Perhaps he even understood my attitude now. But again, maybe he blamed me for putting this temptation in his path. I was sure he never meant to drive the girl to suicide. He had just wanted to humiliate her. But the forces of black magic always drive the sorcerer who conjured them farther than he meant to go. They become independent and use him to ravage and destroy. You may think they serve him, but in actuality they direct and will finally crush him. The Black Magician. In 1805, the Trenisophist Freemasonic fraternity formed a chapter in Paris for those who investigate the three sciences. Ragone invited me to come to the opening and I stayed in his house. It was here I encountered Ernst Mueller again. I was just getting out of my coach when I saw him coming up the street. He was tattered and disheveled, obviously reduced to beggary. When he saw me, his eyes dilated with shock and he ran away. Soon after this I went home to say goodbye to my parents who were going to spend some time in the Orient. I had some things to finish at Groat before I could join them, but I accompanied them as far as the border. By now we were so united in spirit that their bodily absence did not sadden me. I knew of a certainty I would not lose them. The years that followed at Castle were busy and peaceful. Amadeus gradually became a diligent partner in my work and climbed rapidly in the order. In 1818, Ragon presented a series of lectures on ancient and modern initiations at the Paris Lodge, and since I had business for the order in Paris, I was glad to have the opportunity to hear my illustrious friend's lectures. My main reason for going, though, was to acquaint him with Victor Amadeus. During this trip, I got more news of Ernst Müller. The female relatives of one of my colleagues were chattering enthusiastically about a wonderful man who had healed Madame X and Mademoiselle Y simply by putting his hands on them and breathing upon them. The two women had long-standing and singular illnesses. Madame X had been a widow for twenty years, though she was still quite young. This very religious woman suffered from agonizing headaches that forced her to stay in a darkened room and scream with pain. The malady had grown steadily worse and was completely engulfing her life. She confided to my informant that these attacks were always preceded by shameful dreams she could not bear to describe. Mademoiselle Y's case was similar. She was a woman no longer young who had vowed never to marry when her fiancé died, and she had held to her oath despite the proposals of many men captivated by her wealth and beauty 
Her problem was shortness of breath, difficulty in swallowing, and vertigo. The problem had become so intense that she scarcely dared to leave the house. It became even worse when she was in company. If someone stared at her or she heard a deep male voice, she would choke immediately. Both women had been completely healed by this gentleman after only a few treatments, and now they were his devoted followers. He had gained a large number of adherents by similar phenomenal results. His name, they said, was Jose Maria de Chassin. When we were alone, I asked my colleague what he thought of the man with the high-sounding name. I don't know, he replied thoughtfully. There's something peculiar about him. For one thing, all his patients are women. As for what he's like, he is a muscular, handsome fellow of about 30 who grooms himself like a dandy. He's intelligent enough and highly educated, and he must be wealthy because he has a huge palace and a vast establishment of servants and carriages. His palace is peculiar, too. It's all hidden lights, heavy draperies, exotic statues, and hidden music. Luxurious lounges alternate with glass cases full of snakes. The whole thing produces an astounding hypnotic effect. Nobody seems to know where he got his money. But maybe it's obvious he treats only women who are very rich past their prime and suffering from nervous disorders. His treatments are suspicious, too. The treatment room is draped in deep red with matching furniture. In the center is a pedestal containing a soft chaise lounge. The patients, the ones who talk, all describe the treatment the same way. They remove their clothing and put on a long red gown to cover their nakedness. When they lie down on the sofa facing their own image in a mirror suspended from the ceiling, the room is slowly filled with the smell of sweet incense and the light burns down to a dull red. Soft, delicate music is heard from behind the draperies and they are soothed to a pleasant drowsiness. Then the marvelous man appears, a red silk gown billowing about his muscular figure. He leans over them, and his warm breath touches their eyes. Then he lays his hands upon them, and they lose consciousness with a shudder that spreads the concentrated healing force. Mademoiselle Y says that before going to sleep, she feels as if nectar and ambrosia had been poured into her veins. And Madame X confessed still more to an indiscreet friend, she said, you wake up with a pleasurable weariness, victorious and sated upon a bed of laurels. All tension is dissolved and every longing is satisfied. Even your skin breathes and the blood feels youthful in the veins. You are full of hope and the joy of life. The weariness is followed by a fine appetite. This description was a disturbing silhouette of my fallen student. My suspicions were verified when Ragon and I paid an unexpected visit to Madame X's salon. There he sat like a pasha, surrounded by aging, lonely women who basked in the flame of his sensuality. The path he had traveled was written in his face. His eyes were hooded, and his lower lip was divided by a fawn line repeated and reaffirmed in that aggressive jaw. He had had his hair arranged artistically in a mass of shining black curls. The blind sculptor of passion had certainly done a marvelous job on him, in just a few years, he had formed from his willing raw material a demon of sexual rage. The moment he saw me, the bumptious confidence vanished. He made his excuses quickly and left, fearing I would question him. At that point, I didn't have a single question to ask him. I knew I couldn't disillusion his followers. He had bound them to himself with the cords of tremendous lust. The victims themselves could have loosed this bond by freeing their spirits, but their spirits yet slept in the glowing crucibles of their bodies. Any attempt I could make would be futile. My words would be washed away by the pulsing of their veins as the skilled sorcerer put their moral senses to sleep and freed them to act their lust. Some time later, Ragon wrote me about the scandals that were ending Chassin's career in Paris. The police had a series of complaints from the families of his followers and their investigation brought several studies to light. For example, they discovered the real secret of Mademoiselle Y's early death. She had suddenly realized after several months of treatments that she was pregnant. A high-born lady had thrown away her life because Chassin had no use for her after he had taken her fortune. It turned out that Chassin's unfortunate clients had almost without exception spent themselves into ruin because of him. Deprived of their free will, they had signed promissory notes that made them beggars. The man was an insatiable Moloch. Nobody could imagine what he had wanted with all that money. It was more than he could possibly spend on the most luxurious life. When the truth came out, several other clients of the Red Room destroyed themselves rather than face the scandal. Chassin was arrested and sentenced to death after a lurid trial. 
He still had some influence left, however, for the sentence was changed to life in the galleys. I wish I could believe that was the end of the episode and that Ernst Mueller had disappeared from my life. Certainly the few miserable years he would spend in the galleys would curb his appetites. Their horror would serve as a danger signal in his subconscious, a barricade at one of the beaten paths to hell. But I kept thinking about him. Gradually I became aware of a certainty that the thread that bound us had not been severed. He would come back regardless of how much it cost him. So I waited for the return of Ernst Mueller. The circle completed. He came back to Grote in 1830. Nobody recognized him, but I knew immediately who was the horrible human wreck who begged for lodging. In truth, there was little enough left of the Ernst Mueller we had known. The fine voice was a rasp, and he had lost three fingers. Scars showed through his thinning hair, and his eyes were roomy and uncertain. He was stooped and bent, and showed obvious signs of syphilis. When he saw I recognized him, he began to tremble, and would have fainted had I not helped him to a chair. Forgive me, he croaked. I've waited so long to see you. I've tried to get here for years. It's the one goal that has kept me alive. It would have been so much easier to die. He was gasping for breath. I urged him to lie down, but he would not. The impatience of the soul on its deathbed to finish some uncompleted business drove him on. No, I've got to talk now. You must understand me now, or we will be too late, much too late. I'll be stronger in a minute. It's just the excitement. Could you give me a drink? Uh, I'm not a drunkard. That's one thing I've never stooped to, but it, it doesn't really matter anymore what I've done. I mixed him a mildly alcoholic, fortifying drink, and he drank in great gasps. And he closed his eyes and leaned back in the chair. Abruptly, he began to speak in a low, even voice, speaking of the events of his life, as though they had happened to some stranger. He began with Isabel de Blancourt, Wells, and his discovery of black magic, describing his experiments that had met with such frightening, intoxicating success. The events he described were much as I had reconstructed them, but I had been wrong about his feelings toward Isabel, nor had I known he had already experimented with a well-known socialite before Isabel entered the picture that affair had ended quietly. I broke out in a sweat when Isabel responded to my command, he told me. I was jubilant but frightened. She was wearing only a sable coat to cover her nakedness, and beneath it was pure fire and fragrance, a living flame. I learned later that any virtuous woman becomes an insatiable hetera once she is freed from her moral scruples. I didn't induce the passion that made them crave more sophisticated sensual pleasures. It was their own passion to which they surrendered. Isabel's suicide had forced him into a crisis. I didn't mean to kill her. I really and truly loved her. She was the kind of woman I could respect and admire. She captivated me completely, a perfect lady and a perfect lover. She was brilliant, a true partner in lovemaking, a beauty of inexhaustible variety. No other woman can be as beautiful as gray-eyed ash blondes. The delicate nuances of her skin and lips, those daring firm breasts, the refined yet sensual movements of that slender body. She was the jewel I coveted most of all. I knew I was the only one who could satisfy her passion, her natural master and mate, and I was sure she knew it too, for all she tried to deny it. She soon became so inflamed with passion that she would hurry to my bed, humble in her hunger, without my even commanding her. I thought that surely that she would admit she loved me. I knew she was pregnant, and I meant to elope with her and marry her honorably, but she slipped away from me. And just a few moments before she had clung like an obsessed animal, I hadn't called her. She just came into my room in broad daylight and threw herself upon me. Then she took the poison. All of a sudden, the whole world collapsed. I was deathly afraid, remembering your warning. For the first time, I realized I had committed a sin, a dreadful, transcendental crime with horrible consequences. I remembered how I had promised to stay on the straight path and had even been arrogant enough to ask if you would contact me when you realized you were mistaken. I was horribly ashamed, wanted more than anything to return to the path. Isabel's death and its attendant scandal made it impossible for me to stay in Brussels, so I went to Paris, determined to make an honest living and 
never use black magic again. But I soon used up my savings, and those dark powers I had summoned blocked every possibility of employment. I was soon homeless and starving, spending my nights in doorways or the shrubs of the Bois de Boulogne, and eating garbage from the streets. No one would trust me to do the simplest of jobs. There was something about me that made them suspicious. It was apparent they didn't know how to place me. Everyone felt I belonged to a higher social stratum and had fallen to this estate through crime. I became embittered at living in filth and starvation. I realized it was no good struggling. I couldn't rise honestly from the depths to which I had sunk. No one cared that I was trying to go straight, yet I obstinately hung on. Finally, I became dizzy with hunger. Then I remember Ragon. I had known he was in Paris, but I had avoided his neighborhood. I decided to visit him, confess my error, and ask for help. I was sure he would help me, and I saw you standing by his gate. I can't explain exactly how I felt. All my bitterness and sense of futility rose to the surface, and I found myself blaming you for everything. I was ashamed and afraid when I saw you. This soon gave way to hatred. You were the one who had let me taste the fruit of the tree of knowledge and then sent me out into the world half prepared. If I had stayed at Grot, I would never have gotten into this situation. You had known I would fall and had cynically exposed me to temptations I couldn't resist. Now I was an outcast from both heaven and hell and I saw you turn away indifferently. You see, a man has to belong somewhere with his whole heart and soul. Those weak creatures who try to straddle the road without choosing a direction are always outcast. Woe to the lukewarm and hesitant, the people who really count in life ride on one road or the other openly and proudly. Whether they are the deepest villains or the greatest saints, they drink the cup of their lives to the full and accept the consequences. Now I had one road barred to me. The other way was clear, but I was scared to go down it. Suddenly, I asked myself why I should humiliate myself by a life of beggary when I could make all the secret lewdness of the city open before me. I merely had to want to. By this time, I had reached the Bois de Boulogne, where I saw an aging but still beautiful lady sitting on a bench, fanning herself languidly. Her carriage waited respectfully in the distance, and her jewels and clothing were clear signs of great wealth. When I first glanced at her, she met my gaze, then looked away in unutterable boredom. That glance was like a whiplash across my senses, and I swore in all the bitterness of my soul that I would change that bored look, hers and that of other women like her. Thus I burned my bridges and consciously, willingly stepped back upon the road of black magic. You know at least part of the results. Like a child who believes it can cheat the death that takes its elders, I thought I could escape the consequences of my deeds. I did some facile reasoning on the subject and blocked every approach by which I thought myself vulnerable. I knew, of course, that if one dealt in the venom of emotions, he himself had to be immune from them. I never permitted myself to feel either love or pity. Though I descended into the most sophisticated sexual inferno, it was always for my own pleasure, never anybody else's. I had no scruples and no emotional attachments. I exploded every opportunity to the full and enjoy the riches of life behind an impenetrable fortress of selfishness. For a few years I lulled myself into an illusion of safety, and one day I realized that despite my efforts to conserve it, my sexual energy was diminishing. I was being consumed by the very fire I used to lure my victims, so I decided to retire with the fortune I had acquired and regenerate my energies by a period of total abstinence. I didn't realize that I couldn't quit. I needed rest and quiet, but wherever I went, my dreadful profession followed me. Women crept into my bed at night, aflame with lust. I tried to chase them away and locked my door, but they knew well enough how to rouse the passion of my sick imagination. Time and again, they drained the strength I was trying to conserve. I was bound by the spell I had conjured up. It lured a hungry swarm of women to me everywhere. In desperation, I went back to Paris, not realizing I was putting my head into a noose. My past practice had begun to come to light while I was away, and the whole thing blew up in my face before I was even aware of it. About the same time, I realized my nocturnal succubus had given me syphilis. My whole world collapsed. I didn't much care. 
The court sentenced me to death, but one of the patients, a kind, influential lady, got the sentence reduced to life in the galleys. The inhuman life on the galleys broke me physically within a few months. I was crouched on the bench. I was chained. Unable to lift an oar despite the cruelest lashing, the sound of my tortured breathing filled my ears, and I waited for death. Then, I had an inexpressibly horrible experience that drove me back into the land of the living. I seemed to be looking into a chasm swarming with slimy reptiles. No human mind could understand the dreadful transcendental monsters that were waiting for me on the other side, their eager, demonic eyes gleaming with a promise of torments far more terrifying than any torture. I clung to my body like a drowning man. I had to save this decaying clay that kept me in the physical world. Desperately, I struggled to stay alive with superhuman will. I had to stay alive. What I faced was something worse than hell itself. The destruction of my personality smashed into little pieces of animal existence. If I could just stay in Ernst Mueller's body, I could work to attain a higher plane and reach a path where I can return as a penitent human being. And so I'm still alive. Despite every law of nature... They maimed me twice for trying to escape. They beat me till I was half dead. And once they staked me out in the blazing sun. But here I sit. I finally reached my goal. You know why I came. It was the memory of my life with you that sustained me through every hell. The very fact that I've made it here proves that I deserve the chance I'm asking. I've already won the right. Restore my health. Give me just a few decades to climb from the abyss to regain my right to a conscious personality. I don't care to live any longer than that. I don't want eternity, just one human life span. Now sheer fatigue silenced him. His face was covered with perspiration. What compassion he roused in me. Yet I was helpless. How could I deny the frantic request of a dying man, even when it was based on gross error? I could not argue with a man in that condition or crush him with a blunt refusal. I decided I would examine him, treat him with any means I could, and strengthen him as much as possible. Maybe I could give him a few years at least. But my hopes were crushed by the examination. There wasn't a sound organ in his body, and the syphilis in his bloodstream had gone beyond control. His body was just a decomposing hulk held up by willpower, a corpse containing a damned soul. Already his decaying form gave off the stench of corruption. Ernst sensed the truth when he saw my distress. That doesn't matter, he waved this away. I'm alive by a miracle of willpower, and you can work a greater miracle. Don't waste my time with your scholarly game of natural explanations. I don't have any time. Give me the elixir. Nothing else can save me. You can't let me be debased into an animal existence while I cling to your hand and beg with my whole soul. He grasped my arm with one mutilated hand, revealing a ghastly feverish strength. What makes you think I can give you a thing like that? I asked helplessly. He shoved his arm away and pointed with cold rage. Look in the mirror. Automatically, I turned and looked into the mirror over the washbowl. Now I know perfectly well You're nearly 70 years old. Can you think of some natural reason why you don't look older than 30? What could I tell him? I couldn't tell him the method I had used to preserve my physical condition. He wasn't ready for it. And the medication itself I had adapted to only gradually and had prepared it to suit my own constitution. It would kill a weaker person, especially one as ill as he was. But I had to tell him something. I have stayed young looking, I admitted cautiously. It's the result of occult exercises and a certain essence. But unless you have decades of conditioning exercises behind you and have learned other things, things that cannot be revealed to the uninitiated, the essence will corrode the life energies like a powerful poison. If I gave it to you, I'd be committing murder. He was deaf to what I said, seizing only on my admission the fluid existed. He would take responsibility for the possible adverse side effects himself. I know it won't destroy me. Surely you can see that I have superhuman willpower. I've done plenty of occult exercises, even if the direction was wrong I gained from them. 
When I denied his request, he threw himself at my feet, begging, promising, and cursing until he exhausted his frail strength and fainted. I put him to bed and injected some strengthening essences. When he began to come, too, I left him. It was anonymous and nebulous mass of problems I carried to the study that night. Despite the hour, I couldn't go to bed. I had to decipher the hieroglyph that kept confronting me. Now it was so urgent I couldn't avoid it. Three rooms from me lay a man in agony, a man who in his extremity depended on me for salvation. He wouldn't listen to the truth. All he heard was the tale of magic within him. He wanted the elixir, but I had none for him. Now he was resting, gathering his strength to extort a few more hours from death and win from me what he wanted. Since I could find no answer myself, I consulted the stars, mapping astrological calculations by the peaceful lamplight. I could hear the wind sighing in the moonless park outside, then suddenly I remembered I had been here before. The same feelings, the same dark silence. In imagination, I sat upon a blue box in a dark barn, making calculations in a book on my knee. I was even drawing the same aspects of the planets in the two circles of the zodiac, my destiny, and Hans Bergner's, Ernst Müller's, yes, I now sat in Rochard's place. The house of death, the eighth house, was very crowded in my horoscope tonight. The same dark judges now and then. No, not then, it was all now. Hans Bergner's circle, Ernst Müller's, overlapped my own in terrible conjunctions, making the judges executioners, Mars with Mercury in the sign of Gemini, Saturn in close conjunction. The moon gathered their whole destructive force in her chalice and flung it upon me and upon him who lurked silently, Hans Ernst. Suddenly, I could see through the walls. I saw him shuffling hesitantly along the slate floor of the laboratory, his haggard figure black against the white walls. One maimed hand held a candle while the other searched the shelves, cabinets, and drawers. Impatiently, he tore covers off vials and crucibles, spilling powders and liquids. It was lucky for him I had labeled them in the Latin he could read. Otherwise, he would have poisoned himself. Of course, he couldn't find what he wanted. Now I could feel his sick anger and erratic thoughts. His monomania was taking complete control of him. He had to get to the Arcanum. I hoarded and gained the life I maliciously denied him. Even if it were sealed by the most holy sacrament, he had to break the seal. And if flesh and blood should try to stop him, well, it would be just one more corpse to put beside the women who had died for him. What did it matter if he got the great arcanum? His body could not stand much more. He had to get it. And what else could be protecting the great secret but human flesh and blood? The moon rose blood red over the park. Now the problem was laid bare in crystal clarity. And I was tranquil. I left a letter for Victor Amadeus giving him instructions about the order and where and how to deposit my important papers. There was nothing else to do for my father, and I had long agreed the castle and estate should go to the order. The moonlight drew silver columns on the floor as I lay down peacefully. A slight draft told me the door had opened and closed. The transparent curtain billowed in the window. Then I heard his irregular breathing. I did not move but listened to the painfully careful steps. I felt a deep compassion for this poor creature with his monomania, approaching to do something he had no intention of doing, something I had done once. Now he stood motionless by the bed, staring at me intently to direct the rhythm of my breathing. Satisfied, he leaned cautiously over me, feeling under my pillow and searching the nightstand. He opened the nightstand and drawer and searched there. Then I felt his hand run over my chest. Suddenly he felt the small flat box I wore on a gold chain, and he stopped trembling. Just then the moon emerged from a cloud and illuminated my face, showing him that I watched his every move. He stared back at me in terror, like a man who sees a cobra. Stumbling back, his hand encountered the bronze night lamp, and he grasped it without conscious volition and struck me between the eyes. The first blow crushed my brain, so I felt no pain. Ernst kept on beating the crushed shell, madly determined to crush out those two points of light 
and tear his own life from my body. Postscript Opus Magnum I found myself stumbling down its steep tunnel. There was a dim pentagram of light in front of me. As I got closer, I saw it was a star-shaped opening that led to a staircase. There was a soothing fragrance in the air, a light blue mist that lulled me into semi-consciousness. As I moved slowly on, it was a joyous, mystic fragrance that resonated through my soul in melody and idyllic colors. I felt I had always known that melody, and the delicate kaleidoscope of pastels was dear and familiar to me. The corridor I was now traversing led to a small rock-carved room, where the astral double of my body lay, unconscious, on a stone bench. The mist came from a vessel on a sacramental pedestal. Here it seemed to give both fragrance and light. Then I heard the master's voice beside me. Cornelius, wake up. My dizziness was gone, and my soul surged with weightlessness and joyous freedom. The little room widened and became fantastically huge, calm tall. I looked back at the stone bench. My astral body lay motionless, and I saw behind it. In the middle distance, my physical body crushed on the soiled bed. I turned away and looked about me. The pastel curtains of many alcoves opened, and I saw quiet, smiling faces, faces unknown but familiar. Rows of alcoves mounted to inconceivable heights till they became hazy in the distance. Marveling, I looked to the finials of the columns. They reached this starry horizon, and beyond them I could see only the peaks of the snowy mountains, wide arrows pointing to heaven. The beauty of the place overwhelmed me. Focusing on these heights, I gradually made out the angular lines of monastic cities, Sheltered among the peaks, I could hear the mournful Tibetan bone horn and the festive sistra. Now, I knew I stood in the spiritual equivalent of the Order's Hall of Initiation, and the mountains were the spiritual Tibet, true wisdom towering invisibly over the primitive sectarian masses. The master called again. Now I saw him. He wore the saffron garb of the monk with shaven head, a form moved behind him. Obviously, he still lived embodied among men. Here he appeared in its refined semblance. Motioning me closer, he stretched out his right hand over my astral figure, speaking the eternal formula of the ancient mysteries. Burn thy body with the fire of thy thoughts. The astral form began to glow as though in a furnace and burned with a blinding white brilliance. Now he recited the Lord's word in the book of Ezra. They perish like vapor, like the flame and the smoke thereof. They are kindled and extinguished. Turning to me, he continued, But thou hast burned and been extinguished to form a fire-tempered jewel, Lapido Rubro. The initiates did not choose unworthily. One of the just has returned. Triumphant bells and trumpets proclaimed transcendental festivity over the hazy heights, but the voice of the magus soared over all. The transitory form has turned to ashes. The shadow has become light. Living gold was born from this fire. The opus is finished, and the great arcanum is before thee. My lord, the work is perfected. Rejoice, ye sons of light. Let the immortal gates be opened, and the veil which covers the eyes of men be stricken. The magus has been acknowledged by the elemental spirits as their master. He has arrived. May the Lord and only life bless the one who returns to him. I stood in the white glow of completion, dissolved into the flowing melody of the divine masterpiece. Faces, sounds, colors, and places showed me their true form. I saw the masters of the order, some hidden on the earth in hermetic abodes, where they could close their lives to glittering illusion and be flooded with the light of infinity. Others were already in the spirit, besieging the frozen darkness of human existence to prepare the future golden age. I saw the guardians and teachers, instruments of the divine forces, the ecstatic seers and preachers of the word. Then there were the scattered fragments of the divine plan, those who blindly persevered through torment, and I saw the Lord of the earth, Adonai, leaning with solicitous love over the flaming crucible of the earth, with its wailing and horror, hate and rivers of blood and tears, 
He tended the fire to keep it burning so it would boil away all the impurities so that after the feverish crisis of the end of time, the planet might be raised in the cosmos. I also saw the people who had been important in my own life's radius in order that all the uncertainty of time would be dispelled. Amadeus Barr was a teacher in a saffron robe, bearing the signs of the order. His disciples sat around him on a rocky plateau, the roof of the world to which they had climbed by the sufferings of millennia. Among those disciples was a skinny, bright-eyed boy, the Milanese Marietta, who had once given me birth and had done more for me than anyone else, even after her death. Her soulmate, my father, Francesco Bori, was with her. Now, they were companions without bondage of sex. Poor, sentimental Sophie Pachon still hid in the dim arcades of a convent, her life a round of candles, incense, beer, shivering penances, and the aching demands of her flesh. Though she prayed and tortured herself, her body defeated her time and again, an incubi appeared in her dreams. Her being was still riddled with superstitions and nightmares, but her native faith remained and was leading her out of the chaos. I knew this with radiant certainty, and her present circumstances did not rouse anxiety or pity. I knew her life would soon be resolved as mine had been. The more she suffered, the stronger she would become. Dr. Pollock's path was already smooth, like that of all those who demand nothing for themselves. Whether in Paris, England, or Germany, he healed and learned without prejudice or inhibition. He used his powers of observation, memory, and intuition to give to others, and, though he made no efforts on his own behalf, the ties of karma fell from him. He became one of the just. I also saw the sin-laden figures of Lepitre and Rosalie. The human mind could never have conceived their tragic new relationship as a poor washerwoman and her neurotic invalid son. They had had a great deal of difficulty in achieving rebirth, and had simply revolved for a long time in the astral ocean. Finally, Rosalie achieved birth, and herself gave birth to her idolized victim, the ironic justice of karma. For now, Rosalie had given him her own blood in place of that she had spilled, and he had dim memories of nameless guilt that led him to torture his mother daily and make her life a living hell. Lepitre's disease was a fitting punishment of karma. He was anemic, and his mother would have given him the last drop of her blood to cure him. The son she worshipped was the only meaning of her life. She drudged willingly for the flabby, unhappy youth whom she had borne illegitimately. He was slowly dying. His life was being drained quietly and steadily, just as it had the night she had opened his veins. For Rosalie had not been an ordinary murderess, the fruit of her vindictive passion was returned to her in this way. Charlotte Brugendorf wandered in the maze of passions as a bisexual gnome, a crippled outcast of unrestrained sexual curiosity. Her husband, the fat mayor of Straubing, was a clumsy charlatan and fairground swindler. He was ever the dilettante, a borrower of reflected light. The Marquis of brandenburg Auschbach had come to hate and condemn his former actions after a few short lives. He was always careful to conform, yet somehow he always managed to bring the anger of irresponsible authority upon himself. He was executed three times, once because of a careless word, once because he happened to witness a crime, and once because he was thought to have a valuable secret. It was this final execution that moved me most. He was gradually entombed in a tower leaning over a precipice, the opening through which he was given food and water was slowly filled, and every day they shouted the question to which he had no answer. Despite his pleading, he was finally entombed. He scrabbled at the rocks till his fingers bled, then wrote his innocence in his own blood. This tower was really a sealed well in the sky, the inverted image of the well where Hans Bergner reached the lowest point of his path. Then I saw the woman who had first given me birth, the mothers of Hans Bergner and Heinz Knotik, as they developed with the experiences of various lives and circumstances. Hans Bergner's lecherous and whimsical mother went through several lives on the stage and in the circus. Then, after 230 years, she attracted the attention of a ruling prince. By now, she was a calmer, more refined, but she was also more daring and had developed her pretense into an art form. Yet her uncontrolled self-love always made her obese. 
Time and again, she would start with an enchanting form, only to become a gigantic mountain of flesh. This flesh weighed her down, yet it served as a barricade to further downward paths. Obesity served as her guardian, torturer, and teacher. She fought against it in vain, for she had never learned self-control. Periodically, she would go on a starvation diet, but this was always broken by compulsive gluttony. To forget her misery, she began to drink and lost the prince's favor. He gave her a modest annuity on which she lived, amid covered mirrors, drunk, and crying a prey to her servants. Heinz Kanotic's mother blossomed beautifully. The hard-working, simple, and good creature thought clear, bright thoughts and had original ideas she kept to herself for a long time. It is the quiet who truly observe others and hear more than those who love the sound of their own tongue. She had known there was a great discrepancy in the words and actions of her drunken husband, but she did not judge him. She had listened to the murderous quarrels about kindness, the venomous battles about love, and the impatient demands for patience, yet she never judged or tried to measure imperfect persons against the perfect Christ. Hers was a pure and discriminating spirit, and her new incarnations were fitting garb for it. She was reborn in England, Sweden, and France, always in an environment where she could receive a good education and develop her talents. Wherever she was, she was a center of spiritual activity, giving and warming those about her. The attention she sought always came to her. Though she was modest, she was always preeminent. Her French sonnets are still considered some of the finest gems of literature. They have been translated into many languages because of their beauty and immortality. The preacher Canotic wandered through all the sects and filled each one with his personal malevolence. When his bad heart killed him in 1570, his fanaticism drove him to Russia, where he was the son of a Greek Orthodox priest who himself became a militant priest, feared and hated. This treacherous servant of Christ scandalized his parishioners not only by his drunken debauchery, but also by his extraordinary cruelty. It was his greatest pleasure to incite pogroms and take a personal part in them. In this life, he died relatively young from syphilis. Next, he became a Muslim. He snatched up the Prophet's banner like a spear and joyously killed Christians with it. The Quran was now his bludgeon. The holy books have never been helpless and patient in the hands of bigoted fools. He kept the Prophet's rules just as he had kept the Christian commandments, endlessly scrutinizing words and letters while his whole soul and body sinned against their spirit. Finally, he died in a holy war. Then he was reborn in Russia in the ghetto where he had glorified in so many pogroms. Now he was a part of the suffering of this strange people with their great and terrible fate. Again he became a religious fanatic, transcribing the Talmud and the Torah. He learned to hate his persecutors, but he also learned what it was to be defenseless against fanaticism, living with fear and the leaden horror of murder. He heard the futile pleas of his fellow Jews and watched the executioners turn a deaf ear to the screams of dying children. This bitter life of the perpetual fugitive filled him with the thirst for revenge. Finally, he was tortured to death during a pogrom, unaware that he himself had killed a defenseless Jew by those same tortures more than a hundred years before. Then the man's dark force was used where the logic of events demanded in France just before the revolution, a firebrand of the revolution. He was able to consummate all his hatred and make his name infamous, but the forces he had conjured up swept him away before he could complete his killing, and he himself fell to the guillotine. Giuseppe Balsamo had been executed in the Castel Sant Angelo in 1795, condemned as a Freemason and a heretic. All his efforts to prove he was not Calgliostro had been in vain. He had lied so consistently that no one believed the only truth he had ever uttered. When he had insisted he was the illegitimate son of a peasant woman who had taken the name to impress people, they only laughed. They were witnesses to testify and dates cited, and even the date and place of his birth were against him. Everyone wondered why he had told such a clumsy lie. But I also saw where Balsamo's frightful death would lead him, the direction determined as early as his meeting with St. Germain. The magic warning remained in his thoughts during this terrible torment and sowed the seed of something he had never known before, faith and fear. He began to believe in the supernatural powers and fear the consequences of his actions. Thus he learned his first moral inhibitions and began to have ambitions in the direction he had once scorned. His meeting with St. Germain had started him from his lowest point 
and Cagliostro's name turned his mind to white magic. Meanwhile, Jean Gerard, Lorenza Feliciani, whose ties with Balsamo were also far deeper than those of the flesh, spent her days in ecstatic prayer in a convent. She surrendered her will completely to a forceful and bigoted mother superior who formed her into a flaming prayer mill. Lorenza confessed her faults and Balsamo's endlessly blaming herself for all and begged salvation. She had truly loved her husband despite her terror of him. Once in her dream, she saw him on the torture rack, reduced to a whimpering stump. Lorenza could not forget the vision, which she felt in her soul was true. From then on, she forgot her fear and wept bitterly over him. Really, these two could not exist without each other. Lorenza needed Balsamo's strength and will, and he needed her receptive intuition. Balsamo had always turned her spiritual eyes and ears toward hell, but now, in his misery, he was turning toward higher things. As for Ernst Mueller, he was destroyed immediately by the Red Lion, which he had mixed with wine and drunk greedily on the night of the murder. The tremendous force broke his will and consumed his decomposing body. No longer could his personality be torn apart by demons. He had crashed into the innermost astral hell, an unprepared living being, just like Hans Bergner. I saw the ebb and flow of the lives and their driving force and meaning the justice that reconciled their miseries. In this solemn moment, I saw the grotesque actions proceed from grotesque and sick minds and that these actions themselves produce the painful fruit that cures the disease. It is only transgression that can produce the healing and there is never more suffering than is absolutely necessary. Then a voice rang out, the voice of Uriel, who sends out the word to the beings in the cosmos. It is Uriel who directs the divine light into a live flame in the souls of the messiahs and seers. What a voice it is, the sound of all holiness and revelation. I salute you who have arrived, Magus of the three worlds. At last you have untied your bonds. You have withdrawn your personal forces from the rule of matter and now you may use them as you wish. Determination binds you no longer, for you now the secret gates and the keys are in your hand. Nor do physical laws bind you still. You can go where your spirit wills and create what it desires. If you wish, you may create worlds and become a titan of the galaxies. You may build your own paradise of sublime artistry. Its flowers will wither only at the end of time. You may visit the most marvelous planets and the mysterious realm of Hades. You may penetrate that which is large and that which is small and perform majestic experiments until the manifest world returns to God. Or you may depart alone on the straight path which you know and leave all transitory illusion, even the illusion of paradise. You may leave this cosmic crucible of suffering and experiment for you are indeed free. Because of your freedom, I give you one more choice, a difficult one. I offer you a mission. You do not need to accept, and will suffer no penalties if you refuse. If you accept, you will return as a servant to live through a messianic age, a terrible and magnificent time when the old eon will die, and a new one will come into being. The cataclysm of death will be mixed with the agony of birth and the mystery of resurrection. You will have to wait many earthly years in anonymity, unknown to the world. Then will come the time when the star appears while Saturn is in conjunction with Jupiter in the sign of Taurus. The cosmic gate, which admits only him who is sent, will open. Only Hermes Trismegistus, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Moses, Lao Tse, Zoroaster, Mohammed, and Christ have entered through this gate. Now someone will follow them. It will be your duty to announce him, to chronicle the truth, to preserve the traditions of the past, and weave them into the present and the future. You will record your own life and how it has been imbued with the transcendental restlessness of occult force. Your life will be a window of eternal light to people in deepest darkness. Many thousands of years ago, I predicted this to Ezra in Bebel and told him the signs that must first appear. If you take this task, you will see it. All the chosen ones present at the beginning will be present at the end. That the number of the just shall be full from Abraham to Abraham. 
these are those who have gathered strength and never tasted death. You will also see the deepest hell, the most terrible suffering, the greatest lie, and the most terrible crimes. The sky will be darkened, brother will betray brother, and friend will fight friend. Innocence will be massacred, and all law and truth destroyed. Every value of the human spirit will be defamed, and hell will triumph over earth. You will have to endure all this and stand firm in the midst of desolation, hatred, dangers, and threats. It is your mission to write about God and the new Messiah of the Spirit and the new eon to be born from the decay of evil. You must write to the accompaniment of the trumpets of the apocalypse while the sky is rent asunder and the earth opens in death and flame. You must be ready for the appointed hour, for the book of life can be fulfilled only with the sound of the orchestra of death. The song of resurrection soars only from destruction. Choose. There was silence after these words, the silence of a listening infinity. Every creative possibility silently offered itself to me with no lurking traps. The universe was an open plain in all directions with the vast starry heavens round about. These were the ancient forces gathered in Lilith's womb to be commanded by the creative spirit. I saw the mysterious gates of Hades glimmering below, promising fulfillment of all mysteries. The macrocosmos and microcosmos drew me toward them, and their miserable earth, drifting toward the crisis, awaited the Messiah. Now, after years of anonymity, I have returned. The End So wow, just wow, 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 what an amazing and wonderful book. Please know that all of the historical references in this book are accurate. The discussions of Marie Antoinette, the discussions of the different cities and times that are discussed in here are real. And I'm only speaking personally, but when I read this, it feels authentic and real. So when this was written so long ago, in the 1940s by Maria Zapes, it doesn't feel like she wrote this. She did write other things, and it's not the same. It does feel like she was given a document that was written by this person and that this is real. It confirms everything that we've known. There's a couple things that you can pull out of this, and I could sit and talk about this book for hours. It is a beautiful book. It fits like a puzzle piece, a perfect circle. You see at the beginning with Hans Bergner, at the end with Ernst Mueller, both killing their master in death in the same way, and karma's circle being fully fulfilled. And you have a very real discussion of karma and its nature as it awakens within us and how it plays out in our many lives that we have. You can understand the power of knowing about your past lives and also how it can work against you, the sadness of it. You can see how the terrible things that we go through, the catalysts that we experience in these many lives can form us and shape us. And sometimes the lowest lows can take us to the highest highs. Every single story and every example in here has power. And you can see how you can fall for your emotions and deep sensual and sexual desires and the, how that can pull you away from the spiritual path. You can see how you can be dedicated to getting knowledge and information, but when you're led by the darkness and black magic, it can manipulate in so many ways. The story about homunculus, a demon that takes over his body and controls you is a real thing. All the things that are talked about in here are real. And what we see at the point that Hans Bergner first drinks the elixir is really what would happen if we awoke in fourth density. You would see the whole astral realm before you, all the demons that people carry around with them. 
We're walking around with all these demons. Some of them are angels, but many of them are demons that we don't see. And if suddenly you were given an ability to see all the spirits that follow you, like attracts like. So if you have dark desires and evil intentions and dark passions, it attracts beings from the astral realm that are reflected by that. And so as soon as he drank that elixir, he saw the astral realm and how horrible it was. But you can see the power in knowing about your past life. A lot of times these lessons are born in their subconscious, as we see with Karina, who ends up being this obese woman caught up in the karma of her previous life. What we're going through right now is an expression of the karma of our past life. And I have this feeling, it's like a download when I read this book. It's like we're living all of these lives. We're experiencing these lives in a single book. We didn't have to live the lives. It felt like a complete and total download. There's some amazing bits of wisdom in this book, but one of the key things that's so obvious is selfishness will destroy you every time there are dark forces that will use your selfishness every single time and this selfishness is what will take you away from what you really want if you can let go of this selfishness then you can find the true light of enlightenment we see this in everything that they do i found the many lessons of the Count St. Germain to be amazing. Count St. Germain is real. There are enough messages about him throughout history that it feels like he's real. And the book that Count St. Germain wrote that's mentioned in here is also a real book that I will read on the podcast. So at a minimum, her research was amazing, but it didn't feel like research to me. I want to know more about Maria Zapes and how she acquired this document and how she wrote this book. And if she said anything about it, I want to know. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know? There was so many other things that come to mind. And as soon as I'm done reviewing this, I'm going to remember them later. But some of the stories with Count St. Germain, where he convinces Cagliostro that he's going to end up using his name and What did you think of the character of Count St. Germain? Who is he really? Saying that he had been here since the beginning of time. Who is he really? And what lesson? Was he the Christ? Is he Hermes Trismegistus who he implies? Is it the same? Is he Rochard? Reincarnated? Who is Count St. Germain? And it's interesting. He speaks the same way when you read the I Am Discourses where you're hearing St. Germain. He speaks the same way. Just get this wonderful idea of this man that's still alive now, changing the world, working in the shadows. Now, there have always been secret societies and lessons from secret societies, and you can understand that. This knowledge that is given by many secret societies, it has a process. There are points in which you're not supposed to have this information. This information can work against you and even destroy you. So I wanted to read again from the 33 formula for the very foundation of the order that he was a part of. The 11 rules are love God above all else. Use your time to develop your soul. Be completely unselfish. Be sober, humble, active, and silent. Learn the origins of the metals in you. Beware of charlatans and liars. Constantly revere the highest good. Learn the theory before you try to practice. Practice charity toward all beings. Read the ancient books of wisdom. Strive to understand their secret meaning. The six duties are heal the sick and relieve the suffering without thought of reward. Conform to the customs of the country in which you live. Meet with your fellow members in a preset place once a year. Select your own successor. Remember the letters RC, symbols of the brotherhood. Keep the existence of our order secret for 100 years. And the 16 secret signs. A member of the order is patient. He's compassionate, he's incapable of envy, he's not a braggart, he's not proud, he's not debauched, 
He's not greedy. He's not easily aroused to anger. He thinks no evil of others. He loves righteousness. He loves truth. He knows how to remain silent. He believes what he has learned. His hope does not fail. He does not falter during suffering, and he always remains a member of the brotherhood. I found that to be very powerful, succinct explanation of their truths. And a lot of the truths you can see played out in this book and the many different lessons that he learns over these different lifetimes. We all see a little bit of ourselves in all of the stories and all the characters in this book. We all have dark desires and go through dark periods and wherever we're at, we can change now in this moment. If we let go of our selfish desires and seek for the knowledge of the one creator, we can do that. There's so many things that you can pull from this and I can't wait to read the comments and get your impressions. What was your favorite part? What was your favorite chapter? I've never had a book like that take me like I did. I had to read it. There was no way I couldn't read it. I had to read this book and I was reading it almost immediately after I had read it the first time so that everybody else could share with me in the teachings that this book carries. For many of you, it's just a fictional book and I get that. For me, even if it's a fictional book, it's incredibly well written and has a number of amazing stories, historically relevant. It's just awesome. And at a minimum, you can enjoy it on that level. But I can't wait to find what your favorite parts were, or if you got something out of it that made you really think, in any case, welcome to the Reality Revolution.